This is Audible. Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Apocalypse by Kyle West, narrated by Graham Halstead. Chapter One. My steps felt heavy as I walked the main corridor of Bunker 108, carrying my M4 and pack, a canteen, and two extra clips of 5.56 millimeter ammunition. The large vault door at the end of the tunnel, embossed with the number 108, stood as a barrier I had never been allowed to cross. But in mere minutes, I'd step through on my first trip outside. Behind the security desk at Bunker 108's entrance, Captain Deborah Green watched the camera feeds intently, not breaking her attention when I stopped a few feet from the door. At first glance, with her glasses and gray hair, she seemed to belong more in the archives than out here, but one look at her steely face was enough to dash that notion. I sighed, trying to push down my nervousness, but wasn't entirely successful. Any time you went out of Bunker 108, you never knew if you were coming back. Outside the bunker was the wasteland and the stuff of nightmares. Dust storms, deadly cold, and worst of all, people who would kill without a second thought. It was all the result of the impact of the meteor Ragnarok in 2030. And in the 30 years since, the wasteland had only grown more dangerous. It was my responsibility to go on recons, just as it was for everyone of age. When a citizen turned 16, he or she was deemed old enough to start reconnoitering. Names were placed in a lottery, and once every week, a single name was drawn to reconnoiter with an officer. This continued every week until every name had been drawn, at which point all the names were re-entered and the whole process repeated. There was one exception, however. Every new person added to the pool was obligated to go on a first run. Since yesterday had been my 16th birthday... There had been no lottery for me this week. I would be doing my first run with Officer Michael Sanchez. It wasn't like I had nothing to be scared about. Two years ago, there had been an incident with a recruit named Jake Spears, who died on his first run. He would have been 18 this year. He and his recon partner, an officer named Philip Cohen, were killed after getting into a firefight with raiders. While any death was tragic, this was the first time a 16-year-old had died on a first run. I still remembered the resulting uproar. A unified citizens council had demanded Chief Security Officer Chan cease the practice of first runs, reserving recons only for officers and volunteer citizens who were at least 18 years of age. But when it came down to it, Chief Security Officer Chan had more teeth. The measure never passed. The officers backed Chan, and the officers carried a lot of clout on council. Some of my classmates actually looked forward to their first runs. I'd been dreading mine for months. To them, I supposed seeing the outside world with their own eyes was worth the risk of getting killed. With me, it was different. I wasn't a soldier, nor did I want to become one, which was something I couldn't say for a lot of my peers. Someday I hoped to become a scientist and a doctor, like my dad. I liked helping him in the research lab when he could spare the time to teach me. After today's run, all I had to do was get through the next lotteries. It took a while to have your name drawn once you'd completed your first run. Years, if you were lucky. Officer Michael Sanchez appeared down the corridor, laughing and joking with one of his officer buddies. They clapped hands, parted, and he continued his way up the corridor. Michael was tall, heavily muscled, with skin bronzed from regular light baths. Every citizen was allowed 15 minutes for their daily production of vitamin D, but officers were allowed more time. Having a tan was a sign of status. The CSO gave a number of other perks to the officers, such as more credits and cushier apartments. Because they laid their lives on the line... Chan said they deserved more compensation. I was sure the CSO had other reasons, the most important being that it secured his power base. If you had the officers behind you, you effectively had the bunker behind you. At last, Michael approached, beaming a wide smile. Ready to roll? I shrugged, trying not to look as nervous as I felt. Ready as I'll ever be. What? That's no attitude to have. Trust me, we'll make a legend out of you.
You'll be the toast of mess tonight. I smiled. <laughs> we'll see about that. All right, let's move. You're late, Sanchez. Michael spun on his heels to face Captain Green. Sorry, Captain, he said, standing to attention. It won't happen again. She raised a quizzical eyebrow but didn't press the point. Time is 1600. Good luck. You're due back in two hours. Captain Green reached under her desk, and a moment later, the resounding click of metal echoed through the corridor. Seemingly unaffected by the loud reverberation, Michael pulled the massive door outward, the metal groaning as it swung open. We weren't outside, not yet. An entry tunnel with an earthen floor bathed in weak fluorescent light sloped upward about fifty yards, ending at the final vault door. Cool, dry air swirled into the staging area. The difference was heavy and foreboding, and it felt like nothing I could put a word to. Alex? I turned, surprised to see my dad standing behind Michael and me. His lab coat wrinkled and his brown hair disheveled. He was a tall and lanky man, far taller than most anyone, besides some of the officers. Dark circles underlined his hazel eyes, which were only partially hidden by black-rimmed glasses. The hundred-hour weeks he spent doing research definitely showed. In fact, it looked as if he hadn't slept in days. Sorry, I meant to make it here earlier. I got involved in decoding a new genetic sequence, and he shook his head. I'm sorry, Alex. It's fine, I said. I know your work is important. I know, but I should have been here. I meant to be here. He nodded as if confirming that. Before you leave, I want you to know, you'll do fine. Remember your training, and listen closely to Officer Sanchez. He's in good hands, Dr. Keener, Michael said. Since you're going with him, I believe it, my dad said. I was worried about who he'd be partnered with. I'm glad to hear that. We'll make a soldier out of him in no time. My dad turned to Captain Green, giving her a nod. Forgive the interruption, Captain. By all means, Dr. Keener. Take your time. As she looked at me, the features of her face softened, and something in her eyes seemed to acknowledge that this might be the last time my dad and I saw each other. Good luck, Alex, my dad said. I'm proud of you. I couldn't bring myself to respond, which was stupid considering how dangerous going outside was. All I could manage was a terse nod, which made me feel bad. I knew my dad deserved better. Before I had the chance to make things right, Michael was shutting the interior door, and a moment later, the massive steel door separated us, echoing into silence. Michael looked at me, seeming to have missed the awkward parting. He and I started up the tunnel. It wasn't as if I didn't want to respond. My dad and I had always had an unusual and sometimes strained relationship. In fact, it sometimes felt as though we weren't a real family. He was so busy with his research, his medical practice, and his high-ranking responsibilities as a member of the Citizens' Council that, outside of the time I helped him in the lab, we rarely saw one another. People often said that my dad hadn't always buried himself in his work. I sometimes wondered whether his change in work habits had coincided with my mom's death, which happened on the day I was born. He had been the one delivering me, and it was easy to imagine that guilt eating away at him for years. Growing up, I'd always been envious of the kids who had two parents and siblings. As I grew older, I became more successful at pushing down those feelings, but sometimes they still lurked. As Michael and I continued up the tunnel, I knew I had to push these thoughts from my mind. It felt as if we were on our way to another world, and I needed to be 100% present for whatever was to come. The dusty dirt floor and rock walls were lit with a pale yellow glow from the overhead lights. Our footfalls were strangely muted in the tunnel's dim confines, and the final vault door to the wasteland approached all too quickly. Remember, Michael said, if we come upon anybody, shoot first, whether they're raiders or not. Just assume they are. No questions asked. I nodded. This was standard protocol. Rather than risk discovery, we had orders to eliminate anyone we found. I knew how to shoot well enough. 
Every citizen, regardless of status, was required to perform at least an hour's practice each week with the laser rifles, practice weapons that even simulated the kick of our standard-issue M4s. Ammunition was far too precious to waste on practice, and preserving the bunker's vast quantity of rounds was one of the many factors the government had tasked the security agency with. While the impact of Ragnarok itself had been devastating, I learned in class that it was really the aftermath that had sent the world's population tumbling toward extinction. There were the initial effects of the impact, massive earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and the dust being kicked into the atmosphere. Much of the sunlight that once reached the surface was now reflected by that dust, leaving our world much colder than it had been. The dust also refracted light, causing the sky to always be red, even at noon on a midsummer day. It would take decades, if not centuries, for the dust to finally settle. Under such conditions, it didn't take long for mass agriculture to fail, not just in the United States, where the meteor had struck on the border of Nebraska and Wyoming, but worldwide. Mass agriculture was the branch upon which all industrialized society had hung. When that branch was sawn off, it inevitably led to mass extinction and the complete disintegration of civilization. Estimates ranged anywhere from a 75% kill rate on the low end to a 99% kill rate on the high end. However, experts surmise that the bulk of survivors, if any, were concentrated in equatorial regions, which could have been more protected from extreme global cooling. It was unknown whether other parts of the world had fared better or worse than the United States. However, it was common knowledge that other countries had their own survival housing programs, though the United States bunker program was touted as the most extensive, at 144 bunkers. When Michael and I reached the final vault door, I shifted in my gear, causing my hand to hit the barrel of my M4. The feel of the rifle's cold metal made me realize that it was the shoot-first policy that I was most nervous about. Not the cold, dry wind, the dead world, the red, hazy sky stretching above, or the lack of a sun dimmed out by layers of meteor dust. Before opening the door, Michael checked his radio to ensure it was all set. Satisfied, he looked ahead at the final barrier between the bunker and the outside world. Large, bold numbers, one, zero, eight, were pressed into the thick metal. For my entire sixteen years, that door had served as the barrier between safety and danger, known and unknown. This wasn't a video, and it wasn't a picture. I'd be seeing the wasteland with my own eyes. Michael twisted the lock wheel, his muscles bulging beneath his desert camo. The wheel groaned as it gave, little by little. Finally, the door opened with a clang. Michael pulled it inward until the wasteland outside stood revealed. The natural light, though dim, still blinded me. A rush of cold, dry wind met my face, forcing me to raise a hand to shelter my eyes from the dust. The first thing I saw were distant red mountains, like upside-down, bloody teeth. In front of the mountains stood crimson dunes that looked as if they belonged on Mars rather than Earth. A dilapidated, rusted crane lay half-buried, maybe half a click out where it had lain since December 3rd, 2030. Dark day, the day when most of humanity and most of life had been set on the path toward extinction. Welcome? Michael said with a sardonic grin, to the wasteland. Chapter Two I followed Michael down the gravelly slopes of Hart Mountain, pulling my hood forward to keep out the cold. Late September in Southern California meant freezing temperatures almost every night. Though I'd seen countless pictures of the wasteland before, I couldn't help but take it in with numb shock. All vegetation was short, clinging for life in the sandy, cracked earth. What I was seeing was far removed from the California of the movies stored in the archives. I often dreamed of a hot, sandy beach, the blue ocean and sky, the bright sun without a cloud to bar its light. I loved watching those movies and wished I had been born a hundred years ago and not in 2044. Each bunker was a closed system, meaning everything had to be supplied internally, be that food, power, or water, and all those resources had to be recycled. 
Things had been going well for the bunkers, at least for a while. But that all changed when Bunker One went offline. Bunker One, located in Cheyenne Mountain, Colorado, served as the headquarters of the United States government, and its fall set into motion the collapse of many others. That was in 2048, and President Garland had been among the thousands presumed dead in a bunker that had simply disappeared overnight. In the absence of Bunker One, most bunkers had decided to go their own way. Bunker 108 was almost completely isolationist, and that had been CSO Chan's policy since the day he'd taken over. No one could fault the CSO for being too lax on the security front. In fact, many members of the Citizens' Council believed Chan was too draconian. At the same time, though, everyone agreed that Chan was the reason we were still alive. Michael and I didn't talk as we picked our way down the mountain. Each recon took a different path, which prevented trails from being formed. Wastelanders didn't come out this way much. This stretch of the San Bernardino Mountains was as forsaken as any, and that was exactly what the bunker designers had accounted for in their site planning. Still, I couldn't help but feel that danger lurked in the red, rugged landscape. So, what's our objective? I asked. We're on a set route, Michael said. Basically, combing the valley to see what we can find. What are we looking for? Signs of wastelanders. If any have been through, Chan will want to know. Have you ever found anything? Personally, no. But someday, it'll happen. Let's just say it keeps recons from ever becoming routine. The minute you believe it's routine, you'll wind up dead. Michael's warning gave way to silence as we trudged on into the valley. We were out of sight of home by now. Looking back, the mountain and its foothills were cast red by the crimson sky. I shivered as a particularly chilly gust hit me. Our feet crunched against dirt and rocks, stirring up clouds of dust. We passed a low red hill which brought a rounded metallic trailer into view, shimmering in the late afternoon haze. The trailer sat a few hundred yards away on a stretch of cracked flatland, and sandy hills rose on the horizon. What's the trailer for? I asked. You'd think the fact it's here would give our bunker away. It's for dust storms, Michael said. You never want to be caught in one. It'll be the last mistake you make. As far as it giving us away, well, I guess the wastelanders wouldn't know who put it here to begin with. It's locked, anyway. Contains rations, water, apparel, anything a patrol might need to weather a few days while waiting for the dust to settle. We paused before the trailer, Michael looking for anything out of place. Not knowing what to do, I focused on checking the ground for tracks. There was nothing visible, though. With that wind, I imagined any kind of imprints would be erased within a few hours. I used to question why we went on recons. My answer came last night when I received my briefing. While the bunkers had been designed to last decades, even centuries, it was unknown whether people could last that long. At some point, we were going to lose all our specialists, doctors, engineers, and teachers. Even if those skills were passed on to the next generation, there would be some inevitable loss of know-how. Repeat that enough generations, and we would resemble the wastelanders above, for this reason, we accepted that eventually a move to the surface would have to be made. That was the primary objective of the recons. The one Michael and I were on was meant to be short, but experienced officers were sent on more extended expeditions for the purpose of finding suitable places to settle. In the post-apocalyptic Mojave, however, those places were few and far between, and the prime spots had already been snatched up. That meant recons had to range further and further. This carried risks. Not only could we lose good men to the dangers of the wasteland, but one of our recons could be followed back. When I rejoined Michael, he was looking in the direction of Bunker 108. I didn't know why, but I assumed it was to see if we were being followed. Let's wheel around Heart Mountain. We're taking the long route today. What's the long route? It'll take us to the mountain's northern face. After that, we'll double back to the valley. There's a good view of the desert floor from the lookout. As we set course for the mountain, our conversation turned more personal. 
Thought about your uh, profession any? I'm going to be a researcher, like my dad. He's already shown me a few things in the lab, so I think I have an advantage there. Well, that makes sense, Michael said. I won't even try to convince you to become an officer. We need scientist types, too, and God knows they're getting rare these days. He frowned. I've always wondered why Dr. Keener was holed up here. Seems like 114 would be more his place. Bunker 114's pretty far, I said with a shrug. In truth, it wasn't that far, only 50 miles. However, 50 miles in the wasteland was a dangerous distance to cross. Besides, we've always lived in 108. It's home. Sure, there's that, Michael said. But 114's the last bunker left that still does medical research. I've heard they have a whole complement of scientists there. I guess I've never thought about it. Transfers don't happen anymore. There aren't many places to transfer to these days. During the dark decade, the U.S. had built a lot of bunkers in the Mojave because of nearby L.A., San Diego, and Vegas. Bunker 108 and especially Bunker 114 were centers for xenobiological research, dedicating themselves to the study of the strange fungus and microbes that had emerged from the impact of Ragnarok. My dad's line of research was xenofungus, a purple and spongy substance that grew in his lab. I suppose the fungus was far more common out where Ragnarok had impacted, because all I could see out here were red hills and dust. Looking up, it was hard to imagine that sky ever having been blue. As we scaled the mountain, I thought of Michael and the difference in our ages and lives. Though we were eight years apart, we had one thing in common. Neither of us had seen old Earth. We were both born underground in Bunker 108, and anyone thirty years old or younger could say the same. Bunker 108 had a population of about 400. Most of those who died in the last thirty years had been old. Some had been born underground, like Michael and me, but we weren't growing fast enough to replace those lost. When we arrived at the north face of Heart Mountain, I paused to glance at the distant red peaks. Being so used to the confines of the bunker, it was surreal to see so much open space. I wished we could stop so I could give the mountains a good long look, but Michael's pace made it all I could do to keep up. Jesus, Michael said, pulling to a sudden stop. What? As my eyes followed the direction of Michael's rifle, all of my fears manifested before me. Face down in front of us, partially hidden by some wispy scrub, lay a man stabbed several times in the back. Michael sprang into action, kneeling to the ground while motioning me to do the same. Quiet, he said. There might be someone around. Might be. There probably was. There was no way this man had stabbed himself in the back. Michael crawled closer, placing two fingers on the man's neck. There's a pulse, he said. Keep an eye out, but stay right where you are. You don't want to make yourself a target. It was easy to follow orders, but doing so made it hard to see anything from my position. A low rise blocked my line of sight to the north. We were a good quarter up the mountain, heightening our visibility from below. At the same time, the scrub and our camo would probably make us hard to pick out. I looked to the west and down the mountain slope. I saw nothing but rocks, more parts scrub and dust. I glanced back at Michael, wondering why he was checking the man's vitals instead of ending him. That was standard protocol. If you found a wastelander, you killed him. End of story. Then I realized the probable reason for his restraint. It would be insanely stupid to shoot a gun when others might be around waiting to end us. It was a moment later that I noticed the victim was wearing a gray jumpsuit, not dissimilar to the blue ones we sometimes wore in 108, only on his jumpsuit, the number 114 was emblazoned on the sleeve. This man wasn't a wastelander. Is he from that other bunker? I asked. Rather than looking at Michael, my eyes looked up to focus on a boulder about 30 yards away. Something was off about it, and it only took me a second to realize what it was. A woman's face was peeking around its side. Chapter 3 I blinked, and the woman was gone. Had my eyes been playing tricks on me? 
The answer, I decided, wasn't relevant. Michael needed to know, and he needed to know now. Already he was digging into his pack for the first aid kit. I think someone's out there, behind that rock. His reaction was instant. Get down. He lay prone on the ground, and I followed suit, my heart racing. He reached for the pair of binoculars hanging around his neck and raised them to his eyes. He watched the rock, saying nothing. Do you see anything? I asked. You said you think you saw someone. Do you think, or do you know? I hesitated. Think. Michael looked toward the rock a few seconds more before lowering his binoculars to raise his carbine to his shoulder. The barrel poked out through the scrub, and he peered through the rifle scope. Where are you? Michael muttered, his left eye closed. It was a woman, I said. Black hair, kind of pretty. Michael grunted. Close enough for you to tell? That's all I can say for sure. Maybe I imagined it. I don't know. Trust your gut, kid. If you don't... Michael trailed off, leaving the rest unsaid. If she was there, she isn't now. What if she knows where we are? The bunker, I mean. Nothing we can do about that, Michael said. At least for now. Slowly, Michael lowered his rifle to again pick up the first aid kit, pulling out a thin, squeezable tube. Put some of this congealer on his wounds while I raise HQ, and keep an eye out for trouble. The small tube of ointment, unmarked by labels, had never been opened. I twisted off the cap before unzipping the man's coveralls to expose his back. It was completely coated with blood. The lacerations were deep, and it was all I could do to keep my stomach steady. I was no expert, but the wound seemed to have missed vital organs and arteries. I set to work while Michael raised the radio to his mouth. Alpha Patrol to HQ. Do you have a copy? Over. As I squeezed the congealer directly into each of his wounds, Captain Green's voice poured out of the radio. What did you find, Sanchez? Over. We've sighted a hostile, and we've come upon a friendly with several stab wounds in the back. Over. The congealer worked quickly, already clotting the blood in the man's wounds. What do you mean, friendly? You're the only personnel I authorized for this recon. Over. He's a civilian from Bunker 114. I can tell because he's wearing one of their jumpsuits. He still has a pulse, but it's weak. I got Alex to congeal the wounds so he might be able to hold on a little while longer. Enough time to get him home to base, maybe, but we need backup. We lost sight of the hostile, but Alex is sure he saw her. Over. I zipped up the man's coveralls to keep him from being exposed to the bitter cold wind. We waited for Captain Green's response. Officer Sanchez, please stand by for further orders. Over. Captain Green cut out, leaving us alone on the mountainside. What now? I asked. We wait. She probably has to clear her next order with the CSO. In the meantime, stay out of sight and be ready for anything. We both lay with our rifles to our shoulders. Like Michael, I peered through the scope, but saw nothing but red rocks and dirt, dimmed with dusk. Captain Green's voice came back. State your location, Sanchez. Over. Two miles on the long route. The final stretch before the lookout. Over. Copy that. We have a team entering the tunnel right now. Are you in cover? Over. Yeah, a slight depression with some scrub. Not perfect, but we can see anyone approaching from a hundred yards or so. Over. Keep the recruits safe, Sanchez, Captain Green said. Team is out the door right now. Expect them in fifteen minutes. Over and out. The sound of the wind blended with the sizzling static of the radio. Michael reattached it to his belt. So, we wait some more. He again raised his rifle to his shoulder. If he's from Bunker 114... What's he doing out here? It didn't sound like Captain Green expected him. A good question, Michael said, lowering his rifle to check the man's pulse again. It's one I've been wondering myself. One thing's clear, though. He'll be dead if he doesn't receive medical attention. We came along just in time. Enough to offer him a fighting chance, anyway. How long ago do you think it happened? Not long at all. After all, you saw that wastelander just a stone's throw away. I looked out at the spot where the woman had been, which was now lost in the shadow of the mountain. 
The sun glow had faded from over our shoulders, and what remained of the day was giving way to darkness. The woman, if she was smart, was long gone by now. As Michael again checked the man's vitals, we remained low and out of sight, neither of us risking any more conversation. I was tired of the cold wind that never abated, stinging with particles of sand and cracking my lips dry. The wasteland was far harsher than I had ever imagined. All the stories I'd heard from the officers and my peers did nothing to paint the reality I found myself in. It wasn't long before four flashlights crested the rise behind us, followed by the crunch of boots on gravel. They gave no sign of seeing us, because Michael and I were so well hidden. It appeared as if two of the men were carrying something, a stretcher, probably. Michael called out to get the group's attention. Alpha Patrol here. Officer Sanchez, someone called. Reporting. We're standing now. Michael and I both stood as the group approached. It was too dark to make out their features. Anything new? The same voice asked. Now that he was closer, I recognized that the voice belonged to Major Burton, one of Chan's top officers. Instantly, Michael and I stood to attention. At ease, Burton said brusquely. His square, goateed face was focused and serious. Any updates? Nothing to report, Michael said. Well, let's have a look. Michael and I moved apart, allowing the others access to the Bunker 114 man. Burton moved the flashlight across the man's face and chest. Don't know him. Looks to be your age, Sanchez. Another bunker berth. Burton raised his radio. Captain Green, we're here. Alpha Patrol is secure and the unknown is still alive. Copy that, Captain Green said. I have Taylor on the door waiting for your return. Let's get him on the stretcher, Burton said. Sanchez, Keener, help Carson and Varner carry. Thomas, shoot anything that moves. We hurried to obey, Michael and I helping to lift the man on. Let's roll, Burton said. We put the man on the stretcher and descended the north slope. As we moved, my thoughts went back to the woman. It wasn't easy to imagine a woman of her size taking down the man we were carrying. He was no lightweight since he was both tall and decently muscled. As we advanced, the night felt sinister as if someone or something was out there, watching. The urgency of our pace seemed to go far beyond the fact that we were trying to save a man's life. Chapter 4 It wasn't until we neared Bunker 108 that I felt any sense of relief. The outside of the door, though metallic, was painted the same dull brown as the surrounding terrain. Unless you were right in front of it, it was indistinguishable from the mountainside. A small camera hidden in the rock wall on our right allowed the officer on duty to monitor the area. The door swung inward, revealing Officer Taylor's cropped brown hair and angular features. We crossed the bunker's threshold and immediately Taylor shut the door. Yellow lights shined above, illuminating the injured man's pasty complexion. Though still unconscious and in spite of being jostled for more than a mile over rough terrain, he was still with us his chest rising and falling in shallow breaths. We passed through the inner door and into the atrium to find the security desk empty. I didn't know where Captain Green had gone, but that wasn't my concern. My attention instead was taken by my dad, who was waiting with a gurney and a nervous orderly at his side. His face relaxed the moment he caught sight of me. It was good to see him, but I still felt bad about neglecting to tell him goodbye. Now, though, wasn't the time to talk about it. Right now, my dad was all business. He rushed over to get a quick look at his new patient while we transferred him from stretcher to gurney. Wasting no time, he and the orderly began wheeling the patient toward the medical bay. As he walked, he threw me a look over his shoulder as if to say, we'll talk later. I knew it'd be a few hours before I could see him, or even more than a few. Already a crowd was beginning to form. The rumor mill worked fast in Bunker 108, all it would take was a single person to sight the strange man on the gurney for people to start hounding me with questions. While some people might have liked the attention, I was in no mood for it. Put your gear up, Burton said gruffly. I need you both in my office. 
Upon hearing his order, a nervous weight formed in my stomach, though Michael seemed to be his usual unflappable self. Yes, sir, he said. Let's move, Alex. At the small armory located behind the security desk, we handed off our rifles, packs, ammunition, and canteens to Officer Bates, a small, wiry man who was the quartermaster. We then followed Officer Burton down the corridor to the officer's wing. I looked straight ahead, attempting to avoid the stares and whispers of people lining both sides of the hall. Among the throng was my friend, Chloe Klein, whose face was tight with worry. She was pretty, with delicate features, shoulder-length black hair, and wide blue eyes. I had liked her for as long as I could remember, but she had never felt the same. I nodded and forced a smile, hoping I appeared more confident than I felt. We rounded the corner, passing the chapel, the med bay, and the main entrance to the calf. Turning another corner and then making a left brought us to the officer's wing. This was where all the bunker's highest-ranked officials worked and lived, including CSO Chan, Major Burton, and Captain Green. Above the offices were apartments where officers lived with their families, and below was a conference room as well as access to the motor pool, which contained three recons all-terrain hydrogen-powered rovers with turret support. We turned into the first doorway on our right to enter Burton's office. Shut the door, he said, sitting behind a large, tidy desk. Burton's office was prestigious and professional. Hanging on his walls were framed commendations, and behind his desk sat several bookshelves filled to almost overflowing. My dad always told me you could tell a lot about a person by the books they kept, most of Officer Burton's seemed to be dry military manuals and histories. Have a seat, Burton said. This isn't a disciplinary measure, but I have a few points to cover with you. Burton's eyes went from Michael, then to me. First, you are to say nothing to anyone about what you saw out there. The CSO will be making an official statement following dinner tonight at 1845 hours. Until then, he doesn't want anything muddying the waters. Yes, sir, we replied in unison. That order could only help me since I had no desire to speak of today's events, not with anyone. Furthermore, Burton said, for security reasons, the CSO won't be revealing details the two of you already know. You must keep these to yourselves. Do not release them unless you are directed otherwise. The CSO will also meet with you both in his office for further questioning. Michael, he'll meet with you at twenty hundred hours, Alex at twenty thirty hours. I swallowed. All right. What about standard debriefing, sir? Michael asked. You are to consider your meetings with Chan to be debriefing, unless he says otherwise. Of course, Michael said. Beyond time, even if the CSO is indisposed. Burton paused, fixing us both with a quick stare. Any questions or comments? You're both shaking your heads no, so I guess we're done here. Both of you are dismissed. We left his office, and Michael didn't say a word until we were well out of earshot. How's that for a first run, huh? Yeah, I said. With my luck, I knew something bad would happen. That woman. Michael gestured for me to keep quiet. Save it for the CSO, Alex. We got out alive, and that's what matters. A lot of recruits would have broken down in a tight spot, but you followed orders and did what you had to do. That's the quality we look for in future officers. That means a lot, but I don't think... He cut me off by shaking my hand. Take care of yourself. Don't worry about the CSO. I've been grilled by him a few times before. Just get right to the point and fully explain your answers. No detail is too small for him. Should I tell him about the woman I saw? He knows already, Michael said. If Captain Green knows, I guarantee he does too. Again, good work. I'd recon with you any time. I allowed myself a smile. Thanks. Michael took the stairs leading up to his apartment, which he shared with his wife and daughter. I, on the other hand, had nowhere in particular I needed to be. Teens my age had free time from 1,600 to 1,800 hours every day, assuming we had no other duties. Typically, I'd spend that time in the lab with my dad, learning all I could. I performed more maintenance tasks than anything. 
I'd only learned a few things regarding his highly technical research. He didn't have much time to give me formal training. Once out in the main corridor, I automatically turned for the medical bay, but I changed course upon remembering that my dad would be too busy for me. Instead, I headed for the commons, the main hub of Bunker 108. It was filled with couches, big screens that played movies and video games, tables where people played board games, and during off hours, an old man named Mr. Gorman sometimes sold snacks from a stall. Depending on the day, he might have popcorn, pretzels, donuts, or even chocolate. That last one didn't happen often, and when it did, I usually didn't get any because he sold out in minutes. He had owned a restaurant back in the day, so he knew his stuff. The commons was connected with the archives, where books, movies, music, and other forms of media were stored both digitally and physically. There was also an indoor theater, along with the gym and light baths. Another corridor connected the commons to the motor pool, and several staircases led up and down to varying areas. Down led to the vertical farms of hydroponics and the fusion generator, and up led to apartments, offices, and classrooms. To my surprise, the commons was sparsely filled, and on a day like this, there was no Mr. Gorman in sight. Several officers were sitting on couches in the room's far corner, watching an action flick on a big screen. In the opposite corner, a couple of kids played ping pong, while two old men were playing out the final moves of a chess game. I headed for the only corner that wasn't crowded, the reading corner, located just outside the archives. I liked the reading corner because it was quiet. If you went there, it was understood that you weren't there to talk. Chloe liked to use it to study. I settled in one of my favorite chairs and closed my eyes. It would be easy to fall asleep if I wanted to. Instead, I opened my eyes and looked out at the commons. Everyone was occupied in their own individual pursuits, and no one paid me any attention. That was exactly how I wanted it. In a community of about 400 people, you knew just about everyone, and most everyone knew you. Not enough to be your friend, per se, but enough to have a sense of who you were, who your friends were, and what you were about. It was hard to imagine what life had been like in the cities, like old L.A., where the population had reached the millions. A world where you didn't know everybody seemed strange to me. Only the old ones in Bunker 108 remembered those times, and most of them were gone now. Stories were often told of how a lot of people went crazy living underground in the bunker's early days, but I'd never heard of anyone born underground who went crazy. I didn't find bunker living that bad, especially when compared to the alternative of living on the surface. Someday, I hoped to sit on the Citizens' Council like my dad. My goal was simple, to survive long enough to get to that point. Other than that, well, I didn't know exactly what I wanted, Bunker 108 was the only world I'd ever known, at least until today. Compared to the wide open sky, this place did seem smaller. But small wasn't necessarily a bad thing. It was easier to feel secure in a small, closed-in space. And from what little I had seen of the outside world, it was hard to imagine how anyone survived out there. At the same time, it was easy to understand why a lot of those people went crazy to go from the blue sky, fresh wind, and warm sun to this metal shell must have made people feel buried alive. When the commons began to empty in the direction of the calf, I joined the flow, wondering how much Chan would reveal in his announcement. Chapter 5 As I ate alone at mess, people walked by, their faces questioning. Maybe they stayed away because they read my mood, but it sure hadn't kept them from talking about me. Did they think I couldn't see them pointing at me, or that I couldn't hear my name being spoken above the clatter of silverware and dishes? Alex? I looked up to see Chloe holding a tray, and my heart seemed to miss a beat. Mind if I sit here? I cleared my throat. Yeah, sure. She sat on the metal bench next to me, her tray of food clacking against the table. She had a veritable mountain of orange-glazed, stir-fried vegetables on top of a mound of rice. She started eating rather than talking to me right off the bat. Almost 100% of the meals at Bunker 108 were vegan, for reasons of practicality rather than morality. 
We had meat, but it was grown in the food lab artificially, something that was perfected sometime in the 2020s. From what the old people said, it tasted close to the real thing. That said, I'd never had real meat in my life. The bunker designers determined early on that the raising of animals was far too resource-intensive, and that it was easier just to grow a limited amount of meat chemically. Chloe's parents ran the entire food production for the bunker. Chloe broke the silence. You doing all right? I shrugged. I guess. You guess? I don't know, I said. I can't talk about it. That bad? You don't have to say anything if you don't want to. Even if I wanted to, Chan ordered Michael and me not to say anything. He's making an announcement about everything soon, so you'll know as much as me in a few minutes. From her face, I could tell she didn't believe that one. My thoughts turned to the woman I'd seen. The woman who had run away. The woman who could die because of me. Even though Michael and I hadn't been in a position to take her out, it was probable Chan would send the recons after her. Such things had happened before. If she were innocent, that meant I'd have blood on my hands. I think I might have messed up, I said, taking a swallow of water. That's all I can say about it. You mean with that guy you found? Maybe. It's okay to air your feelings a bit. I won't judge. This has nothing to do with my feelings, Chloe. Someone could die because of me. Her eyes widened. She opened her mouth to speak, but in the end said nothing. Sorry, I said. I shouldn't have said that. It's all right, she said. I can tell you're stressed. I gave a small laugh. What gave that away? Chloe was still looking at me, smiling. Why was she smiling like that? I tried not to focus on how pretty she looked and made myself glance away before I embarrassed myself. Well, whether you can say anything or not, she said, placing a hand on my arm. I'm just glad you're all right. I wasn't sure how to respond to that. Chloe and I had known each other since we were kids. Back then, when I was real little, I'd tell her she and I were bound to get married someday. She just laughed, never taking it seriously. And at some point, when I became more self-aware, maybe, I'd stop joking about it. Over time, we grew more distant. Still, everything I felt for her was real, but she had a way of keeping me at a distance while still letting me know we were friends. Beneath the surface, though, we both still knew the truth. Only now, with her smiling and touching my arm, I was confused. Why would she feel differently about me now? If you really want to know, I said carefully, I can't tell you here. And whatever I tell you, you can't tell anyone else. I would never say anything, Alex. You know that. I lowered my voice. If Chan or anyone higher up found out, we could both get into real trouble. All around us, people chattered. Silverware clanked on trays and chair legs squeaked against the linoleum. I was grateful for all the extra noise covering up our words. I think it would do you good to get it off your chest, Chloe said. I know you, Alex. You pen things up inside. You need someone to talk to. Someone who cares about you. I nearly choked on my food when she said that, but thankfully I didn't shame myself. Want to say the chapel at twenty hundred hours? She asked. No one went there much during off hours, which meant there was a good chance we wouldn't be discovered, and it would give me plenty of time to make it to my meeting with Chan. All right, I said, clearing my throat. That works. Telling a secret, even to someone you trusted, always carried risks. I knew Chloe would never intentionally tell anyone, but still, the idea of it made me nervous. My dad always told me that two people could keep a secret as long as one of them was dead. As Chloe finished her meal, I wondered whether our conversation had been about more than secret swapping. Maybe Chloe really liked me, and that hope alone was enough to convince me to take the risk. At the same time, hope was dangerous. If you let it grow, it only became more painful when it was crushed like a bug. The entire calf softened to a hush, and I looked up to see CSO Chan standing at the front, flanked by Major Burton and Captain Green. 
His body was angular, almost austere from constant physical training. His black hair was cropped close in military fashion, and his face was stoic, never betraying his inner thoughts. Few knew how old he really was, but I'd guess he was in his mid-fifties. It felt as if Chan's eyes were right on me. Chan had that way about him. I was sure everyone else in the crowd would have said the same. Chan let the silence collect for a moment. Under the table, Chloe's hand met mine. Despite the tension I felt, I couldn't help but smile. Ladies and gentlemen, Chan began, his voice crisp and clear. I hope the evening finds you well. I stand here to inform you of the details of tonight's recon, conducted by Officer Michael Sanchez and assisted by your new recruit, Alex Keener. At the mention of my name, heads turned and I felt eyes seeking me out, but I did my best to ignore them. It was Officer Sanchez's leadership and Alex's willingness to follow orders that kept both men safe tonight. Their performance demonstrates the importance of continuing our military training and exercises. Recons, and in particular first runs, will continue to be a valuable experience for our young recruits. It is paramount that we never take the safety of Bunker 108 for granted. The moment we forget the world is a dangerous place, the moment we grow complacent, is the day we will cease to exist. It will be the day we join the rest of the bunkers that no longer remain operational. He paused, fixing us all with a level gaze. Which leads me to my next point, a matter of great gravity. Knowing what Chan was about to say, I straightened my back to brace myself, just as Chloe's hand tightened on mine. A man was found tonight by our recon team, a man who apparently traveled by foot from Bunker 114 to Bunker 108. I won't go into further detail at this time, but suffice it to say the man's condition is critical, as he was attacked by an unknown assailant. The man... Identity unknown is being treated by Dr. Keener in the medical bay even as I speak. His reason for traveling to Bunker 108 is currently unknown. As mutters filled the calf, Chan paused to slowly survey his audience. The weight of his presence was enough to regain everyone's attention. The Citizens' Council will be convening in a closed emergency session following dinner. All council members, please make your way to the council chamber following this announcement. Furthermore, a public emergency session will commence tomorrow at 0900 hours, and all citizens are invited to attend. All other activities, save those defined as critical by the Bunker 108 Charter, are suspended until 1000 hours tomorrow. Work duties and classes will resume at that time. Normally, I have rejoiced upon hearing those words, but tonight all I could feel was a sick twisting in my gut. Chan had yet to mention anything about the woman. I'm unable to reveal more at this time, Chan said. Let me emphasize that there is nothing to fear. Our security is top-notch, as evidenced by tonight's recon. We are lucky to have the finest officers in the United States of America, and I believe that without a second thought. A final note. I ask that you do not harangue Officer Sanchez or Alex regarding the details of their recon. Tonight's ordeal has already strained them enough. Please save your questions and comments until 0900 tomorrow. Chan paused, giving a final nod. That is all. Carry on. As the CSO left the dais, the calf broke out into an excited buzz. I let go of Chloe's hand. I have to go. She looked at me. Why? I have to see my dad. To avoid giving her an opportunity to ask another question, I picked up my tray to return it before walking out into the main corridor. I was one of the first to leave. I felt bad for leaving Chloe, but I couldn't risk Chan or the other officers seeing us together. I didn't want them to think I was telling Chloe anything she wasn't supposed to know. Besides, I had to see my dad before he was pulled into that meeting. Chapter 6 The medical bay and its offices were strangely colder than the rest of the bunker, stinking of medicine and metal. I'd always wondered how my dad stood working here. A few hours was too much for me. Not for the first time, I questioned whether I really wanted to work here full time someday. I found him engrossed in work at his large wooden desk, squinting at his computer screen. Dad? He jumped at the sound of my voice before looking up. 
Alex, uh, I wasn't expecting to see you until later. I wasn't sure I'd find you here. Have you heard about the emergency session? Chan let me know thirty minutes ago. In fact, I was about to leave for it. The patient is stabilized, and he should be fine with Ibarra watching over things. Chan wants to talk to me afterwards, I said, sitting down in the chair in front of his desk. He scrunched up his heavily lined forehead. Talk to you? About what? He just wants to ask a few questions about the recon. Right. That's to be expected, I suppose. The CSO has always been thorough. My dad frowned in thought. You know, I've been to Bunker 114 several times, but I don't recognize my patient's face. It isn't at all familiar, and I don't forget faces easily. They're a smaller group over there, scientists mostly. He paused for a moment. There is something I find a bit troubling, though. Troubling? How? I took a sample of this man's blood, my dad said, now looking at me fully. Just as a part of a series of tests. Anyway, they reveal an anomaly. This anomaly looked quite similar to the microbes that live inside the xenofungal spores I study. At first, I thought it couldn't be. Such microbes only exist in plants infected with the xenovirus. But when put under the microscope, I was able to home in on one of these microbes. There's no doubt. These microbes are xenoviral in nature, a totally new strain that deserves further study. My dad shook his head wonderingly. You remember, I previously thought the xenovirus was unstable in animal cells, but this proves that some level of contagion is possible. Maybe this xenolife has something to do with his condition. Such a foreign agent in the human body could throw things completely off balance. That means he could be infectious. I was near that guy. I even touched him. We shouldn't jump to conclusions, my dad said. Not yet. The xenovirus as we know it transfers only through fluids. Besides, the xenovirus cannot infect animals directly. In fact, most strains of the xenovirus only affect microscopic life. That's a relief. The point is, it's another form of the virus, one unseen until now, even with the data Bunker 114 transferred to me a few weeks back. Don't you see, Alex? This breakthrough provides more clues for us to figure out how the xenovirus works. I'd hazard a guess that this anomaly wasn't even identified in the Black Files. This wasn't the first time I'd heard my dad mention this digital archive. The Black Files encompassed years of research on the xenovirus and were stored in Bunker 1. Though many scientists had worked on the project, it was the brainchild of Dr. Cornelius Ashton, who had spearheaded the science department at Bunker 1. The Black Files documented the xenovirus from its first discovery, cataloging its various strains and the flora it affected. Bunker 1 was closer to Ragnarok Crater than most other bunkers, meaning they had discovered more varied samples of the xenovirus than was feasible here in California. Unfortunately, the research was lost when Bunker 1 went offline 12 years ago. Everyone there was presumed dead because nothing had been heard from them since. Recons sent by other bunkers had all but disappeared. The loss of the Black Files forced the few remaining scientists to start researching the xenovirus from the ground up. Most were based in Bunker 114. My dad corresponded with them, especially with a man named Dr. Lucan, who headed operations over there. In my dad's most recent research, he discovered that the xenovirus, when exposed to certain plants for long enough, began to adapt in order to infect their host. It provided some groundwork for how the virus evolved and created new strains. Technically, the xenovirus wasn't actually a virus, but something else entirely, and my dad was still in the process of discovering what that was. As for me, watching the lab samples of xenofungus made my skin crawl. There was something sinister about how fast the fungus grew and swallowed plants, sometimes overnight. It created this pinkish gel that we hadn't yet named. I suggested a keener slime, but I didn't blame my dad for not liking the ring of it. For now, we simply called it the slime. My dad looked more tired than I'd ever seen him. 
His eyes were dry and puffy and underlined with deep-set shadows. When was the last time you slept? I asked. He didn't answer for a moment. I can't honestly say. For some reason, I feel like that's bad. Yeah, it is. Get some sleep. You won't figure anything out if you're tired. I'm sure you can still pick something up at the calf. My dad waved the suggestion away. I have to go to that meeting. He shook his head, snorting. A closed emergency session. I'm sure that'll calm everyone down. My time would be better spent here. What if the patient wakes up while you're gone? I'll know as soon as that happens, he said, rubbing his closed eyes with his hands. His heart rate monitor is synced with my watch. I wonder who he is. It must have been important for him to come all this way. I paused, just long enough for my dad to look up at me again. So, I guess you've heard everything about my recon? Just that you found a wastelander woman who probably stabbed the man in the first place? He shook his head. Chan briefed me a bit as soon as he got word from you guys out there. Apparently, he sent the recons out. I imagine she's dead now. I nodded. The survival of the bunker depended upon actions such as these, but my part in it left me feeling more than a bit numb. The fact remains, my dad said, if there's any person on Earth who knows who that man is, or why he came here, it's probably her. He shrugged. Maybe she was even from Bunker 114. I hadn't thought of that, but something told me she wasn't the Bunker type. When footsteps sounded from down the corridor, my dad started shutting down his computer, looking at me over his large desk. Sounds like they're coming to fetch me. Not a moment later, a tall, red-headed officer entered the room. Dr. Keener, meeting's about to start. There's an emergency session of... I'm aware, Officer Fulton, my dad said, standing up, shrugging off his lab coat to leave it behind. He looked at me. I should be home around. Well, let's just hope it's before midnight. I walked with them to the corridor outside the bay before parting ways. While he and Officer Fulton walked toward the council chamber, I set course for the chapel. Surprisingly, there weren't too many people about. Most would be in the commons or at home in their apartments by now. No one was in the calf except for a few kitchen staff wiping down tables. Around the corner and at the end of the hall was the chapel. Chloe was probably already in there. The entrance was marked by two wooden doors with stained glass windows. I paused before the door, noticing the restroom nearby. I stepped inside only to find dirt smudged all over my face. Turning on the warm tap, I rinsed myself clean and did what I could to fix my must brown hair, straightening it with my hands. I even took the time to brush off the dust lingering on my hoodie. I looked at my reflection for a moment. Taller than average and lanky, no matter how much I ate or exercised, I knew I wasn't the most handsome guy to be found. My eyes were brown and my hair overly long, seeming to always be a little in need of a trim. It made me wonder what it was that Chloe saw in me. Whatever it was, I definitely wasn't seeing it. Who cares, I thought. She held your hand, right? Chapter 7 The chapel was dark, save for the colorful glow emanating from its stained glass doors, backlit by the corridor. I took a seat beside Chloe, who was already sitting on the back pew. Before she could say anything, I was talking. I saw someone out there, someone who wasn't one of us. Chloe's blue eyes went wide. You mean, someone other than the guy you found? Yeah, a girl who couldn't have been much older than us. She was watching Michael and me from behind a boulder. She ducked away fast, but I told Michael and he reported it to Captain Green. She might be dead now because of me. Dead? Why? The CSO sent the recons after her. At least, that's what my dad said. Oh. Neither of us said anything for a long moment. But then again, Chloe said, if she got away, she could tell people where we are. Do you think she was the one who tried to kill him? Maybe, I said, but she might have been innocent too. Well, it's dark out there. 
Maybe she escaped. But whether she did or didn't, it's out of your control. I don't know what I could have done differently. You made the best call you could at the time. You valued Michael's life and your own life more than some strangers. What's wrong with that? I hadn't really thought of it that way. That's true, I guess. Not you guess, you know. All right, I said. I know. Now can you repeat after me? This is not my fault. Are you being serious? I am serious. I laughed. It seemed a stupid thing to say, but I knew Chloe would press it until I finally gave in. Okay, it's not my fault. Good, Chloe said. It could have used a little more enthusiasm, but I'll take it. And now, with that out of the way, can we get to the fun part? And what's that? I asked, my heart beginning to beat a little faster. Speculation! That was her idea of fun? Speculation of what? Let's try to figure out who this woman is. My guess is that she probably attacked that guy. We have no proof of that. She just happened to be in the same area. That's pretty strong proof, if you ask me, especially if the attack was recent. We're taught how scary and violent people living on the surface are, and maybe she is, if she killed that guy. But still, what if she didn't? Wastelanders aren't bad people by definition, are they? It took a moment for Chloe to respond, but when she did, she surprised me. They're people too, right? And they have it a lot rougher than we do. You did the best you could in that situation, better than a lot of people would have done. I mean, you could have died. She touched my arm. If it weren't for your actions, we might not even be sitting here now. I nodded. That's true. So, what's going on with that guy you brought in? That's where it gets interesting. I paused, realizing that interesting probably wasn't the right word. Not interesting. More like scary. He's actually in quarantine. Quarantine? Chloe frowned. Is he sick or something? I thought he was stabbed. Only my dad and I know this part, so you really have to promise not to tell anyone. I waited for her to nod, then took a breath. He's sick with the xenovirus. Not directly, but there are infected microbes in his bloodstream. It could be nothing, but my dad is concerned about it. Bunker 114 is the main center of xenoviral research. Chloe let go of my arm. Not many knew about the xenovirus or the nature of my dad's research, but I'd told Chloe a bit about it. Again, I said, it's infecting the microbes, not so much the patient directly. My dad really emphasized that part. He's wondering whether this infection might be keeping him unconscious. Will you be all right? I mean, you were around him. My dad said it's unlikely that anything will infect me. These things tend to spread via fluid and not so much by touch. When Chloe didn't say anything, I reached to hold her arm. I washed my hands and everything. I'll be fine. That's two close calls, Chloe said, moving closer. I hope you never have to go out there again. With luck, I won't, I said. Not for a while. I wrapped my arm around her and she lay her head on my shoulder. Chloe had never been this way with me before. I realized then that it might have been my close call that made her see me differently. Did you see the sun? She asked after a while. The question threw me off. The sun? No, there was no sun, just cold. That's too bad, she said. I've always wanted to feel the sun on my face. It's the only reason I want to go outside, just in the hopes I see it. I didn't respond. No one saw the sun because it never came out. I know it's always hiding above the clouds, Chloe said. But still, I hope. She looked at me. That's silly, isn't it? I shook my head. It's not silly to hope. I'm glad you think so. Sometimes. She trailed off, and I knew she was about to tell me something she didn't tell just anyone. Sometimes... I read books just hoping they'll describe the way the sun feels. 
Sometimes I feel like that's the closest I'll ever come to knowing. What's your favorite description? Chloe paused a moment. It's one that doesn't even describe the way the sun feels. Not directly. It's from this book called Anna Karenina. It says, He tried not to look at her long, as if she were the sun, but like the sun, he saw her even without looking. I felt a chill, because the words described exactly the way I felt about Chloe. That's perfect, I said, pulling her closer. You'll feel it someday. How do you know that? I don't know how, I said. I just believe you will. Paint me a picture, she said, as if you did see it. I wasn't sure what to say, but I could tell it was important. It was bright, so bright you couldn't even look at it. It'd hurt your eyes if you did. It was warm, though, bathing every inch of my skin in soft fire. My skin drank it up, as if it had been starved its whole life. It was nothing like the light baths, because it was real. They say the sun is yellow, but to me, it was white. White beyond white. Even when I looked away, I knew it was there. I never had a doubt. I felt it on the back of my neck. Felt the heat radiating off the rocks. Felt it simmering in the air all around. Immeasurable energy, infusing the world with fire. Did you see anything green? Oh yeah, fields of it. Grass, flower, and trees. Animals and birds, too. You're making me believe it's really there. What color was the sky? Blue. Bluer than you would ever believe. Blue as your eyes. Were there clouds? I thought of the thick layer of low, menacing red closing the ceiling of the sky. All kinds of clouds. Big ones, small ones, puffy ones, wispy ones. But all of them had one thing in common. What's that? They were white, almost silvery from the glow of the sun, and they all moved slowly as if they had nowhere to be. They were pretty, just like looking at a picture. I could have laid down on the grass and stared at them all day. Sounds nice. We sat there for a moment, and Chloe's hand found mine. I snuggled closer, almost not believing this was real. Chloe, I said, my voice thick. I want to tell you something. She moved her face to where she was looking at me. What? As I opened my mouth, though, the chapel door swung open and a shadow fell across us. Chloe and I jerked apart as light from the corridor flooded in. Standing in the doorway was the last person I expected to see. Alex, CSO Chan said. I need you to come with me. Chapter 8 It must have been obvious to Chan that we'd been talking, though Chloe and I tried to appear as innocent as possible. There were still 15 minutes to go until my meeting with Chan, so I could only wonder how he had found us here, or why his meeting with Michael was cut short. I'll see you later, Chloe said. When she reached the chapel door, she cast me a worried glance before walking out. Chan stared for a moment, and I almost started defending myself on the spot. Thankfully, I recognized that this would have been a bad idea. This way, Chan said, turning from the door. I rose from the pew and caught up with Chan, and together we walked toward the officer's wing. I felt as though it wasn't my place to question how he'd found me, or why he wanted to meet early, so I kept quiet. Within minutes, we were in Chan's office. Shut the door, please, and take a seat. Chan sat at a desk that was surprisingly modest for his station. Based on first impressions, Chan wasn't one for luxuries or frills. His desk was bare, save for a computer monitor and a tablet resting on the far corner. There was only one picture, a black and white still of Chan saluting a general who was in the process of pinning a medal onto his black uniform. It had been taken during the old world, because in the picture Chan was a young man, handsome but still familiar since he had the same stoic demeanor. Chan's background was CIA, but of course there wasn't a CIA anymore. The United States only existed in the minds of a few of the old guard. To those of us born underground, 
the United States had died with the loss of Bunker 1. On the far wall hung a large map detailing Southern California. Red pins had been stuck in strategic spots, including a few pins in L.A., Vegas, and several random points in the Mojave Desert. Everything in Chan's office was somehow tied to his position at Bunker 108. It was clear that Chan's one focus in life was work. Chan let the silence stretch a while, his eyes weighing and calculating. Before we start, I'd like to know what you were discussing with Ms. Klein. It was all I could do to look Chan in the eye. I had no idea what to say and wanted to kick myself for not thinking of a response on my way here. I remembered what Michael had said, to just tell the truth and I'd get off easy. Unfortunately, the truth wasn't an option. Sir... We're kind of seeing each other, and it's hard to find privacy sometimes. I felt my cheeks burn. Just the idea of it was enough to make me blush, which I thought was a nice touch. I know it was wrong, and it won't happen again. I looked up to see Chan's eyes narrow. Maybe that lie wasn't good after all. I couldn't tell if he was mad because I was lying or because he believed me. That's all it was, I said. We were talking about school a little bit, too, I guess. Chan's eyes held mine until at last he nodded. Normally, I don't condone such behavior, but that's hardly my concern at the moment. In the future, see that you keep such activities in a more open place. The commons is a more appropriate ground for meeting with a young lady, not the chapel. Whether the CSO bought my lie or not, it was good enough that he was dropping it. Now, Chan continued, I want to know exactly what happened on the recon, in your own words. I've already heard from Officer Sanchez, but I want a more complete picture. Recount everything beginning to end and spare no detail. Any piece of information could be important, even if you believe it's trivial. I nodded. Yes, sir. His eyes measured my every word, a process which seemed to speed up when I reached the part where Michael and I found the man from Bunker 114. I saw the man, and he had several stab wounds in his back. That's when I saw this woman. I paused. No, not a woman, really. She was probably older than me, but not by much. Describe her, to the greatest extent possible. We heard a bit from your radio call, but perhaps you can paint a better picture. The fact that Chan was asking for this information meant the recons hadn't found her. I couldn't say why, but I felt relieved. Well, I only saw her for a half a second, if that. I remember she had long, black hair. She was pretty. She didn't seem white, either. Maybe Asian or Hispanic? Good, Chan said, making a note on a nearby pad. That detail was left out. Can you describe her clothing? her manner, or anything further about her appearance. Was she tall, short, anything that would make her stick out? Raider types often have tattoos that affiliate them with their gang. I honestly can't say. I would be making up stuff at this point. I paused. I can say that my attention wasn't really drawn to any markings, so there couldn't have been anything too crazy. Crazy? Just that she was normal-looking, I said. Her clothes were kind of ragged and dusty, but nothing else stands out. And that's when you lost sight of her. I nodded. In this way, Chan continued to question me for the next fifteen minutes. Was she alone? Did she see me? Was she armed? What direction did I think she went? He sought a level of detail I just couldn't provide. At last, Chan seemed to come to the conclusion that I didn't know anything more. He sat back in his chair, cracking his knuckles. When the bunkers were first established, there were 144, as you were well aware from your schooling. Now, how many are there? Four. Four. He paused, letting that sink in. You're too young to know this, Alex, being only 16. But that day in 2030, when the bunkers were filled, there was hope. The bunkers would arise and rebuild the nation Ragnarok had destroyed. But the bunkers failed one by one. Most were wiped out by wastelanders, very much like the one you saw today. It was just one, you might say. Well, one is all it takes to bring back an army of thugs that could very well end this bunker and the lives it protects. 
The bunkers that have fallen were too lax in security, too generous in charity. Some did everything right, by the book, and even then it wasn't enough. He went quiet, drumming his fingers on the desk. Every day, Alex, when I wake up, I wonder without fail, are we next? Am I doing enough to protect this bunker and the lives of its citizens? Because one day, he snapped his fingers, it could all be gone, some four hundred souls snuffed out like the flame of a candle. Chan was sharing a level of information that surprised me. It wasn't the place of common citizens, and especially a teenager like me, to know all this. Something told me that Chan knew things about the wasteland that no one else did. Some bunkers were abandoned because they could no longer support themselves, Chan said. A great many fell in this way. We have records of it. But just as often, some were stormed by wastelanders because those bunkers couldn't bring themselves to shoot the ones who wandered by. Chan paused and steepled his fingers. Of course, other bunkers just disappeared into the night. Here one day, gone the next, with no rhyme or reason why. Bunker 1 is such an example, along with bunkers 23 and 6. Chan paused. Do you know why we're still alive, Alex? Do you know why we haven't fallen? Just four left out of one hundred and forty-four. Because no one knows we're here? That's correct. No one knows we're here. Part of the reason for recons is to keep tabs on our environment. The wasteland is a fluid place. Things can change rather quickly. If we can't adapt to those changes, it's to our peril. He paused. I am the chief security officer. It's my job to maintain the security of Bunker 108. I was given license to do whatever is necessary to ensure that. He stared at me a while longer, until at last he looked away. If you remember anything more about your recon, you talk to me personally. Remember what I said earlier about this. Not a word, either about this or about what your father discovered in the lab. My eyes widened at that. My dad had informed Chan quickly. I'll be sure to let you know if I remember anything, sir. You are dismissed. I stood and headed for the door, placing my hand on the knob, but rather than letting myself out, I half turned to look at the CSO. I just had to ask, Sir, why was that man coming to our bunker anyway? Chan looked up, his eyes searching mine in what I sensed to be an attempt to find out what I already knew. That's what we're still trying to figure out. He gestured toward the door. You are dismissed. I knew I had tested my luck there, so I nodded graciously. Thank you, Officer Chan. As I walked into the empty corridor, questions raced through my mind. I knew Chan was holding something back. The main thing I wondered was whether he was lying, whether he in fact had known that man was coming. Yet it didn't seem plausible that he could have known. Otherwise, the bunker would have been prepared to receive him. Unless, I thought, grasping at the first wild theory to hit my mind, unless something had happened at Bunker 114, something bad, I knew without being told that I had hit upon something close to the truth. Why else would we have received this guy without warning? By the time I returned to the apartment, it was 2100 hours. It was a relief to shut the door and allow myself to relax. Collapsing onto the worn sofa, I heaved a huge sigh and closed my eyes. I tried not to think about the details of the meeting, but I couldn't help it. Chan was the one person whose bad side I didn't want to be on. I doubted he would reveal anything new at the meeting tomorrow, but of course, I would still be there like everyone else. He would continue to hold on to information and say just enough to satisfy everyone's curiosity. In spite of being tired, I was too keyed up to go to sleep. I opened my eyes and found myself taking in my familiar surroundings. The bookshelf ahead of me, filled to overflowing, was a legacy from my grandpa, Lauren Keener, who'd been a voracious reader and a brilliant immunologist. My dad had only told me the story of their entrance to Bunker 108 once, and from what he said, I never wanted to hear it again. My grandpa had flown to Europe to bring both my dad, who was just ten at the time, and my grandma back to the States. 
They were meant to be in Bunker 1, but their berth had been reassigned by lottery because they arrived too late. Only one berth remained open, within their reach. Bunker 108. So Grandpa Keener drove his family from Colorado to California during the darkest time of the dark decade, surviving gun-wielding gangs, a fuel shortage, and jam-packed highways. They made it in the end, but the worst was yet to come. A multitude of people were waiting just outside Bunker 108's entrance, a bunker that was supposed to have remained secret. The bunker's officers were guarding the entrance, having been assigned there to receive my grandparents and dad. But when the guards were escorting them inside, the crowd mistook the action and demanded to be let in as well. What followed was a massacre. Some twenty people laid dead before the crowd backed off. My dad and grandpa made it inside okay, but tragically my grandma was caught in the crossfire. The story was haunting on so many levels, and it made me realize how tough my dad's life had been. Not only did he lose his wife, but he had lost his mother at the age of ten. Anytime I asked about the dark decade, he went quiet. In the end, he always told me they called it the dark decade for a reason, and left it at that. Some of these books my grandpa acquired from the archives, spending credits when there were sales. Others he had received as gifts from friends or in trade for his services, it didn't matter to him that he could have read all he wanted from the archives. He was a collector, and according to my dad, he had bemoaned not being allowed to take his massive library into Bunker One. Maybe a little of my grandpa rubbed off on me because I found comfort in the books, and my dad seemed to as well. By the age of 16, I'd read most of them, and my favorites at least twice. There were the expected medical texts on the shelf, but there were also thick, leather-bound volumes of classic histories, such as Tacitus, Livy, and Cicero. However, the bulk was dedicated to science fiction and fantasy. We probably had the largest private collection of that genre of everyone living in Bunker 108, and people often asked my dad or me if they could borrow our books. Next to the bookshelf was a large desk littered with papers and yet more books— that was where I did my homework and sometimes sketched. I wasn't too good yet, but Chloe was an artist and she'd shown me a few things. The eyes were the hardest part. I didn't understand why, but Chloe said it was because eyes held the soul and that anything transcendent was hard to convey on paper. Tonight, Chloe and I had seen more of each other than we had in a while. I wanted to believe that she liked me, and everything seemed to indicate she did. She had held my hand and let me put my arm around her. After all, and there weren't any clearer signs than that. All I knew was that I couldn't stop thinking about her, and I had to do something about it. Chapter 9 When I walked into the living room the next morning, I was surprised to see that my dad had come home. Sprawled on the couch, still in his wrinkled lab coat, he slept so soundly that I didn't want to disturb him. He needed sleep, and his obsession with his research often kept him from getting it. I tried to be quiet, reaching for my backpack before remembering there was no school today. The meeting started at 0900 hours, so there was only time to eat breakfast before heading over to the council chamber. Most parents had to wake their kids to meet the day, but with us, it was the opposite. If I hadn't thought it better for my dad to get out into the real world and see people, I would have brought him something to eat from the calf. Even an extra hour of rest would have done him good, but given his position on the council, sleeping late was something he couldn't afford. Dad, it's time to wake up. He didn't stir at first, instead muttering and shifting around on the couch. Dad, we need to go. There's that meeting today, so you can't sleep in. He groaned. Now I definitely feel like the parent. Grumbling, my dad got up, shooting me an annoyed glance before heading for the shower. I waited by the door as he got ready, reaching into my backpack for my tablet to study a bit. When he left the bathroom, he was fully dressed in his nicer clothes, a collared shirt, slacks, and even a jacket and tie. His hair was combed and his face appeared fresh, even though his eyes were tired. It was a far cry from how he'd looked 15 minutes ago. It was important that he looked sharp for the meeting because hundreds of eyes would be on him. I nodded with approval. Ready? 
He gave a noncommittal grunt before we left the apartment. They stopped serving breakfast at 0800, so we'd have to hurry to make it. The corridors hummed with life, fuller than usual at this hour. It seemed everyone had gotten a late start, taking advantage of the fact that they didn't need to be anywhere until mid-morning. A few people greeted my dad as we navigated the corridors. He nodded tersely and mumbled his good mornings while holding his head as if he had a splitting headache. I was afraid people would mistake him for a gin head. There was no alcohol technically in Bunker 108, but certain people brewed their own gin that sold for credits on a black market. Chan did what he could to stamp it out, but for every operation he shut down, another started up. Straighten up, I said. You don't want to give people the wrong idea. My dad had always been a workaholic, but his workload had only intensified these past few weeks. Not only was his research heating up, but at the same time, a bad cold virus was triggering more appointments. As if that weren't enough, there were more council meetings of late, too. My dad was slowly transforming into the stereotypical image of a mad scientist. To look at him on a typical day, one would think he didn't have the time to care for either his appearance or his health. That task often fell to me. In a sense, folks let him get away with it. People always went easier on those they genuinely liked or admired, and my dad was popular on both counts. He possessed a friendly nature, which admittedly was more evident when he had a saner work schedule. He was absolutely brilliant and knew all sorts of things, even outside his field. And it didn't hurt that he happened to be the person who made people's illnesses go away. It was no wonder people continued to vote him onto the council term after term. How late did you stay up last night? I asked. That meeting couldn't have lasted longer than 2300. It did, my dad said. And I still had work to do in the lab, so I went back for just a few minutes. But a few minutes turned into a few hours, and before I knew it, it was 0400. Dad, you've got to get your sleep. That's something I can't give in to right now, he said as we turned the final corner to the calf. A long line of people spilled out of the calf. I resisted the urge to complain as we made our way to the back of the line. This is what we got for sleeping in. Usually, I would have been here right at 0700 hours when most students arrived because classes started at 0730. But now, both students and late risers were causing the line to be much longer than usual. I felt someone tap me on the shoulder, and I turned to see Chloe. You're late too? I asked. She shook her head, patting her stomach. Nope. Got here at my usual time. Even got some studying done. Yeah, yeah, I said. Good for you. Had the whole place to myself, pretty much. She smiled, then shrugged. Never underestimate the power of waking up early. I don't even know if I'll get to eat. A true tragedy, Chloe said. Well, whatever happens, you should come find me in the commons after. We have that geometry test tomorrow, so we need to be prepared. It was very like Chloe to squeeze some studying into a small window of time. It was a bit of a surprise at first to hear she wanted to study with me. Usually she studied with her friends or with whoever she was dating at the time. It was bad luck that a male voice interrupted us before I had a chance to respond. Councilman Keener? We turned to see Officer Thompson, a burly man who sported a full beard. Yes? We need to make sure you're at the meeting, so you're cleared to advance to the front of the line. My dad shook his head. No need for that, officer. We can wait. CSO's orders, Officer Thompson said. I'll escort you and Alex both. My dad and I shared a glance, but in the end, we went along with Officer Thompson. Remember, Chloe said as we walked away, the commons. Once out of earshot, my dad said, So, what's going on with you and Miss Klein? Nothing, I said, trying to hide my embarrassment. We're just friends. Uh-huh. You need to be careful around pretty girls, and that one has an eye out for you. Yeah, right. I'm glad you agree, because I could positively see the sparkle in her eyes. Dad, stop! He just chuckled, which only made me feel more flustered. 
The kitchen staff worked furiously to fill everyone's trays, and it was clear they weren't used to dealing with such an influx. A minute later, though, we were seated. I wolfed down my breakfast burrito to have more time with Chloe, which only ended up amusing my dad. Within a couple of minutes, my plate was clean and I was getting up. Just friends indeed, my dad said. Dad, you're annoying. No, my name is Dad. We've been over this countless times. I resisted the urge to hit him. Good luck at your meeting. You should do okay as long as you keep the dad jokes to a minimum. My dad chuckled, taking another bite of his potatoes. As I walked toward the exit, the sound of my dad's laughter gave way to buzzing snippets of table conversations, one after another, until the din of the calf faded to the stillness of an overly quiet commons. It was saved from complete emptiness by a few old folks playing chess, per their custom, and a pretty girl I had yet to find. I discovered Chloe sitting in the reading corner with her tablet out, but to my disappointment, she wasn't alone. One of our classmates, Vincent Corley, had staked a claim in the chair beside her, and it looked as if they were deep in conversation about something. Vincent was tall, handsome, and undeniably a jerk. And I knew he had always had a thing for Chloe, like half the guys in our class. Neither had noticed me yet, but as I started toward them, Chloe saw and waved me over. Vincent looked up, narrowing his eyes in challenge. Hey, Vin, how's it going? I made myself say. Vincent made his facial expression overly pleasant when Chloe looked at him. Good, how have you been, bro? Vincent never acknowledged me unless it was to have some fun at my expense. All this making nice was just show for Chloe. We ran into each other, so we were just catching up, Chloe said. Ready to get started? I stood there awkwardly for a second. There really wasn't any place for me to sit, and Vincent clearly planned on staying around, which was unfortunate. The surrounding chairs were too heavy to move without me looking like a chump. Vincent looked at me, amused, curious to see how I'd handle this. It's about time to head to the meeting anyway, I said. We can study later this afternoon. There's still thirty minutes, Vincent said. I really need to be prepared for this. It's a great idea, actually, Chloe said. We can get good seats that way. Vincent laughed at that. At a council meeting? We'll be the first to die of boredom, I'll give you that. Don't be silly, Vincent, Chloe said. If the calf was any indication, it would be a good idea to head over and beat the crowds. I'd rather be sitting than standing. I was glad Chloe didn't need any convincing. A minor victory, but I'd take anything. Shall we? I smiled when she looked at me while saying it, not Vincent, and seeing the crestfallen look on his face only made it sweeter. Chapter 10 By the time we reached the council chamber, the place was already three-fourths full. These things were almost never attended, and the size of the crowd was a good sign of how worried people were. In the end, we found three seats near the top row. Chloe gestured for Vincent to go first so she could make sure to sit between the two of us. I didn't understand why Vincent wouldn't just go away. It was as if his life mission was to be as much of a pain as possible. Over the next 30 minutes, we watched the rest of the bunker file in. There were no open seats 15 minutes after we arrived, leaving the latecomers to stand. I saw Chan himself sitting on the bottom row with several of his key officers, including Major Burton and Captain Green. I was right about getting here early, I said, loud enough for Vincent to hear. I thought I could hear him growl. Quiet, Chloe said. They're coming out. The seven members of the Citizens Council walked out of the back room. First was Jen Forster, the eldest of the council and consul-elect. Her gray hair was set tightly in a bun, a perfect fit for her severe demeanor and gaunt face. She was Bunker 108's chief archivist and had been for as long as I could remember. Next in line was Blake Lightfoot, a portly engineer with receding hair who worked down in fusion. As he sat, his generous gut pushed against the table, making all three of his chins waggle. I would have never said this out loud, 
but I'd always thought his thick glasses made him look like an overfed mole. Lightfoot was followed by Heather Wu, who worked in IT, Thomas Bull, a man as stubborn and persistent as his last name, and Gwen Roy, a middle-aged woman who worked in hydroponics, specifically in recycling. And then my dad, Stephen Keener, who looked positively zombie-like as he dragged himself across the stage. Last of all was Ruth Massey, the council's most surprising member. At 24 years old, she had shoulder-length blonde hair, bright blue eyes, and an easy smile that combined to make her quite striking. Like Gwen, she worked in hydroponics. But more importantly, at least in explaining her presence on the council, were Ruth's connections to the officers. Her husband, Mark, was an officer, and as such, she was good friends with all the officers' wives, including Lauren, Michael's wife. The officers worked as a coalition, and there was always at least one person representing their interests on the council. Usually that person was an officer, not an officer's wife. But their bad reputation of always getting their way with the council had led the officers to choose someone to soften their image. Ruth definitely fit the bill, and if anything, things swung in the officers' favor more often than ever. For that reason, Ruth was both liked and disliked. As each of the members seated themselves, they took roll and reviewed the agenda on their tablets. The hum of the audience ebbed as minutes ticked away, until at last, at 0900 on the dot, Councilwoman Forster took her gavel and struck three times. I hereby call this public emergency session of the Citizens' Council to order on this 22nd day of September, 2060. Her voice was a bit tremulous, but firm and clear. We are here to discuss and vote upon a measure to be made today by Chief Security Officer Chan. We discussed this matter at length last night, and suffice it to say, it is a matter of great importance. The council room went completely quiet. From the front row, Chan made his way to the podium, set before the half-circular table, and faced his silent audience. Good morning, and thank you, Councilwoman Forster. I'm afraid the news I have to share with you today isn't good, and I ask that you refrain from any questions or comments until I have finished speaking. There will be an opportunity for both following the meeting. All council members have graciously consented to stay until noon. Chan took a long moment to pause as if collecting his thoughts. Every week, in accordance with protocol, we check in with Bunker 114. In light of last night's events, of which I'm sure most of you are already familiar, we moved up our scheduled call. However, this call was met with silence. At this point, murmurs broke out in the chamber. Forster made as if to wrap her gavel, but the sheer movement of her hand was enough to silence the room. As discussed in our closed meeting last night, Chan went on, we believe it is possible, perhaps even probable, that they are merely experiencing communications difficulties, we believe this is the reason Bunker 114 sent a messenger across the wasteland, the very same man the recon found last night. It's possible this messenger had the objective of reporting said difficulties and to ask our assistance in restoring communications. Something about what Chan said didn't ring true to me. Why would they have just sent one man? And why send him on foot across the dangerous wasteland? Didn't Bunker 114 have their own vehicles? The man, Chan said. Identity still unknown is alive and in stable condition. He appears to be in a coma, and until he wakes we can't learn anything more. If the man does not wake soon, or if his condition deteriorates, and let it be noted that both Dr. Keener and I have no reason to believe it will, we will consider mounting our own investigation regarding Bunker 114's status. The details of such a mission if decided upon favorably by this council and by extension its citizenry, will be revealed at a later date. Chan half turned to the council members behind him. I set before the council a resolution to be voted upon today according to the tenets of the Bunker 108 Charter. Councilwoman Forster, if you would kindly read the resolution. The entire room waited as Forster drew her microphone closer. Until such time that the status of Bunker 114 is determined, I, Chief Security Officer Chan, move that Bunker 108 be placed on lockdown status. 
No person shall enter or leave save by direct executive order of the chief security officer, and if, in thirty days' time, no conclusion can be drawn regarding the fate of Bunker 114, the question of Bunker 108's lockdown status will be revisited by the Citizens' Council. Furthermore, I move that I, Chief Security Officer Chan, be given emergency executive powers, effective immediately and suspended thirty days hence, powers only supplanted by a unanimous vote of the Citizens' Council, such powers being stated in Article 6 of the Bunker 108 Charter. A loud murmur emanated from the audience. It sounded as if the resolution would grant the CSO power to do pretty much anything for the next thirty days, which was more than a little worrisome. One of the things we learned in class was how all the events of the dark decade led to the United States shifting from a republic in truth to a republic in name, as Congress voted again and again to grant President Garland more emergency powers to restore order by any means necessary, until the United States was a de facto dictatorship. It was an issue that many people were sensitive about today. I didn't believe Chan intended to abuse this power, but I could only wonder why it was necessary. It was hard to believe that such a measure could pass. The Council did not give up power easily, but then again, my intuition told me that this was exactly what would happen, as if everything had been planned last night. Had they all worked out some agreement beforehand? Secret meetings were not well liked for obvious reasons, but in Bunker 108, they were becoming more commonplace. If anything disturbed me about Chan's words, it was this. Nowhere had he mentioned the xenovirus. Do any favor the motion? Forster asked. I favor the motion, Lightfoot said. Seconded, Wu said. Let it be shown in the records of this meeting that Chief Security Officer Chan's edict is now set before the Citizens' Council for consideration, Forster said. Now, for opinions, Councilman Lightfoot? No opinion, Lightfoot said. Very well, Forster said. Councilwoman Wu. This measure is necessary, temporary and uncontroversial among the council members, and it should be said that the only power not granted to the chief security officer is the ability to overturn the thirty days provision. Several of the other council members nodded at that, though my dad was not among them. It was hard to read his expression, but if his tapping fingers against the tabletop were any indication, he seemed quite agitated. Chloe also took notice. Is your dad all right? He definitely seemed to be a little under the weather or something. Maybe it was just nerves. He worked very late last night, I said. Maybe that's it. Councilman Bull, Forster asked. No opinion. The lack of debate out of Bull was very uncharacteristic, and, I thought, telling. Councilwoman Roy? She paused a moment before letting out a sigh. Normally, I wouldn't support a measure placing so much power in the executive office. However, in this rare situation, it is warranted for the security of all. I support the measure. Very good. Councilwoman Massey? There are those rare instances where the executive head must be given more direct control, she said. This is one of those times. I wish to remind everyone that the Council has voted in favor of such measures in the past, though admittedly it has been a while, she smiled. Far before my time. Some members of the Council chuckled at that. Councilman Keener, what say you? I knew which way he was going to vote, but if my dad, for whatever reason, decided to throw a kink in the plan, the matter would be forced into further discussion rather than moving directly to a vote. Chan was eyeing my dad severely. What was going on here? Councilman Keener, Forster said again. Is there something you'd like to say concerning the measure? He paused. His face was drawn and pale. Yes. Is that a yes to my question, or a yes to the measure? His eyes turned up to meet Chan's. Within them, I read both challenge and a level of intensity I had never seen. 
It was clear that he was to speak against it, contrary to a prior agreement he had made last night. I move that this matter be discussed further, he said. The wind seemed to go out of the room. I disapprove of the motion. Chan threw my dad a murderous look. It was the most emotion I'd ever seen out of the man, but Chan quickly recovered as the other council members stared wide-eyed. Councilman Lightfoot's eyes practically bulged out of his glasses. An anxious buzz overtook the room. Recovering at last, Forrester raised her gavel, wrapping it on the table. It took a full half minute for the noise to die down, at which time she resumed speaking. Let the record show that Councilman Keener has changed his opinion from last night, she said in an exasperated manner. Now, would you care to elucidate this change of heart, Councilman? Gladly, my dad said. After the meeting last night, I went to work in the lab and discovered some new facts regarding the patient, facts which will, no doubt, change some council members' opinions. That made everyone go quiet, though by the white-knuckled grip Chan had on the podium, it looked as though the CSO was ready to burst out at any moment. What had my dad learned? And would Chan allow him to say it? And what did you discover, Dr. Keener? Forster asked. Did the man wake up and tell you the status of Bunker 114, and you've waited until now to inform us? No, my dad said. Though he is not woken from his coma, the particular condition of my patient, the condition that is likely the cause of his coma, is telling me a great deal of what might be going on at Bunker 114. That is quite enough, CSO Chan said. I will not have you disclosing classified information to the general populace during open council. Not classified, my dad said. The classification of scientific material is at the discretion of the chief scientific officer of the United States of America, which is, in fact, me. Dr. Lukin of Bunker 114 is the chief scientific officer, Chan said. And Bunker 114 is gone, effectively making me chief scientific officer. This caused the entire chamber to erupt in dispute. Several shouted above the din, demanding an explanation from Chan and the council. And judging from the expressions on the council members' faces, they were also shocked at hearing my dad's words. Forster positively slammed her gavel with such force that I wouldn't have been surprised if it snapped. Chan was none too pleased, insistently calling for order. My dad merely watched, waiting for quiet so he could continue to make his point. There's no demonstrable proof of this, Dr. Keener, Chan said as the last of the clamor abated. Surely you would not be so imprudent as to hang your assertion on such a slender reed? We know nothing of Bunker 114's status. But it can be easily deduced. Let us look at the evidence, he paused. And I needn't remind you that the weighing of evidence is part of my daily responsibilities. We haven't received radio contact from Bunker 114, and your assertion that this is due to a communications failure is, in fact, the slender reed. Furthermore, this man is not suffering from just stab wounds. His blood tests show a clear infection. Again, Chan said, talking over my dad. You risk the dissemination of classified information. At best, you will be imprisoned, and at worst, you could face charges of treason. Stand down, Dr. Keener, if you know what's good for you. What was left of the crowd's fire was quickly doused by Chan's warning, but my dad did not appear subdued. I am within my full First Amendment rights, and you know it. It is interesting to observe that, in order to present my case, I must commit the most heinous crime in the eyes of this council and my fellow citizens. I would say that this is terribly convenient for you, Officer Chan. Forster gasped, as did more than a few among the crowd. No one had ever stood up to Chan like this. I cannot allow that information to be revealed, Chan said, for the common good and security of this bunker. You don't have full executive power, Chan, my dad said with a dangerous smile. Not yet. 
Not while I can fight to reveal the truth. I will, whether you like it or not. Then, Dr. Keener, I will be forced to arrest you. Chapter 11 A collective gasp went through the crowd. My dad's face grew even whiter, if that was possible. By arresting me, my dad said steadily with a boldness I never knew he possessed, you would silence the only person who knows why your proposal would be a costly mistake. What I'm doing is legal and fully within my prerogative as chief scientist. Furthermore, any attempt to arrest me without due process would be in direct violation of the Bunker 108 Charter, as everyone here well knows. This is an action you can only undertake should this council vote in your favor today. What will die here tonight? The freedom of an individual within his rights, or the possibility of the tyranny against which he stands? These are not small issues, and they will not be silenced by your bullying. Just get to it already, a man shouted from the audience. Perhaps we should investigate Dr. Keener's opinion as a separate measure, Councilwoman Forster said, trying to smooth things over. No, Chan said, never taking his gaze from my dad. Two roads lie before you, Dr. Keener. One is the way of good sense and legality. The other, demagoguery. You, not I, risk violating the Bunker 108 Charter. My dad refused to break eye contact with Officer Chan. I beg to differ. Are you denying the public its basic right to information? Or shall this bunker continue its rapid slide into despotism? His words left the room dumbfounded. In a single sentence, my dad had at least half the people on his side, evidenced by some enthusiastic applause. If Chan tried to silence him now, there would be no question that the CSO was hiding something, something the public had a right to know. Too long have you bled the power from this council and the people, my dad said. This ends tonight. The crowd applauded again, even louder. That is quite enough, Dr. Keener, Forster said. I don't think anyone here believes that our democratic proceedings are at threat. A look of frustration crossed my dad's face as Forster looked warily at Chan. Officer Chan, by your leave, I would like to propose a motion to determine the validity of Dr. Keener's evidence. There you go proving my point. There's no need to ask the CSO for permission, Forster, and yet you do. We all do. My dad paused. You are consul-elect. That used to mean something around here. You used to fight, Forrester, but it seems you've left your teeth in the jar this morning. As Forrester's face burned and the crowd gasped, my dad knew he had gone too far. Standing up to Chan was one thing, but Forrester was well-liked. Making an ageist insult had won him no favors. Damn you in your mouth, I thought. You had him. I could tell by my dad's face that he was about to say something, but Chan capitalized on the opportunity. That is enough, Dr. Keener. Disrespecting me is one thing, but lashing out against our esteemed consul-elect will have you ejected from this meeting. By whose authority? my dad asked. By mine, Forster said, her blue eyes burning into him. Now, if you are quite through with your grandstanding. I'm not, Forrester. Don't you cut me off. I have all the time I need, and you know it. My dad turned away from the council to face the crowd. Should we vest absolute executive power in the chief security officer, even temporarily, when it's obvious that he's hiding something? We are fooling ourselves if we believe it would last only thirty days, the council fought for that provision in last night's closed meeting. Maybe you don't see it, but you felt it. Tiny changes and inconveniences, taking your voice, spreading inequality. We gripe at the council, but are they to blame? Or is some other poison infecting us all? Ladies and gentlemen, what you see before you is not democracy, but the death of it. Anyone who denies your right to information only seeks to control you. 
This is not just basic or routine information of which you speak, Chan nearly spat. Its release will incite a panic unseen in this bunker's history. What's the solution, then? To firm your stranglehold on information flow? To grant you unnecessary power? Any society that gives up a little liberty to gain a little security deserves neither and will lose both. He paused to let that point sink in. You don't give these people enough credit, Officer Chen. He turned to face the council. And if we do what he asks, we don't give ourselves enough credit. Before any resolve could form amongst the council, Chan cut in. You know full well the consequences for uttering another word of your belabored point. Classified information once revealed is treason to the United States of America. Chan now pointed, his finger shaking, his face blanched. And I will not allow that to happen. My dad looked at Forrester, waiting for her support. However, Forrester said nothing, though she seemed conflicted. A moment passed, and my dad knew that he was on his own. Accepting this, he nodded and faced the people. This man, my patient, he is... Officers, Chan called. Arrest him. The rest of my dad's words were lost to shouting and pandemonium. Two officers moved toward him, and due to the uproar, the words he shouted could not be heard. Even as some tried to quiet the room in order to hear, it was useless. Already ten officers had assembled in front of the council, so sudden and smooth one would think it was planned in advance. My dad was positively yelling at the top of his lungs. I was frozen in my seat, wishing there was something I could do. As the officers dragged him from the stage, I sprang into action, deciding that doing anything was better than doing nothing. No! I pushed through the crowd, most of them shouting down Chan and the officers. My dad had ceased his shouting, and instead appeared to be looking for me amongst the roiling crowd. Alex, Chloe said. She grabbed my arm and followed me down the steps. Before I could rush toward my dad, an officer intercepted me. Though I fought with all I had, I gave up when another officer joined the first to block me from proceeding. I watched helplessly as my dad was pulled from the room. People were shouting, angry words flying from their mouths, but vote or no vote, there was no question who was now in full control of Bunker 108. The officers formed a line, not allowing any person to pass as Chan walked out of the room, flanked by yet more officers. The members of the Citizens' Council, in contrast, sat in shocked silence. Never in the history of Bunker 108 had anything like this happened. I felt fear on so many levels. I was afraid for my dad and what would happen to him. I was afraid of all the things he'd said and tried to say. Most of all, I felt fear for the future of the bunker. What were they going to do to my dad? Chan had completely covered up what he was trying to say about the xenovirus. Had anyone heard his shouting? It had been a full minute since my dad had been taken out, and still people weren't calming down. Councilwoman Forrester had stopped banging her gavel because it only seemed to aggravate people further. I saw the faces of people I'd known all my life, dependable adults with usually kind dispositions, act like caged animals, their faces contorted with rage. There were cries of, release him, and keener, but the officers seemed unperturbed as they stared down the crowd. I felt Chloe's urgent tugging on my hand from behind in an effort to get my attention. With my dad in custody, she and I were the only ones who knew anything about the xenovirus and the patient. That meant Chan would eventually come after me, and maybe even Chloe if he hadn't bought my lie yesterday. Come on, she said. I followed her into the crowd, thankful that people were still focused on the officers rather than paying attention to me. There's the back exit, Chloe said. They haven't blocked it yet. I'd almost forgotten about it but it wouldn't take long for one of the officers to remember. Chapter 12 We walked up the steps, pushing through the crowd. We have to find my dad, I said. 
They're probably taking him to the holding cells, Chloe said. Which means there's no way you're going to see him without getting caught up in it, too. There has to be some way, I said. Chloe, think of what they'll do to him. Chloe bit her lip as we filtered out of the council room and into the narrow corridor outside. The crowd spilled around us, jostling us closer together, effectively keeping any officers from spotting us. The upper floor was small, containing offices and classrooms for the most part. People seemed disoriented, not sure of what to do or where to go. What happened to my dad must have really upset them. Alex, what was your dad going to say? Chloe asked, after pulling me into a quiet doorway away from the crowd. Was it about the xenovirus? Yeah, I said. It couldn't be anything else. Maybe he discovered something new last night, something he hasn't even told me. Other than your dad, are we the only two who know about it? Besides Chan, yeah. He's going to try and find us then, Chloe said. That's for certain. He doesn't know I told you, so you should be safe. Yeah, right. Maybe you lied to Chan, but he probably didn't believe it for a second. Where do we go then? She grabbed my hand, pulling me further from the council chamber. Not standing around here, that's for sure. And look, this corridor's empty. How's that for timing? She led me along the corridor, far from the council chamber. It was only when we were on the other side of the bunker that we went down a staircase. We continued going down, past the first level until we reached the very bottom, two additional flights down. Hydroponics is a maze, Chloe said and I know it like the back of my hand. I stopped, causing Chloe to turn around and look at me. What? Alex, we need to keep moving. Maybe it's best if I turn myself in. He's going to find us eventually. Chan's going to lock you up, Chloe said. I'm not letting that happen. And what am I supposed to do? Keep running until they find me? I shook my head. Chloe, I have to face this. I need to see my dad. I don't even know if he's all right. Chloe looked at me, seeming unsure. Part of me wished that a reason existed for us to keep going, but she knew as much as I did that the solution wasn't running or hiding. It was time to face whatever awaited me upstairs. I'm coming with you, she said. No, deny everything they ask you. You don't know about the xenovirus. Last night, we were just talking about school. If Chan really presses you, say we were making out. What? Chloe asked. It's what I told him yesterday, sort of, I said. Our stories have to match. Chloe smiled, despite the situation. You got really optimistic. It was the first thing that came to my mind. I could be cruel and make fun of you, but unfortunately, there's no time for that. So what are you going to do? Let myself get caught, I said. I'm going to cooperate as much as possible. That way they don't suspect you of anything. Then I'll try to find out about my dad. And what should I do? Find your parents and get back to your apartment. You can pretend you went straight there after the meeting. I held her hands, looking her in the eye. Listen, you're the only one who knows about this now. At least the only one who'll be able to tell people what's really going on. Alex, I don't understand the first thing about what's going on. You know enough, I said. Spread the word about what's really going on in the medical bay. That man is infected with the xenovirus. He might even be a danger to the rest of us. Chan wants to use that information to take control rather than approach it in a more democratic way. That's probably what my dad planned on saying until Chan silenced him. At least, that's what I think he was going to say. So, just what do I say? That there's a man who is going to infect us all? That's no good. All we might do is start a panic. No, listen to me, that's not the point, I said. Whatever is going on, no matter how bad, we don't have to give Chan absolute control. We have to deal with this situation as a bunker, together. She nodded. All right, I'll tell my parents first, see what they think. That's a good start, I said, but they may want you to keep quiet. Even if they tell you that, 
If my dad and I are locked up, people need to know what's going on. There's a chance they're not going to let us out for a while. Alex, I'm doing this, Chloe. What about you? Chloe asked. You're important, too. Don't tell me you're not, because I think you are. My dad always tells me the same thing whenever I'm facing a tough situation. A man doesn't do what he wants. He does what he must. I'll be all right. They might not even keep me there that long. I'll be okay. I promise. Chloe nodded, tears coming to her eyes. You can do this, Chloe. I know you can. If I say anything, it'll be traced back to me eventually. I couldn't believe I'd overlooked that. Tell your parents, at least. They'll know what to do. Chloe nodded. Okay, I will. You can head to your apartment from here, and I can head back the other way. We probably shouldn't be seen together. Alex? Chloe looked at me, not saying anything for a moment. I wasn't sure what she was thinking. Yeah? Be careful, please. Don't let them get to you. I won't, I said. Just do everything we talked about, and we'll be okay. She touched my face, letting her fingers rest on my cheek for a moment. From behind came the faraway sound of shouting. Good luck, she said. She ran up the stairs, and by the time she was out of sight, two officers appeared from around the corner. Upon seeing me, they quickened their pace. Alex, you need to come with us, one of them said. To where? I asked. The officer's wing, for your own safety. My safety? CSO's orders, the officer said. The other officer reached for my arm, but I backed away. That's not necessary. I nodded down the corridor. Lead on. Chapter 13 I followed the officers all the way to the other side of the bunker. They didn't ask about Chloe, thankfully, so I guess she wasn't on their radar. Hopefully it would stay that way. We kept to the lower level where there weren't too many people. It wasn't long before we were ascending a set of stairs directly into the officer's wing. We arrived to a scene of madness. The higher-ranked officers were barking orders to the lower-ranked ones, and from around the corner I could hear the hum of the civilian crowd. Apparently, things were still not under control. I was glad Chloe had gotten out in time, because it wasn't looking good. Officer Burton, one of my captors asked. The man who was all personable yesterday had become brisk and stern. Good. Lead him to cell C. Same as the doctor? Burton nodded. Yeah, they're not criminals. We're just trying to get things under control. Well, that was good news. For all of Chan's huffing and puffing, he didn't have a mind to treat my dad as a criminal. Sir, another officer said, running up. They're pushing back against us. Head to the armory, Burton said. Get the riot shields. The batons? Burton paused, just a breath. Yeah, but for God's sake, don't use them. This is crazy, I said. You need to tell these people what's going on. They're not going to stop until my dad is allowed to speak his mind. Officer Burton ignored me, nodding down the corridor. Take him now, officers. I found myself roughly pulled in the direction of the stairs leading down to the cells. It was hard to believe how many officers there were. Officers comprised about 10% of Bunker 108's population, but when almost all of them were gathered in the same place, it seemed like a lot more. I was guided downstairs to a shallow atrium that contained a goateed officer sitting behind a desk. He sat up when I entered. Found him, eh? Put him in the same cell as his dad, said the officer holding me. The jailer stood. Right, this way. I followed him down the hall, which held cells on either side. Each of the heavy white doors contained a small window, and each space within was about half the size of our living room and our apartment, which meant not that big. Fluorescent lights brightly illuminated each of the cells. The jailer unlocked and opened up the door of cell C. I saw my dad sitting on the white bench jutting from the wall. He stood up, his eyes widening upon seeing me. Alex? 
The jailer nodded me toward the cell. As I walked in, my dad's eyes filled with frustration. What the hell? He's just a kid. CSO's orders, the jailer said. He instantly slammed the door shut, the lock clicking loudly. I tried to give my dad a look to assure him that all was well, but it didn't get through. He stared at me, as if sorry he had dragged me into this. He sat back down and I joined him on the bench. It was a long time before either of us spoke. Why did you do it, Dad? Why make yourself a target like that? Why, indeed. Why do anything at all if you're only going to be squashed underfoot? He let the question hang in the air, and I wasn't sure how to answer it. He didn't speak loudly, but his voice carried in the silence. After a moment, though, he sat up straight. I did it, Alex, because it was the right thing to do. We're told we live in a democracy, so we need to act like one. They're all afraid of Chan, and rightly so, since he's going to use this 114 event to completely control our bunker. And the only way he will succeed is if we do nothing. We? You, me, and everyone else. It's important to stand up for what is right, and it's important to be honest. Without honesty, there can be no dignity. Without honesty, there can be no righteousness. Without honesty, there can be nothing good. I nodded. It was a crazy thought, but I knew my dad would make a much better leader of Bunker 108 than Chan. That was the reason people kept electing him to council, even though he didn't want or seek that responsibility. My dad wasn't just intelligent. He was wise, too. What are we going to do now? I didn't want to tell him about Chloe knowing everything that I did. Not here. For all I knew, the cell was bugged. If it were in my power, I would rip this cell door down and show everyone what's being contained in the medical bay. My dad paused and then turned to look at me. Alex, this strain of the xenovirus is like nothing I've ever seen, and it could very well destroy us all. His words fell like a prophecy and made my blood run cold. What do you mean? I was incorrect in my original analysis when I said the virus was infecting only microbes. Either I was originally incorrect, or the xenovirus has since evolved to infect the patient directly. You mean, it's a strain that specifically targets humans? Yes, my dad said. If this human strain were ever to escape the quarantine of the lab, well, let's just say that the people need to know the danger it poses. What can we do about it? We must ensure the patient never leaves quarantine if he ever wakes. Chan, no doubt, will want to dispose of him entirely. Dispose? I asked. You mean, kill him? But we can't just do that, my dad said. I was going to make my case before the council today, but as you saw, that didn't get very far. Yeah, no joke. Instead, I'm locked in this cell, and I fear Chan is about to make a grave error. This man, he won't last long. He should be dead already in the meeting, and now this has taken me from the attention he deserves. He paused at the sound of footsteps coming down the corridor. A moment later, the door was unlocked and opened, revealing none other than the CSO himself, flanked by two officers and the jailer. Dr. Keener, Chan said. Please come with me. Am I still under arrest? Chan looked at him for a moment. No, but we do have things to discuss regarding your patient. Whatever details you discovered last night must be shared with me before anyone else hears. Any further attempt to disregard me will result in harsher disciplinary action. Chan eyed my dad. Do I make myself clear? Perfectly, my dad said, his tone dry. And what about my son? Chan looked at me. He's free to go, but is subject to the same restriction. Nothing you have said to him can be relayed to anyone else. We must control this information, lest further panic result. My son doesn't know anything about what I was going to reveal today. That's the truth. Dr. Keener... Do not insult my intelligence. He then looked at me. 
Not a word, Alex. I nodded my agreement. The jailer pulled the door wider, and my dad and I followed Chan and the officers upstairs. We found the officer's wing strangely empty, where fifteen minutes before it had been a madhouse. Alex, find your way to class, Chan said. Keep your nose out of trouble, my dad said. That's my job, apparently. I'll find you after, I said. Your father will be occupied for quite a while, Chan said. Now please, get to class. When will I see him again? When I'm through, Chan said, raising his voice. Now go. Don't talk to him like that, my dad said. He's done nothing wrong, and he has a right to know. He turned to me. I'll find you as soon as I can, son. As I walked away, the corridors were quiet. Order had been restored and everyone had dispersed. Chan and the officers might have won this time, but this would be something the people wouldn't soon forget. I was in no hurry to get to class. I was wondering how Mrs. Watson would react to my late arrival when I saw Michael round the corner. Alex, you should be in class, buddy. Hard to be in class when you're in the holding cells. They locked you up? Michael asked, surprised. Why? I wouldn't go asking that if I were you. Michael paused uncomfortably, something that was uncharacteristic of him. You should get to your morning class. That meeting threw everything out of whack. No joke, I thought. All right, thanks for the heads up. I'll escort you there, Michael said. Other officers might not be so lenient. Thanks. We found a set of steps going to the top level. On the way, we passed several officers making their rounds, so I was glad Michael was with me. You're all right, for an officer. He looked at me with mock severity. What do you mean by that? Just that. Most of us aren't that bad, you know. Just following orders, he shrugged. Life's a lot simpler that way. We paused before the door of my classroom. Take care, Alex. Thanks. You too. If my dad was right, then we would all need to take care. Chapter 14 Mrs. Watson halted in mid-sentence to peer at me from behind her glasses. Alex, you're late, she said this with a frown and a starched, take-no-nonsense tone of voice. Have a seat. I caught Chloe's eye as I walked past the second row where she sat. By the time I reached my seat in the back corner, the entire class broke into whispers. Quiet, Mrs. Watson warned. Now, pay attention to this next step of the proof. I tried to listen, but I couldn't even feign interest. Concentrating on geometry was pretty much impossible, and it seemed so pointless in light of everything going on. Looking at the classroom clock, it was hard to believe it was only 11.30. Between the meeting and getting here, it had been a busy morning. During the lunch hour, I would go check on my dad, no matter what Chan had said. Time dragged at the speed of a tranquilized sloth. Meanwhile, from the second row, Chloe was diligently taking notes, but her heart didn't seem into it. From time to time, Mrs. Watson would lose her train of thought, something atypical of her. I realized that it wasn't just me going through the motions. Everyone was worried about what had happened in the council chamber. With a minute left, Mrs. Watson turned around to check the clock on the wall. You'll be coming back here after lunch, rather than going to your afternoon class. You are dismissed. I hurried out the door and found Chloe in the hallway. What happened? she whispered. They took me to the same cell as my dad, I said. He was... A couple of officers walked by, forcing me to stop my update. Both gave stony stares as they passed. Chloe watched them, her eyes wide. You're like an outlaw now. I tried to ignore the hint of awe in her voice. I have to find my dad. I don't know where they took him after they let me go. Maybe Chan took him to his office. I doubt it. My dad kept talking about the patient. Maybe they went there. The research lab? Yeah, I said. There might be guards, though. Only one way to find out. 
You're coming with me? She nodded. I'm sucked into this now. You might need my expert assistance. You're not sucked in, yet, I said. No one suspects you of anything. If we both get caught in the lab... Alex, I'm coming. End of story. There was no way I was getting rid of her. Not that I wanted to, anyway. All right, I said. We'll have to be careful, though. As we walked away from the classroom, I kept an eye out for officers, opting for the less used corridors as we weaved our way toward the medical bay. A few people stood in the main corridor, a short jaunt from medical, including a pair of officers. We waited for them to leave before entering the empty reception area. Ignoring the door that led to the offices, I pushed open the door leading into the bay itself. The only access to the lab was through a secured door leading out from the bay. It required a card, but I had one my dad had given me a long time ago, after I had promised never to go inside on my own. I flashed my card over the reader. The heavy metal door unlocked and slid open automatically. Last chance to back out, I said. I've come this far, Chloe said. All right. Before the doors could close, we passed through and headed down the short corridor separating the bay from the lab. We passed several doors, each with a window at head level allowing us a view inside. The first room we passed was filled with chemicals, microscopes, test tubes, and all the trappings of a chemistry lab. Another room we passed, the one my dad spent much of his time in, contained cases filled with pinkish, glowing xenofungus. We passed another room, known as the cold room, a large refrigerated space where xenoviral samples were stored. It too was vacant. When Chloe and I stood before the last door, which led to an operating room, I knew that was where everyone had to be. When we looked through the narrow pane, my dad, CSO Chan, and my dad's two assistants, Ibarra and Jones, were all standing around a narrow gurney. The patient, sprawled on his back, was so still that he seemed to be dead. All of them wore rebreathers and gloves, but not the full hazmat suit my dad always used when dealing with xenoviral samples directly. The suit was not really for his own protection, but rather to shield the samples from himself. The fact that they wore rebreathers now demonstrated that my dad was being more cautious than normal. Even so, I wished he was wearing the hazmat suit. They were so focused on the patient that none of them noticed us outside the door. Chloe and I ducked out of the way before that could change. I placed my ear against the cold metal of the door and listened. Will he expire soon? It was Chan. I heard whispers from the assistants, followed by my dad's voice. Yes, he's dead now, in fact. But the virus is still very much alive. It's already changed him, which I began to document in the files last night. How does it work? Chan asked, his voice both awed and horrified. I still need to run a genetic sample, but as you can see, all of his hair is gone. The muscles have thickened, and an MRI has shown a great reduction in gray brain matter. There are many changes going on simultaneously, so many that it's been impossible to track them all or determine their implications. Of particular note is a strange knot forming in the brain, where the amygdala and hippocampus are. Many new connections are being made there that far exceed that of a normal person. What does that mean? I have no idea. Those areas of the brain are related to memory and emotion, to put it simply. The new brain connections may hold no meaning, since one way or another the patient is dead. His body temperature is the same as this room. No one could survive that. Well, Chan said, perform the necessary tests. Learn all you can, and when you're finished, have him incinerated. Incinerated? my dad asked. It may take days, if not weeks, for me to make a significant breakthrough. And for that matter, I'd like to know why this man was cleared for entry when you very well knew the danger he posed. So, Chan had known the man was coming. Chloe's eyes went wide, and I supposed mine were too. How could I have guessed he was infected? Chan snapped. He was the only one left, and it was all he could do to escape. 
I had hoped to gain vital information, but when he didn't arrive at the appointed time last week, we assumed he was dead. How could I have known our very own recon would find him? Last week? If that were the case, then Bunker 114 had fallen earlier than Chan had let on. Over a week ago, from the sounds of it. Not just a recon, my dad said. A recon with my son. This is hardly the place for this discussion, Chan said. I agree it isn't, my dad said. That would be the council chamber. The next voice I heard, however, wasn't Chan's. It was one of the assistants. Ibarra, I thought. Is he moving? In the long pause that followed, I held my breath to better hear their words. But either they were speaking so quietly that I couldn't hear, or they weren't speaking at all. Curiosity won over caution as I lifted my eyes to the window. All eyes were transfixed on the former patient. His inert body was unmistakably dead. I must have misunderstood. But then, how could I have? My dad and the other men appeared tense, much more wary and watchful than before. Their increased level of alertness could only mean that I had heard correctly. Ibarra, you must be mistaken, my dad finally said. He hasn't moved a muscle. I swear, I saw him move, Ibarra said. Impossible, Chan said. No man could be alive with his body temperature. There's nothing more we can do, my dad said. It's probably best if we... The body gave a sudden jerk, causing all the men to jump back. See, Ibarra said. He's still alive. I told you. Though the man was unquestionably alive, no one rushed to help him. My dad stared with eyes wide, witnessing a movement that he had thought impossible. Explanations, Dr. Keener? Chan asked, fighting to keep his voice steady. I... Uh... The man's legs convulsed and swung down from the table, planting themselves on the floor. His eyes opened, revealing two completely white and glowing orbs. A horrible howl rose from deep inside his chest, sending a sharp chill down my spine. His arms reached out, grappling for Ibarra. Get him off me! Chan pulled out a handgun, pointing it at the patient. Freeze! The man made no heed to Chan's command. Ibarra let out a cracked scream, fending the man off with both hands. My dad and Jones grabbed the crazed patient to pull him off, to no avail. Chan fired. The bullet entered the man's head, causing gray brain matter to splatter the far wall. Mixed in with the gray was an almost garish purple substance. It didn't take me long to remember where I'd seen that color. It was the same shade as xenofungus. The man collapsed, and the ensuing stench was so foul that I could smell it through the door. Chloe and I started to gag, and the sound gave us away. Chan turned with a scowl, his eyes burning into me like fire. When he recognized me, his left cheek twitched in mute rage. He looked at the gun in his shaky hand, and after giving my dad a quick glare, holstered it. My dad was now looking at me, wondering why of all places I was here. I was guilty, doubly so because I had gotten Chloe mixed up in it too. She was still staring through the window with widening eyes. Oh my God. I followed the direction of her gaze. The body on the floor was swelling in all of its limbs. Something appeared to be boiling beneath that skin. Something that went beyond anything I ever thought possible. From the way my dad was observing, I knew this phenomenon was beyond him, too. Get out, he said. Everyone ignored him, continuing to stare in mute horror at a body that was now fat and trembling uncontrollably. Get out! His second warning finally penetrated. Just as everyone moved for the door, the dead man's skin was reaching the extent of its elasticity, with several parts bulging grotesquely outward. Chloe and I backed away from the door as the body erupted with a sickening plop, causing purple, gray, and red to splatter on the window. 
Chloe screamed, and the ensuing reek was so awful it caused me to vomit in my mouth. As I turned aside to spit it out, Chloe grabbed me by the shoulders, pulling me further from the door. Alex! I barely registered her voice. All I could think of was my dad. He was in there. He was in there, and probably infected with the human strain of the xenovirus. Chapter 15 In a single instant, everything had changed. I couldn't comprehend how what we had just witnessed could be physically possible. A dead man had come back to life, only to die again, followed by that horrible explosion that defied any credible explanation. My dad had been right when he said that the virus would likely spread in liquid form, but no one could have imagined it spreading quite like this. It was almost as if that explosion had been designed to spread the virus. Chloe pulled me down the hallway. We can't stay here, Alex. I knew she was right, but the idea of walking away wasn't easy. If we were to enter that operating room, we'd be infected too. All I could hear as we walked back to the medical bay were my dad and Chan arguing. As we exited the lab, a cold numbness overcame me. We made our way toward the very center of the medical bay, and there we waited, Chloe's hand on my arm. We stood there, not saying anything. I wasn't sure what to do or think. The situation made me feel powerless. Just the thought that my dad could die filled me with despair, a feeling which only grew heavier as time dragged on. Waiting was never easy, but the uncertainty hanging over the situation made time seem to stop altogether. As I stepped in the direction of the lab, Chloe held tight to my arm. No, she said. We haven't given them time to come out. Chloe, we can't just stand here when... My words died as the door to the research lab opened. Out came my dad... Chan, Ibarra, and Jones, as clean as ever, but wearing blue scrubs. I felt my hopes lift. Maybe somehow, miraculously, they had escaped the blast. But then I noticed the dampness of my dad's hair, along with those of his assistants. Clearly, they had just taken showers. The research lab was equipped with a high-pressure shower laced with chemicals designed to eradicate and neutralize all sorts of deadly pathogens and agents. All a contaminated person had to do was immediately pull the chain, and a torrent of water would rinse most everything clean. This would have been followed by a conventional shower to wash away everything else. Going through both rounds of showers helped explain why it had taken them so long to get here. More importantly, it also meant that they might not be in danger, although it didn't seem like my dad was holding out much hope, judging by the lost expression in his eyes and the pallor of his face. At last, Chan raised his radio. To my surprise, it was clean. This must have been a different radio, because his first had surely been covered with slime. Burton, do you have a copy? It was a moment before Burton responded. Go ahead, Officer Chan. Drop everything and report to the medical bay immediately. This is an emergency. And please, notify Bunker Security that the bay is off-limits to the public. Set a guard. It was a long moment before Burton responded. Copy that. I'll be there in a couple of minutes. I'm giving the order now. Everyone waited in silence for the short time it took Officer Burton to arrive. When he entered the bay, he stopped short, his normally stony demeanor replaced by puzzlement. What's going on? Officer Burton asked, his gaze running up and down the four men's scrubs. Stay where you are and don't come any closer, Chan said. There's a good chance Dr. Keener, Ibarra, Jones, and I are all infected with a particular strain of the xenovirus, a strain that targets humans. Burton's eyes widened. Xenovirus? You mean the virus that makes that pink stuff? That's one form of it, yes, my dad said. But this is different, and far more dangerous. We'll give you the details in a moment, Chan said. For now, we need to plan for every contingency. The fact that the man was infected with a new, deadly strain of the virus only came to my attention today. Dr. Keener understated the danger last night. 
That was before I noticed the effects, my dad said. When I returned here after you wasted my time, he was even worse. There was no way he could have known the danger, Jones said, coming to my dad's defense. None of us did. Maybe we can run a blood test to see if we're really infected, just like Dr. Keener did for the patient. It's worth a shot, isn't it? I asked. You cleaned up quickly after it happened, so maybe that helped. What about the children, Dr. Keener? Chan asked. Is there any danger to them? My dad shook his head. It's spread by that slime. It's always been that way. They're in no danger. Chan nodded. Burton, post a constant guard by the medical bay and don't let anyone enter. And for the love of God, keep this under wraps. This is on a need-to-know basis. What do I say when they ask? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Burton sighed. Yes, sir. Chan finally glanced at Chloe and me. Get the children out of here and make sure they get back to their families. This is my family, I yelled, pointing at my dad. He's all I have. It'll be all right, son, my dad said. Do as see as so Chan says. You can stay with us, Chloe said. I'm sure they'll figure this all out soon. Good idea, Chan said, glad to have me out of the way. I ignored him. Dad, this can't be. What if... I couldn't make myself go on. I'm sorry, son. I... I did all I could. But there was nothing I could do to anticipate this outcome. You need to go. He directed his gaze at Chloe and Burton as well. All of you do. I walked forward with the intention of hugging him. Stop, Chan yelled. You're close enough. Chan, my dad said. This is my son, and you will not speak to him that way. I won't risk any contagion of this disease. For a rare moment, Chan's eyes softened. He should regard it as a mercy that I even allowed this conversation at all. I looked at my dad, tears beginning to sting my eyes. Dad. Step away, Chan said, more firmly this time. I turned to him, my fists clenched. Alex, my dad said. Don't waste your words. This isn't the end. Not for you. I know you believe it is, but it isn't. I stared at him through my tears. You must be strong, son. You are a man. Never forget that. What does a man do? I recalled the words he told me seemingly hundreds of times. A man doesn't do what he wants. He does what he must. Yes, never forget that. I don't want to stay here, Alex. None of us do. But we must. What will I do without you? What if... You don't make it. The future is yours, Alex. It is yours to shape. And though I don't know the particulars, I know the future will shape you in return. I know that you'll have duties to fulfill. You'll help people in some way that only you can. You are strong, intelligent, kind, and brave. He choked on his words, his tears falling freely now. Just, just like your mother was. People will gladly draw from your strength. He made no pretense of hiding his tears, and seeing this much emotion from him let me know he thought this could very well be our final conversation. I love you, Alex. Never forget that, no matter what happens here. You are my son, and I love you. I swallowed before answering, wiping a tear from my eye. I love you too, Dad. Chan wasted no more time. When you have escorted them out, Officer Burton, return here. I will brief you on what is to be done next. Taking hold of an arm from each of us in one of his brawny hands, he pulled us across the bay. I was trying to hold it together, but knew my control couldn't last long. I glanced over my shoulder one last time at my dad. Even though everyone else was focused on what Chan was saying, he was watching me. He looked like a man lost, and knowing there was nothing I could do about it filled me with unspeakable dread. Chapter 16 
Burton cast me a worried, almost pitying glance as he headed back into the medical bay and left Chloe and me in the corridor. Immediately, two burly officers in helmets stationed themselves by the door. I couldn't have got in if I tried. I walked down the corridor, feeling dazed. I stopped to lean against the wall and found myself sinking to the floor. There was nothing I could do to save my dad. If he died, I didn't know what I would do. And from the way things looked, there was a strong chance of that happening. Chloe's face filled my vision. She placed a hand on my arm. He might be all right, Alex. He seemed healthy when we were in there. I didn't say anything. I couldn't think of anything worth saying. When I didn't move, Chloe sunk down next to me. We watched as people walked by, listened as they asked the officers questions about what was going on, but every time, the officers simply said the medical bay was off limits. Chloe held me close, attempting to shield me from the crowd that had gathered around the bay doors. Some were staring at us, and when I looked up, a few in the back were pointing at me. It was only a matter of time until they started asking me questions. It was time to leave, and seeming to sense this, Chloe pulled away to look me in the eyes. Come on, she said. Let's get you home. Gently, yet firmly, she helped me stand and led me down the corridor. An emptiness pulsated my entire being as we walked, and I felt as though the only thing connecting me to reality was Chloe. It didn't take long to reach Chloe's family's apartment. It was good to be anywhere but home, where I would have been constantly reminded of my dad. The Klein's apartment was a little larger than my dad's and mine. Their family had three people in it, so there were three rooms, the living room and kitchen, a master bedroom, and a room for Chloe. Chloe had originally shared it with her little sister, Abby, but she had died two years ago. No one was home since both of Chloe's parents were at work this time of the day. They wouldn't be back until later this afternoon. Chloe led me to her bedroom, gently pushing me on her bed. You need to get some rest, she said. Can I get you anything? Food? Water? I shook my head. Food was the last thing on my mind. I'm all right. Can you explain to Mrs. Watson why I'm not returning to class? I'm not going back to class, Chloe said. I need to find my parents and tell them what's going on. I'll let them know that you need to stay here for as long as you need. That way you won't have to be by yourself. She touched my face, offering me a smile. I'll be back in a little while. As Chloe shut off the light and softly closed the door, I lay down on the bed. I had never felt more alone in my entire life. I felt stuck in a nightmare, and it felt as though this were happening to someone other than me. I couldn't help but think about how that man had impossibly sprung back to life after seeming so dead. If infected, would my dad go through the same transformation? Was there some way he could cure himself before that happened? I couldn't shake the thought of those white eyes or how that man had attacked Ibarra. And of course, there was no way I could forget the explosion. I tried not to think, tried not to worry, tried to force down the mounting dread. Alone with my thoughts and unable to sleep, I lost touch with the passage of time and my thoughts became a surreal, confusing blur. When I heard muffled voices in the living room, I couldn't tell whether it had been minutes or hours. Chloe cracked open the bedroom door. Alex? I sat up and shielded my eyes with my hands from the arc of bright light entering from the living room. Did you learn anything? She shook her head. No. I asked the officers, but they refused to say anything. We'll hear something soon, I'm sure. She came in and sat at the foot of the bed. Do you want to eat something? Get out of here for a bit? I didn't respond at first. I hated putting her off, but I didn't really want to be around anyone right now. Not even her. I think I just need to stay here for a bit. I can bring you something back. They're about to serve dinner. Or I can cook you something here. I shook my head. Thanks, but I'm fine. All right, she said. Just let us know if you need anything. She touched my shoulder. We're here for you, Alex. 
I'm here for you. I hate seeing you hurt like this. She looked at the picture of her sister, which stood on her nightstand. It's not easy, losing someone. In the photo, Abby was hugging Chloe, beaming a wide smile that was missing several teeth. I couldn't find it in me to say anything. I hated the fact that I couldn't think of anyone but myself. It's not over yet, Chloe said softly. You can't give up, Alex. I'm not giving up. My voice sounded stronger than I thought it would, which was comforting. Good, Chloe said. I'll bring you back something from the calf anyway. I know you don't want anything, but I'm going to take care of you until all this gets resolved. I made myself nod. All right. Thanks. Be back soon. I felt her lips on my cheek and continued to feel them long after she had left. Chapter 17 I woke up to see Chloe standing in the doorframe. It was 23.02, according to the bedside clock. Somehow I'd slept almost six hours. Resting on the nightstand was a plate holding a sandwich and chips. I didn't know how long it had been there. Hey, she said. You doing all right? I sat up. No, not really. Probably a stupid question. Still no news on your dad. Should it really be taking them this long to do a test? I don't know. Maybe if they're doing four of them, then yes. Otherwise. She shut the door before walking up to the bed. She placed a hand on my head as if checking for a fever. It was more of a comforting gesture than anything else, and strangely, it did make me feel better. Maybe they're waiting until morning. For now, though, they're locked in, and everyone else is locked out. She looked at me directly, and it was hard to read her eyes in the dark. Everyone asked about you at dinner today. She looked toward the untouched plate. I didn't want to wake you. I'll eat tomorrow. It's just, I don't feel anything right now. I looked up at her. I guess your parents know? She nodded. I told them, and they said you can stay here as long as you need. They had to go back to hydroponics. The night director called in sick, so they both decided to go. Hearing the word sick reminded me of my dad. I hope he's okay. We'll know by tomorrow, Chloe said. You'll see. I lay back in the bed and stared at the ceiling. I feel like I already know. Don't say that, Chloe said. As long as there's life, there's hope, right? I couldn't disagree with that, at least in theory. You're right. It's just hard to hang on to hope right now. Not when it seemed like he lost his. Chloe didn't have a response for that. Sorry I stole your bed, I said, to change the subject. It's all right, she said. I can sleep on the couch. That can't be comfortable. I'm not going to make you move. Then lie down. I'll share. She stood there looking at me. It was hard to tell what she was thinking. We really shouldn't, she said. My parents might be back soon. Then let me sleep on the couch, I said. You should have your own bed. I don't feel good about taking it. We looked at one another, but neither of us moved. Oh, what the hell, she said. Just for a little while. I felt my heart race as she lifted the blanket to get into bed. She lay down as I scooted toward the wall to make more room. This was something I'd only dreamed about, but now it was happening. I took her hands in mine and looked into her eyes. This isn't too bad, is it? I asked. She smiled. No, I guess not. You know, you don't have to give me all this space. I'm not going to bite you. I just want you to be comfortable. Or what? I might fly away? No, I said, moving closer, wrapping my arms around her. I couldn't let you do that. Her soft warmth pressed into me. I reached out to touch her face with my hand, and a tear ran down her cheek. Are you sad? Yeah, she said, shaking her head. I'm sorry, Alex. 
Don't be sad. I can't help it. This must be so terrible for you. I drew her closer, and she settled into me, relaxing into my body as if she belonged there. She gave a contented sigh as the side of her head pressed into my chest. Thanks, I said. A moment passed before she answered. For what? For being here. I don't think I could have made it through today without you. Alex, that's what I'm here for. We're friends, she frowned. You remember how I felt when I lost my sister? I nodded, waiting for her to continue. We fought so much, and I lost her. I still feel guilty about it. I wish I didn't, but I think that's part of being human. We wish we could control things when we can't. We always don't appreciate what we have until it's lost. I held her face in my hands. Not always. There was a tightness in my throat as I looked into her eyes, and a desperate need to touch her lips with mine. As I leaned forward, she closed her eyes and her lips softly brushed. Then we tasted one another fully and without restraint. After a moment, she pulled away. Alex, we can't go any further than this. Of course, I said, surprised at the need in my voice. I'm just afraid of getting carried away, losing control. It would be too easy. She looked into my eyes, touching my face. Let's just be close, okay? Okay. She leaned in to kiss me again, and I realized as she pulled back to look into my eyes that I had been wrong earlier. Everything that mattered wasn't over. Chloe mattered. She smiled, and just like that, I realized a fundamental truth. I picked up her hands and cradled them within my own. I love you, Chloe. She smiled wider as she touched my face. I love you, too. I held her close, even as she fell asleep. Chapter 18 The wailing of klaxons shocked me to awareness. Chloe's hand reached for mine in the darkness. What's going on? Chloe asked. Her wide eyes became visible when the room's red emergency lighting flickered on, bathing the room with dim red light. In the event of an alarm, we were to stay in our apartments, find the intercom and await instructions. There should be an announcement on the PA any second. We climbed out of bed and headed for the living room. Chloe's parents weren't home, a fact I was grateful for, but at that moment it would have been good to have their guidance. The siren whirred over and over, fading in and out, while we waited for an announcement. But as minutes passed, it became increasingly clear that nothing was forthcoming. Chloe and I were on our own. The combination of the alarm, along with what had happened in the lab earlier, sent my mind racing in search of likely explanations. The possibility of a connection made my skin crawl. Assuming the virus worked at the same rate as it had on the man from 114, it would take a few days, at least, for anyone to succumb to it. But that begged the question, did the virus work the same way on everyone? My dad's dead, isn't he? We don't know that. This could be something else. There was a lot of anger at this morning's meeting. Maybe something happened. Until we hear something from command, we shouldn't jump to conclusions. They should have made an announcement by now. Good point. So what do we do? I don't know. I guess we just lay low until we figure things out. Alex, we have to find my parents. They're out there somewhere. It's too dangerous, I said. But sit tight and wait for your parents to come back. I had barely spoken these words when the sound of someone screaming came from the corridor outside. It grew louder, followed by several gunshots. Chloe and I backed away from the door. Right outside came a snarl that sounded anything but human. We heard a hard thump that made me think a body had just hit the outside of the door. I wondered whether the apartment was secure, but I didn't dare move toward the lock for fear of making noise. Coldness crept across my skin. There was no time to lose. We each had to find something to defend ourselves. There was a lamp, but it was connected to the wall. 
A large book sat on the table nearby, but it didn't have the bludgeoning capabilities that we required. My eye fell on a skillet sitting on the stovetop in the kitchen just a few steps away. But before I could reach it, something forced open the door. Damn, it hadn't been locked. I turned to see an officer standing in the doorway, his eyes glowing completely white. It looked as if he had recently lost all the hair on his head, since his skin there was pink and translucent. Purple slime oozed from two lacerations on his face, though he gave no sign of being in pain. He advanced toward Chloe, and as she screamed, he let out a horrible howl. As I ran for the skillet, she fought off the infected officer, attempting to push him back into the corridor. As I saw the attacker overpower her, I charged the officer with the skillet now in hand and clobbered his head with all the strength I possessed. As he fell to the ground, I smashed in his head again and again until I heard something crunch. He took a couple of ragged breaths before his eyelids fluttered and stilled. Chloe and I had only a moment to collect ourselves before his body began to quiver and bloat. Run, I yelled. We raced into the corridor, slamming the door shut just before I heard a sickening pop splatter from the other side. As we paused to collect our breaths, I saw a handgun that the officer had dropped. I grabbed it and checked the magazine for bullets. There were four left. We have to get out of here, I said. My parents are still in hydroponics. We'll head there, I handed her the skillet. Here, swing first, ask questions later. Chloe took the skillet with shaky hands. A trail of purple gunk dripped off, striking the floor. Alex. Come on, I said. There's no time to waste. I led her through the empty hall, my handgun ready. The siren still wailed, and the lights lit the corridor in an eerie red glow. We turned the corner, only to find a body sprawled across the floor, the skin along the abdomen had ruptured, and purple slime coated the walls and dripped from the ceiling. Careful, Chloe said as she had pulled me back, the dripping slime missing my face by a hair. The hallway was empty. It felt as if everyone was simply gone. The alarm had sounded only 15 minutes ago. How could everyone have disappeared in that time? Were they hiding in their apartments? Maybe we should have stayed put, too, instead of making ourselves targets. As we stepped into the commons, it, too, appeared deserted. All illuminated by red lighting, the place felt strange and unfamiliar. The red radiance set my hair on end, and the light failed to penetrate the room's far corners. We made our way across the cavernous space, and as we reached the other side, we found something out of a nightmare awaiting us. Oh my God, Chloe said. Several dead bodies lay side by side, utterly mutilated. Pools of crimson blood had collected beneath them. It wasn't easy, but somehow I recognized one of the victims. It was Vincent Corley. Was it just this morning when the three of us sat together at the council meeting? These infected people were monsters, without compassion for human life. The thought made me sick to my stomach. Vincent, Chloe said. Oh, God, what is happening? I swallowed the lump that had formed in my throat as I took her hand and led her away. Come on, there's nothing we can do for him. Gunshots sounded in the distance, followed by nightmarish screams and inhuman wails. It sounded as if they were coming from the calf. We can't go that way, I said. We don't have to, Chloe said. The stairs will lead us right to hydroponics. I'd completely forgotten about that narrow and dark stairwell. Bunker 108 had lots of strange nooks and connecting points, and this was one of them. This set of stairs in particular made me nervous. If anything came up at us from below, retreat wouldn't be easy. We descended slowly, trying not to make a sound. The lower we descended, the red lighting dimmed, making it difficult to see. I tried not to think about what could be lurking ahead. At the bottom of the first flight, I heard someone gasping for breath in the corridor outside. 
They couldn't have been more than fifteen feet from us, but I couldn't see them from where we stood. It was impossible to know whether they were a victim or one of the infected. Whatever the case, we didn't stay to find out. We raced down the final flight of stairs, which opened onto a short corridor with a single closed door. Behind that door lay hydroponics, the largest space in the entire bunker, so large that every other room in Bunker 108 could fill it up twice. All that space was necessary because of the full-sized trees in there. Everything was fed and watered with recycled hydroponic fluid, and most of the bunker's energy went into powering the grow lights. I reached out to open the door, only to find it locked. Chapter 19 here, Alex, I've got a badge, Chloe said. She flashed it in front of the reader, and the door beeped as it unlocked. We entered and found ourselves standing in front of aisles and aisles of plants bearing enough fruits and vegetables to sustain several hundred people year-round. The sweet aroma of plants and moisture filled my nostrils. Like the levels above, red emergency lighting filled the vast chamber. The plant rows formed an indoor vertical farm, the rows stacked one atop of the other. Lanes of fluid fed the plant roots, and between the lanes were four stories of catwalks, accessible by spiral staircases spaced every few rows. Mom? Chloe called. Dad? Chloe's voice echoed across the cavernous space. We'll have to look for them, I said. They could be anywhere. I stared around the lab, realizing this spot could be quite defensible. The catwalks of the higher rows could only be accessed by the stairs, and those choke points could be defended. If there was any place to hole up in the bunker, it was here. There was food, water, and the fusion reactor powering the bunker in the adjoining room. For now, though, it seemed as if we were the only ones in here. We walked the aisles, one by one, checking each for anything out of the ordinary, but we found nothing. You were right, Chloe said. We should have stayed home. They probably went back to find us. We haven't checked everywhere yet, I said. Let's keep looking. Behind us, a door slammed open, causing me to spin around and raise my gun. What I saw brought instant relief, and I lowered my weapon. Instead of an infected, crazed attacker, it was Chloe's parents. I knew Mr. Klein from his height. He was easily six foot two. Despite being both tall and in shape, he had a bookish look to him, aided by his black-rimmed glasses. Mrs. Klein stood beside him, much shorter than her husband. She was a short, pretty woman with kind, gentle eyes. Tonight, though, those eyes seemed to hold fear. Chloe ran forward and hugged both of her parents, Thank God you're here, Mrs. Klein said. Thank God. What's going on? Chloe asked. The alarm woke us up, and we were attacked by an officer. All we know is that it's coming from the labs, Mr. Klein said. Something's gone crazy, and defenseless citizens are being attacked. He shook his head. Like you said, it appears to be officers, except that something has happened to them. They no longer seem human. I don't know how many there are, but right now they're attacking the calf. That's where a lot of people are gathered, but we left after we found you weren't there. Our row of apartments was the last one to be reached, and no one sounded the alarm until it was too late. My dad, I said. I guess he's really dead, isn't he? Alex, I'm sorry. I nodded numbly as my throat tightened. A hollow ache formed in the middle of my chest, a hopeless void crushing me in. Chloe hugged me, but at the same time, I didn't feel anything, as if my emotions had shut down. Even though the news was expected, I couldn't believe it, especially without seeing it firsthand. Mr. Klein ran a hand through his hair. I didn't see him myself, but others did. God, he was a good man, Alex. We'll miss him and his leadership. This is all some sick nightmare, but somehow we need to get through this. We need to make a plan, Mrs. Klein said, or we won't. The bunker is no longer safe, Mr. Klein said. 
I suggest we gather food and supplies and try to leave it all together. Leave Bunker 108? I asked. My close call in the wasteland was still too fresh. For all we knew, this sickness was also running rampant on the surface. If we stay, we'll get infected, Mr. Klein said. I don't know if the sickness will pass or get worse. We might survive here for a while, but if the infected took over, we'd be stuck. We must get out while we had the chance. As Mrs. Klein nodded her agreement, Chloe looked at me. I agree with them, Alex. The four of us can find our way outside, can't we? There has to be some other bunker out there, someone to take us in. There were other dangers on the surface as well. There was the cold. The temperature would be freezing every night, and it would only grow colder as winter set in. There are some real concerns with going out there, I said. It's cold, and right now, to make a bad situation only worse, it's dark. Finding shelter will be difficult at best. Food, too, will be a problem. The wastelanders are thirty years ahead of us. They've already grabbed anything useful, while here we are literally surrounded by food. These crops will grow for a long time, so long as we have power. I looked at Chloe's parents. You two know this place like the back of your hand. You could keep it running, even if things broke down. I'm not staying here, Mrs. Klein said. Not with those crazed things terrorizing us. We go, and that's final. She's right, her husband said. We need far more than four people to run this facility. We're short-staffed as it is. But we'd only need food for four people, I said. Not four hundred. I've been out there, and I know the wasteland will be bad, if not worse. If the xenovirus is doing this here, then what would it be like out there? I could almost see the weight of my words sink in, and it was clear that Chloe had told her parents about what my dad had recently discovered. Mr. Klein paused, but only for a moment. Here, we know we're dead. Out there, Alex, we only think we are. The choice is clear. And we're wasting time every minute we talk about it, Mrs. Klein said. They had convinced me. Even if we could safely secure hydroponics and fusion and run it with four people, was that any way to live? If we had the choice, why not make a go for it on the surface? You're right, I said. But let's keep this as a fallback plan. Good idea, Mr. Klein said. Now let's get started. We should gather supplies, Mrs. Klein said. Food, water, warm clothing, if possible. We can only use what we can find in here, Mr. Klein said. The risk of going elsewhere is just too great. It could be invaded any time, so we have to hurry. We need something to carry provisions in, Chloe said. There's those empty burlap sacks that we use for harvesting, Mrs. Klein said. She led us to her office nearby where some were stored. Concentrate on the most calorie-dense foods, items like nuts, beans, rice, and some fruits and vegetables to balance everything out. We each grabbed a sack and headed back into the lab, trying to keep pace with Chloe's mother. There should be food already boxed up down by distribution, she said. That will speed things up. Just as Mrs. Klein said, rows of boxes were lined up on a long table, filled to the brim with food, mostly fruit. I grabbed several bunches of bananas, some apples, and made sure to take lots of scoops of rice, beans, and walnuts until the sack was as heavy as I could carry. Everyone got their sacks filled, Mrs. Klein said, looking up to see us raise our bags in response. We did well. That should last us a while. We followed Mr. Klein to the far corner of hydroponics, toward a secure metallic door I'd never been through. Mr. Klein flashed his badge on the sensor, causing it to beep and unlock. Only your mother and I have access to this area, along with those who work in recycling, Mr. Klein said, leading us through the door. It's a little known secret that this leads right to the atrium. We passed row upon row of blue barrels, all filled with the nutrient-rich hydroponic fluid needed for plant growth. The room itself was massive, filled with large, complex tanks, pipes, and tubing. 
Even now, those tanks emitted a low hum, working for a bunker that might not last the rest of the night. Thick hoses led out from the barrels, going through the wall and into the lab. This room, arguably, was the most important in the entire bunker. Without it, the hydroponic fluid couldn't be recycled, which explained its high security status. We walked across the room, entering a narrow corridor that appeared to be little used. It had metal grating for a floor, and below, a series of pipes ran along its length. At the end of the corridor, a circular stairway led up. Mr. Klein went first, followed by Chloe and her mom. I was last to go up, the exit just a minute away. Screams and monstrous snarls poured into the dark stairwell, coming from somewhere deep within the bunker. There was no time to waste. Come on, Mr. Klein said, propping up the open door at the top of the stairwell. And keep that gun ready. I switched my sack of food to my left hand, heaving it over my shoulder in order to get a good grip on the gun in my right hand. I noticed Chloe had adopted a similar defensive posture with the skillet taken from her apartment. The circular vault door leading to the exit tunnel was already halfway open. Someone had been through, having had the same idea. My senses sharpened as adrenaline ran through my veins. I couldn't help but have a bad feeling for what lay ahead. The rocky exit tunnel was dimly lit, the temperature near freezing. Everything that made the bunker safe and familiar would be gone once we stepped through the exterior door. Before we could do that, though, we had to make it out of the exit tunnel. And from what I saw ahead, that wasn't going to happen without a fight. Chapter 20 Two bodies separated us from the final vault door, one on the ground, bloody and dead, and another kneeling beside it, swaying in the darkness. The man's face snapped around toward us, his blue scrubs now stained by blood. It was Chan, his white eyes glowing, soulless and empty from a face as pale as a corpse. As he cocked his head to the right side, a dribble of blood dripped from the right corner of his mouth. Chan's muscles tensed before he sprang forward, letting loose an otherworldly howl. Back, Mr. Klein yelled. I dropped my sack to the ground, using both hands to aim my gun. I fired three times. They were hard shots to make under stress and on a moving target, but all three bullets entered Chan's body. Instead of blood, purple goo shot out of wounds in his chest, abdomen, and right arm. But the shots had no effect. Chan continued to stumble on, set on killing. With one bullet left, I had to make it count. Aiming carefully, I watched the CSO's head bob up and down as Mr. Klein fought him off. I pulled the trigger. My final shot missed its mark, and Mrs. Klein screamed, running toward her husband. Chan advanced, the wounds appearing to have made him more vicious and determined. Chloe screamed, and I looked on helplessly at her parents' feeble attempts to fight off Chan, even as my handgun clicked again and again. Chan tackled Chloe's father to the ground, the force of it throwing Chloe's mother a few feet back. I dropped my gun in order to run forward and help, but already Chan had ripped into Mr. Klein's neck, tearing out a gobbet of bloody flesh. His scream, choked with blood, merged with the screams of Chloe and her mother. While Mrs. Klein rushed toward her husband, Chloe ran toward Chan from behind, still on the ground by her father. She drew back her arm and brought down the skillet and smashed Chan's head, bludgeoning him until his animalistic eyes rolled back in his head and he collapsed on the ground. Almost instantly, Chan's body started to inflate. Run! Chloe screamed. Mom, you have to run! As Chloe pulled on her mom's arm, tears running down her face, her mom refused to move, perhaps in shock, perhaps not understanding what was happening. He's going to blow up, Mom! Mrs. Klein cried quietly as she held her husband's hand while his body convulsed in pain. Unable to save both Chloe and her mother, I grabbed Chloe with both arms and pulled her away, 
putting distance between us and Chan's swelling corpse. We were a good thirty feet away when a plop echoed in the narrow tunnel. Slime splattered behind, narrowly missing us, just as we reached the front of the tunnel. I checked Chloe to ensure that the slime had missed her. She had been slightly behind me, so I wanted to be absolutely certain none of the stuff had got on her. She kept crying, looking back toward her mom, but I held her in place. I wasn't letting her go until I was sure she was clean. Nothing on you, I said. When I let her go, Chloe ran toward her mom. Chloe, I yelled, running after her. Ignoring my call, I found her standing a few feet from her mom. To my relief, Chloe wasn't touching her. I was close enough to see tears running down Mrs. Klein's face, cutting a clear path through the slime. Chloe, honey, please stay back. I pulled up beside Chloe, touching her arm. Chloe's father still lay on the ground, blood gurgling in his throat. Chloe shook her head, tears continuing to fall. Watching Chloe's father die reminded me of my own dad's death, and seeing Mr. Klein's struggle made me realize what a mercy it had been not to see it. It was too much to take in. Chloe and her mother looked at one another, a terrible moment of realization setting in. Go, Chloe, Mrs. Klein said desperately. She looked as if she wanted to touch her, but was forcing herself not to. Both of you, you will not die here. I'll hold them off when they come. Mom, I can't leave you. Behind us came the sounds of gunshots, screams, and non-human growling. I looked toward the bunker's entrance. She's right, Chloe, I said. We have to go. I love you, Chloe, her mom said, over the sound of pattering footsteps coming from the atrium. Now please, run. Mom, I love you. I'm sorry, I don't want to leave. I'm sorry. You have to go, Chloe. I will love you always. Now please, please go. I pulled Chloe toward the exit, not realizing until too late that we had left our provisions behind. And to worsen our already vulnerable state, I'd somehow lost my gun in the chaos. But we had no time to find it, because the infected were beginning to flood the tunnel, their hellish white eyes dancing in the darkness. Standing before the final steel door, Chloe and I worked together to turn the wheel. Behind us, Chloe's mom screamed in agony. We struggled to loosen that wheel. Michael had made opening it yesterday seem so easy. Yesterday, that seemed a lifetime ago. I heaved with all my might, knowing that if the wheel didn't loosen in the next few seconds, we would be dead. With surprising speed, the wheel gave and the door loosened in its circular frame. We pulled it inward to reveal the nearly pitch black night. The dry wind howled, blowing sand through the opening. It was far colder than I had expected. We stepped into the dark, fighting against the wind. We slammed the door, our last sight a pile of monsters tearing into Mrs. Klein's form. The dusty wind blustered, chilling me to the bone. I reached out to find Chloe's hand in the darkness. I pulled her close as we walked away from the door. Chloe's shoulders were shaking. With no one to twist the wheel shut from the other side, there was a good chance it would reopen. We have to get some distance. We headed down the slope and into the darkness. Chapter 21 I turned to look back toward the bunker. Nothing was following us. There was nothing but black night, nothing but the wind and sand stinging my face, and nothing but the storm and Chloe crying beside me. Just a little further, I said. To where? Chloe asked. We'll find something, maybe a cave or even a rock to protect us from the wind. The terrain was flat, but to keep from tripping, I walked with my hand out in front of me. I tried to keep us on a straight course so that we wouldn't walk in circles, but it was impossible to know which way we were going. If we didn't find shelter soon, we might not even last the night. It's so cold, Chloe said. 
Just hang on, I said. We've got to keep moving. It wasn't much longer before a shape materialized from the dust, just a few feet in front of us. What's that? Chloe asked, teeth chattering. We're about to find out. My hands ran across the sides of the object. It was hard, cold and metallic. The surface was rough and graded as if it had corroded. My hands were so numb it was hard to detect anything more, but the clues gathered ended up being enough. It's the trailer, I said. If we can just get inside. We searched for the door until my hands found the latch. I remembered Michael saying during yesterday's recon that this door was always kept locked. If he was right, it meant we were likely doomed out here. I could only hope he had been wrong. To my surprise, I pulled the latch to find it unlocked. I wondered at first if someone was in there. The thought made my skin crawl, but intuition told me that the trailer wouldn't be dark if anyone was in there. Hello, I called. Anyone here? Let's just get inside, Chloe said. After letting her enter first, I slammed the door behind us. Outside, the wind howled like a dying beast, making strange whistling sounds as it blasted around the trailer. My hands fumbled for a light switch, finding one beside the door. To my relief, a single fluorescent light flickered on, revealing a mostly bare interior. Most of the cabinets and drawers had been left open and were completely empty. It was hardly the well-stocked shelter Michael had made it out to be, what happened? Chloe asked. Why is it like this? It must have been raided, I said. I reached back for the door and attempted to turn the lock shut. It just kept rotating without catching. The lock is broken. Chloe looked at the door fearfully. What if one of them follows us here? Let's just hope they're not as lucky as we were. I'm more worried about the next few days. There are supposed to be supplies in here. A small kitchen area lay in front of us, and beyond that was a worn couch and a sliding wooden door that led to a bathroom. The light barely reached the room at the end of the trailer, where I could just make out the corner of a bed. The interior felt almost as cold as the outside, but at least there was no wind. Chloe went to the couch and sat down, her face worn and pale. Her eyes held a faraway look, which made me wonder whether she was suffering from shock, she didn't move, but her shoulders were shaking. There was a red fleece blanket folded on the couch, which she completely ignored despite her obvious chills. I took the blanket and wrapped it around her. Here, I said, sitting next to her. We were out there way too long. Without a word, she wrapped the blanket around us both. It was hard to believe Chloe and I were sitting together right now, that in spite of the odds... We had made it to this trailer safely. But now that we were no longer in immediate danger, I realized I was hungry. I hadn't eaten since breakfast. As if on cue, I felt a gnawing in my belly, reminding me of the provisions we'd left behind in the tunnel. My eyes looked toward the open drawers of the kitchen. Whoever had ransacked the trailer had probably taken all the food with them. I made sure the blanket was snug around Chloe before heading for the fridge. I opened the upper and lower doors, but all I found was a gallon-sized plastic container filled with a single, solid piece of ice. Next, I went to the electric stove, turning all the knobs. If we could get the burners going, it would provide a little heat. I set all four set to high, but they didn't work. I tried the tap. Not a drop came out. Everything in here was worse than useless. I could do nothing about the front door, but I made sure the shutters were drawn tight. If someone or something saw the light from outside, it would lead them straight to us. I didn't trust either of us to stay awake and keep watch, given how tired we were. I went back to the fridge to retrieve the container of ice. If I could find a way to heat it, we'd have water, something we would definitely need soon. The warmer temperatures tomorrow morning might get us something to drink by noon, but maybe we could give the thawing a head start by using our shared body heat with a blanket serving as insulation. Next, I opened the only cabinet that was still closed. 
To my surprise, some granola bars had been left behind, wrapped in hardy, sealable plastic bags. They were from the bunker, the kind often served with breakfast. I grabbed four of them and brought them back to the couch. Chloe was lying on her back with a hand over her face. Here, I said, sitting down next to her. I found some granola. She was still shaking. I don't feel so good, she said. Her face was pale, and her lips were not their usual pink. If anything, they held a bluish tinge. I knew we had been outside too long, but the cold seemed to have affected Chloe far more than me. You're just cold, I said, placing a hand on her hair, stroking it. I'm right here next to you. Close your eyes and try to relax. That just makes it worse. Look at me then. As her eyes fluttered open, I noticed they were taking too long to focus. It scared me to see her like this, but I couldn't let that show. Here, I said. Eat some of this. You need the energy. I took out some of the granola, and the smell of oats, nuts, and brown sugar filled the cold air. Chloe only shook her head. I can't. You eat it. Her eyes seemed to lose focus before she closed them. Her breathing was ragged and shallow. Why don't you lie on your side, I said, helping to turn her. That way, I can lie down beside you and help you get warm. Laying with my front against her back and wrapping my arms around her, I found every part of her cold. I pulled the blanket over us both, making sure to also cover the container of ice I'd placed on the floor. Even if Chloe couldn't eat, I'd gone too long without food. I ate three of the bars before I made myself stop. I had to save the rest for later. In time, Chloe stopped shaking, and her breaths evened out, lulling me to sleep. It wouldn't be long until morning. I woke early, uncertain of where I was. Red morning light filtered through the shutters, bathing the trailer's interior with a molten glow. Then it all came back. I remembered everything, though my mind still refused to grasp the meaning of it. My dad, dead. Chloe's parents, dead. And who knew how many others were dead, too? Bunker 108 had fallen, making both Chloe and I its unlikeliest survivors. Chloe was still asleep, her breathing slow and irregular. Chloe? I shook her gently, then touched her forehead. In a complete reversal of last night's chills, her skin burned hot. No, she rasped. No. I rose from the couch and knelt on the floor facing her, Chloe's eyelids flickered open, her pupils not seeming to focus. Her lack of response frightened me. Chloe, I said. Chloe, God, please answer me. She shut her eyes, only to force them open again. I reached over the couch, pulling the shutters open so that more of the reddish morning light could filter inside. I didn't know why I thought more light would help, but it seemed better than doing nothing. The exertion from waking up was taking its toll. Chloe now fought for every breath, and her eyes were red, wide, and fearful. Seeing her like this made it hard not to panic. Chloe! My voice seemed to release her from her spell. What? Where am I? Where are my parents? Deciding to ignore her questions, especially that last one, I reached for the container of ice. Finding it over half melted, I held the water to Chloe's lips. Drink this, baby, all right? Please, you have to. To my relief, her colorless lips moved weakly to the rim of the container. I tilted it ever so slightly until the water entered her mouth. She tried to swallow, but failed, coughing it back up. Don't be scared, baby. It'll be all right. You'll be all right. I'm sorry, she said. I can't drink it. I fought to keep my tears back. It's all right. We'll try again later. She shook her head weakly. I held her shoulders, softly pulling her upright. She felt frail in my hands, and there was no resistance in her muscles. I had no idea that hypothermia could do this to someone. 
I wish my dad was here to help us. Just one swallow, Chloe. That's it. She gave a weak nod. I held the container to her lips once more. This time in a better position, she was able to take several small sips. There you go, I said. That's good. She turned her head away and some of the water spilled out of her mouth. I pulled the container away, reaching for some of the granola. Here, let's get some of this in you. I broke the bar into small pieces, but she made no effort to open her mouth. She seemed too weak to do anything, save for those shallow breaths. The best thing was for her to rest. As I slowly repositioned her so that she could again lay flat, the blanket fell from her right shoulder. When I moved to cover her again, I noticed something odd on her wrist. Teeth marks. I looked into her eyes, and dread gripped my chest. Her eyes were watering, and I felt a weight shift between us, from her to me. She had known, and not told me. And now I knew, too. I'm sorry, she said. I'm so sorry. I cupped her face, so hot to the touch. It was all she could do to keep her eyes focused. I felt as if my heart were ripping into pieces. It happened in the apartment. My eyes filled with tears. I shook my head in disbelief that this could be happening. Please, please don't let her die. I can't lose Chloe, too. Chloe, I love you, Alex, and I'm sorry. I was hoping I would be okay. It was such a small thing. You did nothing wrong, I said, pulling her close. It's okay. I don't want you to think it's your fault. I don't. It's not anyone's fault, I said, the tears streaming down my face. It's not. The world was taking everything that mattered. Chloe was all I had left, and without her, I didn't know how I was going to do this. I didn't know how I was going to go on. I won't leave you, I said. I won't. You'll have to, she said. Maybe, maybe you'll find another home, another bunker. I stroked her hair and attempted to give her more water as it melted, though she turned her head in refusal. Chloe grew quiet, too weak to even speak. Chapter 22 the trailer warmed as morning gave way to afternoon. I tried to feed Chloe, but she refused every one of my attempts. She had grown very still, her heart beating faintly. From time to time, she coughed up a grayish phlegm. I wiped it away, taking care not to touch it myself. I stroked her hair, once so lush and soft, now so dry and listless. Her once beautiful, clear skin had become pale and translucent, revealing darkened veins. Her face grew gaunter as the day progressed. The transformation was terrifying. I love you, I said. Don't forget that, okay? I never left her side, and throughout the day, I told her the same thing over and over, always with a hand on her to let her know I was with her. Each time her eyes were closed, I feared they might never open again. But then they would open and find me. She was still there, behind those eyes. By early afternoon, her eyes opened and became fixed, as if she were staring at some faraway point. Their once brilliant blue was now colorless and gray. Chloe? Of course she didn't answer. She couldn't answer. I placed my hand over her heart, feeling nothing. Everything that had been Chloe had fled, leaving only the ghost of her memory behind. It was then that I cried. The sounds that came out of my mouth didn't even seem human. I didn't feel like myself anymore. Everyone I'd ever known was now dead, all killed in a single night of madness. From here on out, things would be different. I could never look at the world the same way. I could never be my former self. There was nothing left. No emotion, no goodness. 
The only way I could cope was through sheer willpower, to force myself to do things even though my heart was no longer in it. That was the only way I could make it. It was either that, or end it all. I sat on the couch, wondering which sounded better. Should I make the effort to go on? There was no easy way to end things. The gun was left behind in the bunker, and even if I still had it, there were no bullets. The decision could wait. My most immediate concern was burying Chloe. Everything else came after that. There was a high risk she would transform like everyone else. To be safe, I had to bury her before that happened. But burial alone wouldn't be enough. If she turned, she would still be alive in some sense. The image of her scratching and crawling against the dirt filled me with dread. There was only one way to shield her from that suffering. I would have to kill her. Really kill her. I didn't know how, but I knew it was something that had to be done. If some part of Chloe was still aware, I couldn't let her experience the torment of being buried alive and becoming possessed by something evil. With my mind made up, I began doing what I had to do. I went outside in search of something to dig with. I found a shed behind the trailer that I hadn't noticed on my recon with Michael. It was hidden on the opposite side of where I had stood yesterday. There wasn't much inside, but at least there was a shovel. I took it and set to work, losing myself and digging a grave not worthy of Chloe. The ground was hard and unyielding, but I gave it everything I had. It took a few hours before I was placing Chloe's remains inside the shallow pit. Putting a body in the ground was a foreign concept to me. Everyone in Bunker 108, from a young age, learned the disturbing truth of what happened to the dead. Their bodies were recycled, every cell becoming part of the nutrient-rich bath used to grow crops. No resource was so sacred as to be wasted, including the human body. As I grew older, I had come to accept that everyone's final calling was to become part of the greater whole. Chloe wouldn't have that destiny, and unless I did something to fully incapacitate her, her fate would be much worse. As she lay there, her half-litted eyes staring emptily into the sky, I walked near her head, shovel in hand. Tears clouded my eyes as I looked at the heavens, wondering if there was a god watching me now, and if there was, what he thought of me at this moment. I looked down, one final time. Though I'd do whatever I had to for Chloe, this was the hardest thing I'd ever done. I held my breath, taking the shovel in both hands while holding it over her face. I raised it. Just three simple actions, I told myself. Bringing it down three times, hard, would crush her brain and make it impossible for her to ever wake again. I couldn't hesitate any longer. I stabbed downward with the shovel, surprised at the resistance it met. The next time, I thrust down harder until my entire back was into it. I heard a sickening crunch, followed by another, and another. I didn't dare look down as the tears flooded my eyes, as the smell of rot met my nostrils. I dropped the shovel in the dirt and fell to the ground, sobbing. Remembering my earlier resolution, I forced myself up. Actions, not feelings. I took up the shovel again and began to fill the grave, not daring to look at the shovel head not wanting to see the evidence of what I had done. It was fifteen minutes before the dirt was packed in. I cast the shovel aside, looking at the turned earth. Now she was buried, never to move, laugh, or breathe again. I knew that her death wasn't my fault, but I couldn't help but think of all the ways I might have saved her. I could have moved quicker to kill that officer. I could have kept her further from the door, it was hard to turn these thoughts off, because every single one of them was objectively true. But if I gave in to them, if I allowed them to persist, they would drive me insane. Thinking of everyone who was gone now, my dad, Chloe, Michael, even Chan, I began to contemplate a possible way I might end my own life. A man doesn't do what he wants. He does what he must. I realized I had no decision to make. I could never commit suicide. 
Chloe wouldn't have wanted it, and neither would my dad. Both would have wanted me to go on, and for now, that had to be enough. There had to be something out there, in the wasteland. There had to be a reason to live. All I had to do was find it. I couldn't stay in the trailer any longer. Not only were food and water low, but I needed to get away from where Chloe had died. I had to find a permanent place to stay. It was late September, which meant it would be getting very cold very soon. It was time to think about my next steps. I'd sometimes overheard the officers talking about wastelander settlements, as if they were these exotic places on the other side of the world. Maybe I could find one to live in. If I could find a settlement, I might survive. I could get some sort of job to have a way of feeding myself, all the while planning my next move. Finding a city would give me a chance to learn about this new world and where I might fit in. The hardest part would be getting there. All I had were a few things from the trailer. I found a backpack in which I put the half-full container of water and the rest of the granola, 24 bars total. If I ate three a day, it would give me rations for over a week. My caloric intake would be nowhere near sufficient, but better to manage my provisions conservatively than to waste them all in two days. Eight days would hopefully allow enough time to find a new home or more food. I found another shirt in the trailer which offered an additional layer of warmth. And though I didn't want to, I also packed a red fleece blanket. I didn't want the reminder of Chloe, but I also knew I couldn't count on finding shelter every night. No emotion. Only action. By early afternoon, I prepared myself as much as I could. Before I set off, I marked Chloe's grave by arranging rocks in the shape of a heart. I wished I had a way of inscribing a message, but all I could do was honor her memory and her life by standing by her grave. Words wouldn't come easily. How to put words to something as tragic as this? I had told myself no emotion, but I couldn't help but feel the terrible weight of it all. Chloe, I couldn't save you. No, that's not right. You said I shouldn't blame myself, so I won't. Every time I do, I'll remember you said that. I love you, Chloe. I always will. Even though you're gone, I won't give in to all the bad things that have happened. I will remember your smile, your eyes, your laughter, and the hope you gave me. You were my best friend, and I honestly don't know how I'm going to make it without you. You understood me when no one else did. I paused to gather myself and wipe away my tears. Wherever you are now, I hope you're happy. I hope you're someplace where there's a sun. I hope you feel it bright on your face and smile. I still believe you'll find it, if you haven't already. Maybe I've never felt the sun, and I probably never will. But I also know I don't have to. Being with you is close enough. I stood there for a while, the cold wind blowing, breaking me from my thoughts. At last, I turned from the grave and headed into the wasteland. Chapter 23 The only cities I knew about were L.A. and Vegas, but from what I'd heard, both of these cities were controlled by gangs. I didn't know where any settlements were, big or small. The afternoon cooled surprisingly fast, but the day must have never gotten above 50 degrees. The wind was calm, which I was thankful for. I didn't have much to my name. My pack filled with granola and water, my blanket rolled up and tied with some nylon rope, and the clothes on my back. I didn't even have a weapon. It was stupid, I know, but I left the shovel behind because I couldn't stand to look at it. Chloe's death was still too close, and I didn't want anything to remind me of it. I left behind the line of red mountains where Bunker 108 was hidden. I crested a hill and turned around to see the distant trailer, shimmering in the red mid-afternoon haze. A small spot of turned earth marked the spot where Chloe would forever lay. I stood and watched for a moment, saying goodbye to everything I'd ever known. Every step I took from now on would only lead me farther from my former home, my former self. 
the place I thought I would die in. I turned from the view, looking northeast. I surveyed several dilapidated buildings long conquered by the victorious elements spread among the vast tract of desert and dune. A crumbled highway, half buried in sand, cut through the twisted landscape, maybe two clicks out. The red sky spread upward like something out of a nightmare. The day was relatively clear, yet still the meteor fallout reduced the sun to a slightly brighter shimmer on a small part of the sky. Nothing moved or breathed, save myself. As I continued to walk, I wondered if anything was alive out here. I didn't see any sign of animal life besides the odd bug. All the days of my first week in the wasteland blended together. I cared for nothing, not even myself. I could only mourn my past life and everything I'd lost and wonder if there was any point in going on. At night, I holed up in any building that offered the least bit of protection. I would eat my stale granola, drink my water, and curl up in a corner with my blanket and shiver myself to sleep. I cried the first two nights. I had nightmares of Chloe rising from the grave. Hunger and thirst became my constant companions. When I came across pools of water, I drank from them and refilled my container. It wasn't cold enough to freeze except in the dead of night. I'd hoped to find food in buildings, but every cabinet was bare. I came across ruins often, but I had yet to come across any city, lived in or not. On the third day, I arrived at a deep gully spanned by a collapsed bridge. I almost fell to my death while picking my path across the ruins. The Mojave Desert, even in the old world, had been a dry, harsh place, scant of vegetation and hostile to life. Now it was even more so, and the former desert heat had been replaced with a desert cold. Other than the odd patch of scrub or the barest wisps of grass, I saw little that was living. Red dunes slanted against the skeleton remains of civilization. There were mountains in the distance, to the south, to the east, and to the west. Some areas I walked across were flat and bare, others were hilly and mangled. I didn't know where I was going, so I followed the path of least resistance, which often meant following the old roads. In places, the asphalt and concrete still showed. It was startling how much could be buried in thirty years. Often, when I camped for the night in an abandoned building, I saw a black spot on the floor from previous campfires. I tried to find another place in those cases. It was a week after I'd set out when I came across my first wastelanders. I was camping in a small hole on the side of a bare, rocky hill when I heard the laughter. At first, I thought it was just my imagination and loneliness, but curiosity made me follow the sound. As the voices grew louder, I noticed the smell of smoke borne by the wind. Mingled within the smoke was a savory aroma that made my stomach growl. I followed the sounds and the smell by climbing to the top of a nearby rise. Once near the top, I lay on my stomach to avoid being seen. Below, in a small depression, seven people sat around a low fire, six men and one woman. They wore dingy apparel as they watched a giant pot simmer over the dancing flames. They were too far to see clearly in the late evening darkness, but I could see that they were heavily armed. I counted four rifles and knew there could be more. There was no way I was going down there. Trying to ask these types for food would be asking to get shot. Their faces were so hardened they looked more like monsters than people. At best, they'd rob me and send me on my way empty-handed. At worst? Well, I didn't want to think about that. I guessed that these were raiders, the worst kind of wastelanders. Raiders robbed, stole, and murdered for a living. It was a pretty safe bet that anyone you found out here wasn't the type you wanted to get mixed up with. I would have snuck away and run as fast as possible, but for one simple thing. I was starving. I'd been eating half of the calories I needed every day. I was down to my last three bars. It had taken all the self-discipline I could muster to not eat more than I was supposed to, but if I could pick some food off these raiders, that would solve a lot of my problems. 
If I could wait for them to fall asleep, I could sneak into their camp and take some food. It was incredibly desperate and incredibly dumb, but I saw no other option. I could either go down there and risk my neck, or I could go back into the wasteland and starve. In my one week away from Bunker 108, I hadn't found anything to eat, so it was death either way. I continued to watch as the darkness deepened, watched as they ladled stew into their bowls, watched as they ate, joked and laughed, completely unaware of my presence. I looked for any opportunity or weakness with a desperate patience honed by hunger. I waited for hours, ignoring my cold limbs, my aching bones, never breaking my attention. I watched as their crude joking and laughing took a sour turn. They began to argue, seemingly about the woman. One man threw his bowl on the ground in anger, seeing that stew spill was torture. Then a brawl broke out between two of the men. One of them raised a gun, meaning to end the life of the other. That was when a gunshot shattered the silent night, but I was surprised at who fell to the ground. It was the man who had gotten the gun out to begin with. But who had shot him? As the shot echoed into silence, the shooter revealed himself by standing up. He had a blonde crew cut and a tall, muscled frame. He was facing away from me and went to stand in front of the fire which silhouetted his form. The dead man lay face down in the dirt, blood pooling by the light of the crackling flames. Everyone watched him as he twitched and then stilled. The three men who had watched the fight stripped the dead man's body of valuables. The blonde man took the dead man's rifle without a word. No one argued with that arrangement. The dead man, with only his clothes left, was hauled into the night. The woman merely sat by the fire, watching, her face obscured by shadow. The men tossed their fallen comrade into the darkness as if he were garbage. After that, everyone went quiet and curled up for sleep. After seeing that brutal display, I was beginning to second-guess myself. Now, I didn't just think these people were killers. I knew. If they caught me trying to take off with any of their stuff, even if it was just a little food, I was as good as dead. I thought about turning around, heading right back out into the wasteland. I could walk for a few hours and gain as much distance as I could. There was another option, though. Maybe I didn't know where to find food, but these people surely did. If I just waited until they got moving again tomorrow, I could follow them. That would be dangerous as well. I had to stay close enough to where I could follow them, but far enough to where they couldn't see me. Following six people through the wild would be incredibly risky, especially if they kept a sharp eye out. Perhaps more importantly, I only had a day's worth of food. Unless they led me to food tomorrow, then there'd be a few days I wouldn't be eating at all. I wouldn't have the energy to keep up. Even now, keeping myself going was an issue. I might never get another opportunity to take their food, so I decided to go all in and hope for the best. I waited for at least an hour. When they all seemed deeply asleep, I crept toward the fire, staying as low as I could. As I neared, I knew I would be clearly visible to them. Just one look and I was dead. Each second felt as if it could be my last. But if I didn't eat, I was equally dead. I needed food, and I needed a weapon if I could manage it. I was close enough to stick to the outside of their sleeping forms. I didn't dare take any food from the pot that had been left beside the fire. That would require going near the flames in the center of the raider circle. I had to stick to the outside, away from their line of sight. For now, all of them were still sleeping. So far, so good. The longer I stuck around, the worse off I'd be. I needed to find something and take it away quickly. A hefty backpack sat next to the blonde man, the one who had killed the other guy. The pack looked chocked full of stuff, which potentially meant food. For now, the man was faced away, so if I just snuck up and lifted the pack, I probably wouldn't alert him. I started forward, nearly jumping out of my skin when he rolled over to face me. Thankfully, though, his eyes remained shut. 
His face had a long, deep scar, running diagonally from the top of his right eye to the left corner of his mouth, fully across his pockmarked nose. After a long moment, I held my breath and reached for the pack. I lifted it, slowly, so that it wouldn't disturb the stones beneath it. But for all that caution, two of the stones still clacked together ever so slightly. I winced. The sound must have been a lot louder in my head than in reality, because nothing happened. The pack was very heavy, and I struggled to even lift it. But heavy was good. It meant there was a lot of stuff. I could only hope food was among it. I backed away from the flame, slow at first, into the cold night. When I was far from the fire, I scrambled up the slope, hardly believing I'd gotten away with it. I needed to get back to my cave, grab the rest of my gear, and get out. I needed as much distance between myself and the raiders as possible. That was when cold hands wrapped around my neck. Don't move. The voice was female. I struggled, but I couldn't break myself free. Nothing but grunts escaped my throat. My air had been completely cut off. Then she pressed the side of my neck purposefully, making my mind go hazy. My muscles slackened, and I fell to the hard earth. Chapter 24 When I awoke, my head was throbbing. I opened my eyes to see dim, red lighting. Get up, the same voice from last night said. I scrambled to my feet, backing away from the source of the voice. My vision was hazy, but I could see now that I was underground. I realized that I was actually in the small cave I'd found earlier, only now the woman was here with me. The woman was far enough away, standing in the shadows so I could not see what she looked like. It seemed as if she was alone, however. Who are you? I asked. Were you the one who attacked me? I'm the one asking the questions, thief. Who are you? Why did you steal from us? Thief? You stole a raider's backpack. He probably stole it first. She didn't say anything for a moment, instead watching me in the darkness. I could see the spread of grayish-red sky in the cave mouth beyond her. You're not going to kill me, are you? No, she said. Lucky for you, I'm ready to split from them. If it had been anyone else who caught you, you'd be dead. Are they still asleep? The woman ignored my question, instead kneeling down. Her face was revealed by a patch of red sunlight, and I recognized her instantly. She was the woman I'd seen behind that rock. The very same. You, I said. She looked at me as if seeing me for the first time. From that look, I knew that she recognized me too. Her eyes widened. You're that bunker kid, aren't you? What the hell are you doing here? I stood, clenching my fists. I realized something for the very first time. If this girl hadn't stabbed that guy, everyone in Bunker 108 would still be alive today. Everyone I know is dead because of you. She just stared, nonplussed. What are you talking about, kid? I had no idea why she was calling me kid, because she wasn't that much older than me, 19 or 20 at the most. She had long black hair and hazel eyes. Her skin was a light brown and she was very much in shape. Despite her looks, there was a hardness to her features that the world had given her. It was hard to place her ethnicity, but she seemed Asian. You stabbed that man, and we brought him inside, I said. He infected everyone in the bunker, and now everyone I know is dead. Still, she just stared, my words having no effect. Hey, calm down. I'm not going to hurt you. Hurt me? I don't care what you do. I couldn't care less. I have nothing now because of you. First of all, shut the hell up and give me a chance to explain what happened, all right? I sat down on a large rock and crossed my arms. I knew I was being childish, but that didn't make it any easier to do as she said. All right, she said. We found the guy lying on the side of the road. He looked dead already. 
We were going to pass him up, but he groaned as we walked past him, so we stopped. The girl paused, her eyes remembering. The guys wanted to kill him, of course. It had been a rough couple of days, and Brooks was looking for a way to vent. Better that guy than one of us, is what I thought at the time. Brooks stabbed him good, and once he was finished, he had us haul the body off the road. We dropped him where you guys eventually found him. I had to get out of sight when I saw you guys coming. Who's Brooks? I asked. Blonde crew cut, scar on the nose, she said. A nasty excuse for a human being. Didn't you get chased down, though? The guy in charge of our bunker said he sent recons after you. Oh, yeah? There was that, too. They were looking in the wrong place, though. When she looked at me, it was hard to read her expression. We had no idea you'd take him in. She paused. So, did everyone really die? Yeah, everyone except me. It's been almost a week. My dad, my best friend, other people. Everyone, pretty much. She looked at me. I'm sorry. I really am. It was a mistake, though. You have to believe that. It doesn't matter. The only thing is, I don't know what to do now. I'm trying to find a city. I won't survive long out here. I was hungry, which is why I snuck into your camp. There's easier ways to get food out here, you know. Still, I have to hand it to you. She looked me up and down, seeming to see me in a new light. Either that, or you're just really, really stupid. I don't care about that, I said. I just need food. You're going to die, you know, she said. They'll come after you. They'll make you wish you were dead. I wish I were dead now. Don't say that. You keep saying that, and you really will be dead. Trust me, you don't want that. What do you know? Maybe I do. My dad is dead because of you. My friend is dead because of you. There's nothing you can do to make up for that. The girl looked at me and scowled. You don't want my help? Fine. But if you decide you want to survive out here, I can teach you everything you need to know. How to make a fire. Where to find food and water. All the good places to camp. Who to trust. Who to avoid. What cities will let you in. It'll take you years to figure that out on your own. I can teach you in hours. Thanks, but I'll be fine on my own. I doubt that. How long have you been out here? A week, like I said. Have you found any food or supplies in that time? I looked at the backpack. Kind of. There's only a few kinds of people who would sneak into a raider camp and steal their gear. The insane, the stupid, and the desperate. I think you might be the third, but the first two are sounding pretty accurate, too. She handed me the backpack I'd stolen. I held it awkwardly in my hands. I had no idea why she was offering to help me, or why she was wanting to run from her raider buddies. It didn't make any sense. Now, she said, you can either come with me and keep all that stuff, or you can go out on your own without it. Your choice. I looked up at her. She was serious. Let me see what I'd be losing out on. The girl didn't say anything as I set the pack on the ground and rifled through its contents. A pot, some cans of food, some bullets. There was a heavy shirt. Might make a good extra layer for the cold nights. I lifted up the shirt. Below it were dozens upon dozens of small silver batteries, the very same kind we used in Bunker 108. I blinked in surprise. All our pay was in Brux's pack. You didn't just steal all his possessions. You stole all his money. That's why they're going to come after you, and that's why you need my help. Batteries? Seriously? They're currency. But they're worthless. To you, maybe. But with these things, you can walk into just about any settlement and get food, weapons, whatever you want. There's well over 300 bats in there. That's insane. Look, kid, bats are valuable. They're from the old world, and they're useful. They give heat, 
cook food, and power machines that would otherwise be useless. They're a commodity, and someday, all of them will be gone. These are even the good kind, the kind that can last centuries. Government made to be used in those bunkers so you know they're official. Those are the only kind worth their salt. And if you can get your hands on some rechargeables or solars, you'd never have to raid again. Fine, I believe you. So, why would you want to split from them? That's the part I don't understand. The girl didn't answer for a moment. She seemed to stare off into space. Because, believe it or not, I actually feel bad for what happened. Most raiders aren't bad people. We were put in a bad situation, and we did what we had to do to survive. If I've already killed everyone who matters to you, maybe this is some weird way to make it up. She did have a point. I knew nothing about surviving out here. Going with her would give me something to do, even if I was mad at her for what had happened. Being mad was better than emptiness. That was what I had to go back to if I said no. Fine, I said. I'll go with you. She nodded and seemed a bit surprised at that answer. I figured we might make for Oasis first. It's a walled settlement not far from here. If I can get you there, you'll be safe. It's run by a man named Olan, who I've met. You might be able to buy your citizenship with your share of the bats. Do we have enough food to make it? Just what we have in the pack. She hoisted her own pack on her shoulders. You have a name? If I was stuck with her for the next few days, I suppose names might be useful. Alex Keener. Makara Neth. She nodded toward the mouth of the cave. Come on. If we're fast enough, there's a place I know where we can shelter before sundown. Keep an eye out. I can't look everywhere at once, and raiders can be thick in this area, especially this time of year. If we hurry, we might make oasis by tomorrow. Makara headed for the mouth of the cave. I followed her outside. Chapter 25 By the time we got going, I realized I was hurting more than I'd thought. Everything ached, especially my stomach. The last time I'd had a solid meal was in Bunker 108, and that was almost a full week ago. There wasn't much water either. When Makara gave me some of her share, I accepted, even if I didn't want to rely on her. I was already overly indebted, which wasn't a good thing, considering that she was a total stranger. Makara always scanned the horizon, ducking at random moments. I had no idea why she was so afraid. We were clearly the only ones out here on this cold, dismal day. What kind of name is Makara anyway? I asked. I've never heard it before. It's Khmer. It's the first month of the Cambodian year. I'd like to think it means a new beginning. Are you Khmer? On my dad's side, yeah. My mom was American. So am I, for that matter. How are you American? You're a wastelander. I was born here. That makes me American. We stopped around noon to eat. She handed me some sort of sticky, bread-like substance wrapped in tinfoil. It wasn't bad. What's in this anyway? I asked. Rice, mostly. It's good. Makara gave a sideways smile. My mom used to tell me that hunger was the best seasoning. Soon we were up again and walking. We were still in the wild, nowhere near a city. Makara had taken us off the beaten path, figuring that if we were being followed, we'd be harder to track. Flat plains stretched before us, containing nothing but rock and sand cast red by the baleful sky. The empty desolation had a nightmarish beauty to it. It seemed like an alien world. The dry cold seeped through my clothes. Makara walked on, seemingly oblivious to the elements, wearing nothing more than desert camel pants and a plain black tee. Her jacket was tied around her waist. Are we anywhere close to L.A.? I asked. L.A.'s about 80 miles west, but that shouldn't even be on our radar. Why? I asked. It's a rough place, even for someone like me. 
I lived there a few years ago, back when it was better. Back when Rain was in charge. Who's Rain? She didn't answer and just kept walking. No more words were exchanged. I could tell Makara wanted to be alone with her thoughts. Fine by me. So did I. We walked the rest of the day without incident. When the sky darkened, I was beginning to wonder where we were going to stay for the night. I wondered how Makara could tell where we were out here. After a while, everything started looking the same. As we crested a low rise, a house came into view, situated in a wide, barren valley, its facade decrepit and peeling. It might have been part of a ranch in the old world. There were traces of other buildings in the valley, reduced to piles of rubble. Despite the house's rough exterior, it had weathered the horrors of Ragnarok rather well. Its structure was intact, and it didn't seem to be collapsing anytime soon. We'll hole up here, Makara said. I'd be surprised if they follow us out this way. We're heading northwest, and everyone knows there's nothing northwest. We'll have to double back tomorrow to make sure we reach Oasis. Still, we need to keep an eye out. We walked toward the house. I felt rather exposed as we entered the valley. If anyone was watching from the surrounding hills, they'd surely see us down here. Finally, we made it, climbing up the rickety wooden steps, one of which was broken. When Makara pushed the door, it opened with a squeal. Darkness shrouded its interior. She poked her head in, looking around before opening the door the rest of the way. The house seemed creepy, but it was our home for the night and it was much better than sleeping in the cold. There wasn't much of anything in the house. The furniture was gone. It seemed someone at some point had taken it for themselves. That meant we'd have to sleep on the floor tonight. We dropped our packs on the floor. Makara dug into hers, taking out some of the same rice bars we'd eaten for lunch. The second time around, it tasted rather bland, but I was hungry enough not to care. After we ate, Makara stood and wiped her hands on her pants. I need to check something out, she said. Stay here. Check what out? Security measures, Makara said. At that vague answer, I just shrugged. As Makara headed out into the dim evening, I untied my blanket from the bottom of my pack, wrapping myself. I leaned my back against the wall and stretched out my legs. Just sitting here made me realize how tired I was. I closed my eyes and immediately began to nod off. I jumped when the front door slammed. It was only Makara, though. Was that really necessary? I asked. If I were a raider, you'd be dead. We all have to sleep sometime. Only when you're sure you're safe. Lesson number one. Makara had a point there, but it still didn't change the fact that she'd annoyed me. So, I said, are we safe? Makara looked at me a moment. We are not being followed, at least from what I can see. Do I have permission to sleep now? Makara ignored my attitude. Apparently, she was above it. If anything, she seemed to be distracted by something, but I figured it wasn't my business. I took my blanket, this time laying down on the floorboards rather than leaning against the wall. I scooted toward the nearby corner, hunkered down and wrapped myself, using my pack as a pillow. I closed my eyes as Makara rifled through her pack. For some reason, though, I wasn't finding it as easy to drift off this time. I just kept thinking of everything that had happened. All the bad memories seemed to return to life, hitting me in full force. I realized how alone I was, how I was probably the only one to have survived Bunker 108. I didn't feel lonely just for now. I felt as if I'd be lonely for the rest of my life. There was no one who would understand the horror of what I had gone through. The only person who could have understood was buried in the red sand over a week ago. Before I knew it, the tears were coming and I was shaking with sobs. Makara didn't say anything, at least not at first. It embarrassed me to cry like this, right where she could hear me. Once I'd somewhat managed to control myself... She spoke. You know, you probably won't believe me, but we're a lot alike. 
at least in a few ways. I said nothing, only listening. I felt there was no way she could convince me of that, but I was willing to give her a chance. Does that surprise you? She asked. I hesitated a moment before answering. A little, I guess. She said nothing. I heard her screw the cap off her canteen and take a drink. By the time she screwed the cap back on, I heard her lean back against the wall, letting out a sigh. Like you, she said. I was born in a bunker. I looked at Makara, at a complete loss for what to say. Of all the things I might have expected her to say, that was dead last. It took me a few seconds to recover. Really? What bunker? This is the part where you won't believe me. I was in the main government bunker, the one with President Garland in it. She paused. Bunker one. Nothing in her voice told me she was lying. Bunker one was all the way in Colorado, and had been offline for twelve years. If what Makara said was true, then at least one person had escaped Bunker one, and that one person was with me right now. I had to really make sure. You mean the Bunker One? The Bunker 1,000 miles away in Cheyenne Mountain, Colorado? What happened to it? How'd you end up here? That's a long story. Well, we have time. Makara didn't say anything, not sure whether to continue, as if her story was one of pain. If it was anything like mine, I understood that all too well. Look, you don't have to say anything, I said. I understand what it's like to lose everyone you know. No, that's not it, Makara said. It's just hard to remember sometimes. I was only seven when it all happened, and I've been living around here ever since. Twelve years is a long time to go by, especially if you're talking about childhood. I've blocked a lot of it out, honestly. But no matter how old you get, some things never change. She paused. There are things from that night that I will never, ever forget, as long as I live. Chills covered my skin at that. That was how I felt about Bunker 108. No matter how old I got, I would never forget that horrible night. The experience would shape me for the rest of my days, and perhaps even define it. Where I'm from, Makar said. It's much colder, and it's much darker. They call this sunny California for a reason, huh? Doesn't seem too sunny to me. All things are a matter of perspective. Another lesson. What happened to Bunker One? I asked. How did it fall? I'll get to that in my own time. Let me start off this way. Bunker One was huge. It held 10,000 people and was expanded off NORAD during the dark decade. None of that matters now, because everyone who lived there is dead. Everyone except me, as far as I know. There was nothing I could say to that, and it didn't seem like Makara was going to go on. Maybe if I talked about my own experience, it would encourage her to continue. With us, it was the infection. I remembered the white eyes, the pink skin, the purple slime, and the horrible howls those monsters made. People started turning on each other. They became something not human. I saw Makara nod in the darkness. Clearly, none of this surprised her. Did Bunker One fall in the same way? I asked. It wasn't people, Makara said. It was demons. Demons? I don't know what else to call them. They're monsters from Ragnarok. They're still very rare around here, but you can find them in areas called blights. You'll know the blights as soon as you see them, because this weird purple fungus grows thick on the ground, stinking up the land. All the trees are different there, too, covered with this pink slime. All the normal animals avoid it, but the demons won't. You'll know them by their smell. They stink like rotting corpses and have white eyes. That was when I knew we had to be talking about the same thing. It all sounded like the deadly effects of the xenovirus. Only Makar's attack had happened twelve years ago. Had the virus existed even back then? Before I could ask anything further, Makara continued. 
The demons attack any living thing in sight, she said. That's how uninfected animals turn. They are bitten and become part of the blight. Just like plants. Just like every other living thing that gets caught by them. These monsters attacked Bunker One from the outside? Yeah, they're a lot thicker in Colorado, I guess because it was so much closer to Ragnarok Crater. But now the blights are spreading, even as far as here. I saw my first blight in California about a year ago, farther north. There's more of them now. There have been mysterious deaths lately, even by wasteland standards. It's nothing demonic, I said. It's the xenovirus. I didn't know it was this dangerous. Not until last week, anyway. My dad and I thought it affected plants at the worst. I shook my head. We were completely wrong. It's a virus, then, Makara said. I've had the same thought myself, but I don't know much about that sort of stuff. She paused for a moment. When you live underground, you're blind to what's going on upside. These blights have been old news for at least a year. What happens to the animals the virus affects? They become stronger, faster, and deadlier. And there were hundreds that night, even thousands. Enough to completely storm the defenses of Bunker One. I have no idea how they got in, but they were in the halls, ripping people to shreds. Makara paused as if to gather herself before continuing. There were animals of all kinds. Birds, wolves, dogs, even bears, all rotting and twisted, attacking as if of one mind, having a degree of coordination that seemed impossible. I couldn't even imagine the horror, and I'd lived through something similar. That's not the worst of it, though, Makara said. There were some monsters that have no name, that look like nothing this world has ever seen. Were there turned people, too? No. I've never seen that. What happened at your bunker must be completely new. I nodded. We think it might have originated at Bunker 114, but who knows? That bunker is probably offline as well, dead to the same thing. If that's the case, then this is only getting worse. With people, the virus seems to kill them, but after that they come back to life. They're stronger, like you said. All of their humanity is gone, and they have these white, glowing eyes. I paused to collect myself. If you kill them, that's when it seems like they're really dead. Only they have one last trick. Their bodies explode, which sends this purple slime everywhere. It seems to be how it spreads. Direct attacks also seem to do it, like a bite. Explosions, huh? Makara sighed. I've never heard of that. But the slime sounds familiar. Any animal that's infected gives it off. Pink slime for plants and purple slime for animals. How did you escape your bunker? I asked. I've been told everyone died. That would be 99% true. When the last helicopter took off, I wasn't even supposed to be on it. My father ran with me in his arms across the helipad, all the while being chased by monsters. He threw me inside just as it was lifting up, and someone on board grabbed me. I still remember my father's face as he fell away, as more of those things overwhelmed the tarmac. He was buried in a wave of them, his arms outstretched, screaming my name. I cried and cried, but we were already flying away. We were supposed to join another bunker, but none of them had space. So we were to touch down in L.A., find a safe part of the city and start fresh. But as we got close, the helicopter blades just slowed down. I don't know if we ran out of fuel or something else, but the next thing I know, we're spiraling toward the ground. We crashed. It was a miracle I survived. I was thrown out of the helicopter and landed in some grass nearby. I was knocked out and woke up the next day to find the helicopter turned on its side like some dead thing. Everyone else had died in the crash. Everyone except me. Lucky. I know. Or unlucky, depending on your point of view. I don't know how I survived that, but I did. My luck didn't end there, though. My older brother had escaped in an earlier helicopter that had flown to L.A. as well. 
I thought he died. You're kidding. No, but it doesn't matter, because he actually is dead now. She gave a long sigh. That's another story. So what happened after the crash? I escaped, with nothing more than a broken collarbone and a few bruises. I ended up heading into the city. On my way there, a patrol found me, but not from a bunker, like I thought at first. It was the Lost Angels. Lost Angels? A gang. A man named Rain was their leader. He took me under his wing, and in time, I forgot about my past. Soon I was even reunited with my brother, Samuel. After he found out I was with the Angels, he left his community of Bunker One survivors to join me. It was a good thing he did, too. The Bunker survivors were enslaved by the Black Reapers, a rival L.A. gang. Makara sighed. That was twelve years ago. It almost seems like another life. In a way, maybe it was. God, you must have been, what, seven or eight? Seven. That's as much as I remember, anyway. I guess I was tough, even back then. Which makes you nineteen now. Makara nodded. Nineteen, nearly twenty. But that's more than enough about me. I'm not used to talking about myself, and I've only told you all this because we have a similar past. The point is, you'll cry sometimes. Life sucks, there's no way around that. But you never know when the good might come. Maybe it won't, but you shouldn't count it out. Besides, isn't that what makes us human? Even when it seems impossible, even when there's no point, we fight to the death with smiles on our faces. I was quiet for a while. Hearing her story made me feel better, crazily enough. Something I wouldn't have thought possible just a few minutes ago. Thanks, Makara. Believe it or not, this actually helps. Get to bed. Story time's over. She lay down and wrapped herself up. I heard her snoring almost instantly. I didn't know how she could fall asleep so quickly. Despite my exhaustion, I lay there for a while, thinking... I didn't know if I had it in me to survive another encounter with an infected monster, but at least I had Makara. At least, for now I did. I didn't know how I'd make it on my own when we finally split paths, but at least I could be sure of surviving the next few days. Then again, the more I saw of the wasteland, the more I saw how the odds were stacked against me. I just hoped I could find that fight within me. Chapter 26 Makar and I woke with the sun. After eating, we set off. Our goal was to reach Oasis by nightfall. Any softness Makar had shown last night was completely gone. She didn't smile, and her face assumed a hard, stony expression. It was as if our conversation from last night had never happened. Maybe she regretted telling me so much about herself. She didn't seem like the type who opened up much. There was an hour of travel before either of us spoke. This makes me nervous, Makara said. What? It's so empty. No signs of life. Isn't that good? She shrugged. I prefer to see my enemy. Do you think they're following us? I know they're following us. Every bat they had is in that pack. Brux is not going to let that go without a fight. As long as we can make it to Oasis, we should be all right. Then they'll have to turn back. I still can't get over the fact that you guys use batteries as money. They've been the currency of Raider Bluff for the last ten years. When you have a lot of goods going through a place, you need something to use as money or things bog down. Raider Bluff? It's the biggest city in the Mojave, on the Colorado River. Five thousand people, mostly slaves. Slaves? It isn't pretty, but someone has to man the farms. That's horrible, I said. Makar shrugged. That's life. There were a lot of things I'd have to get used to up here, but slavery would never be one of them. Who runs this Raider Bluff place? A man named Char. He's the Alpha. Or at least he was when I set out from there five months ago. I used to raid with him. He's a good man, or at least good for what it's worth around here. 
why wouldn't he be Alpha anymore? Because if you're Alpha for over a year, you're doing pretty damn well. Then why would anyone want to be Alpha? Makara shrugged. Everyone thinks they're special. Maybe Char is special. He's been a raider almost as long as anyone, so he knows everybody. Maybe with him, the raiders might stand united for a change. That's something we'll have to do eventually, with the Reapers to the west and Vegas to the north. What's Vegas like? Most of the big cities have some sort of community in them, but Vegas is one of the biggest. There's five main gangs trying to run the place, and at least a few of them are at war with each other. There's the Dragons, the Suns, the Reds. Makara paused. I've never actually been there, and hopefully I'll never have to go. In regards to Raider Bluff, it was hard to imagine how thousands of violent wastelanders could cooperate long enough to build a city, but I guess even raiders needed a place to lay their heads. There were a lot of things topside I'd have to get used to, such as the fact that raiders were tracking me because I was carrying a lot of batteries. If I'd known how valuable these things were, I'd have stocked up on a bunch of them before leaving Bunker 108. We had mountains of them. Makara held a hand up and ducked. I fell to the ground with her, my heart rate quickening. What is it? I asked. It was quiet for a moment. A gust of wind blew over the rocky ground. Nothing, Makara said. Just a feeling. You fall to the ground because of a feeling? Makara stared me down. You don't trust your gut out here. You're dead. It's a mistake most people only make once. We waited a couple of minutes. At least it was a chance to catch a breather. Being outside and constantly on the go was making me realize how terribly out of shape I was. I looked behind and saw nothing but the flat, red expanse we'd already traversed. Some low hills rose on the southern horizon, along with several mesas cast in pink from the morning light. It truly seemed as if we were the only ones alive. We're not gonna wait here all day, are we? I asked. Makara heaved an exasperated sigh. It looked as if she wanted to hit me. Come on. We got up, heading in the direction we'd been going. There's only two of us, Makara said. That makes us prime targets. Raiders like guaranteed kills. We ascended a hill, and from the top, I saw that we were about a mile from a narrowing in the valley. It was mid-morning, and it seemed we were making good progress. If anything, today was brighter than usual. It was more placid, so that might have kept less dust out of the air. Makara pointed ahead. See there, beyond that ridge? I peered into the distance. Yeah? Oasis is past them. It's just like it sounds. There's an oasis there, and a big town grew up around it. With luck, we'll be there tonight. I can introduce you to Olan. He runs the place. Assuming everything went according to plan, there was no way I could pay Makara back. Part of me still wondered why she was doing this, but after spending a couple of days with her, and especially after hearing her story, I felt as if I could trust her more. At the same time, would a good person have been running with raiders? Being a raider meant that she had stolen. It probably meant she had killed. All I had was her word that she wanted to start living clean. But what if this was just some elaborate trap? At any moment, Makara could have taken her gun and shot me or bashed my head in with a rock while I was sleeping. Then again, her story about Bunker One seemed to fit and didn't seem like something she would make up. She seemed like a contradiction. So why did you really decide to leave that group? I asked. It must have been pretty bad if you'd rather go with me. It's simple, really. Brux is a bad man, even for a raider. Most raiders kill because they must. Yes, raiding turns them bad, but Brux loves killing. He'll do it even when there's no reason to. Raiding is your only choice when you don't have a home. Most of the settlements won't take in outsiders, for good reason. Most outsiders are trouble. A lot of the times, raiders will play nice or fake an injury or whatever to get inside settlements and scout them. Once it's scouted out, he lets his buddies in. Makara paused, thinking. 
It doesn't happen much anymore because most of the settlements have learned the lesson the hard way. Most give the raiders tribute to guarantee their safety. Basically, it takes an amazing feat to be accepted into a settlement these days. Either that or plenty of bats. In a way, it just makes the problem worse. Good people who could contribute to the settlement are turned away. They have to eat too, so they become raiders and the cycle continues. Is that what happened to you? Makara was quiet for a moment. Sort of. Suddenly, Makara stopped, pushing me down into the dirt behind a boulder. She held a finger to her mouth. I stared at her questioningly, but Makara had seen something. That was when a gun went off, sending a spray of chipped rock at my face. Chapter 27 It's them, Makara said. I couldn't believe it. They were supposed to be behind us, not ahead. They probably guessed we were heading for Oasis and went to block the way, Makara said. In a way, we could be grateful they gave themselves away. It could have been much worse. Where are they? There's an outcrop of rocks, maybe a stone's throw away. They're hiding behind those. A few more bullets were fired before a gruff male voice called down the attack. In the following silence, even the wind stopped. My heart beat madly in my chest. If we ran, we'd surely be shot. If we fought, same thing. There were five of them and two of us. Finally, the same gravelly voice that had called the shots off called out. Come out, Makara. We won't kill you, I promise. I just want the pack back, then we'll all go our separate ways. Makara gave a savage laugh, only loud enough for me to hear. Like we're going to fall for that. How are we getting out of this? She reached in her bag, pulling out a canister with a lever. This should do the trick. I was saving it for a rainy day, but I think this qualifies. What is it? Tear gas. Let's hope it's enough of a distraction. You hope? If you have a better idea, I'd like to hear it. After I throw this, we'll take off for those hills to the east. On the other side, there's a trail that leads to Oasis. I looked at those twisted hills uncertainly. It didn't seem as if there'd be a way across, but I had to trust Makara knew what she was doing. Her plan might actually get us out of this. Makara pulled the plug, waited a couple seconds, and lobbed the canister overhand. There were shouts of alarm, followed by a thud before the canister popped and spewed gas into the air. The men began to groan and scream. Now! She sprinted from the shelter of the rock toward the hills. I took off after her, and a few seconds later, the shots started. I looked back, seeing that three of the five raiders, including Brooks, were grabbing at their eyes and wailing in pain. The other two seemed to have escaped the blast and were now training their rifles on us. Run, Makara yelled. Don't look back. From time to time, a shot went off. A bullet whizzed past my ear. If I'd been a few inches further to the right, I'd have been dead. As we gained in distance, the shots ceased. We were far enough away now that any shot would have been difficult and a waste of a bullet. We slowed from a sprint to a fast run. After another mile, even at this slower pace, I was ready to die. The only thing that kept me going was sheer necessity. Makara probably could have run a few more miles easily. The backpack weighed down on my shoulders, bobbing up and down in time with my strides. Makara had long since slowed to a steady jog, but I couldn't go on. I collapsed to the ground. Makara stopped. Sometimes I forget you haven't walked more than a mile a day in your entire life, much less run one. I was breathing too hard to protest. We had a sizable gym in Bunker 108, but I hadn't gone as often as I should have. Now I was wishing I'd put in more time. Makara took me by my sweaty palm. You need to get up, Makara said. She'd already regained her breath. I still lay on the ground, my pulse pounding in my brain. Finally, I let Makara pull me up and we continued on our way. 
She kept checking behind us to see if we were being followed, but every time I turned back to look, I saw nothing. If they were coming after us, it was by a less obvious route. Makara set a fast pace, but I didn't complain. Making good time was important. The raiders probably knew we were heading to Oasis. We spent the rest of the morning picking our way through the hills, trying to break through to the other side. We were losing a lot of valuable time, but there was no other option. The only other thing we could do was turn back, but that would take us even farther from Oasis. I looked back into the valley, but didn't see anyone behind. At last, we found a way through the hills, weaving between two of the taller ones and finally making it to the other side. An entire flatland spread before us, a vast expanse of red. On the horizon rose a line of jagged mountains, their crowns crested with snow. A brown line snaked its way across the plain, close to the foothills we were standing in. It had to be the trail Makara mentioned. A cloud of dust rose up along it, and within, I could discern shapes moving. What's that? Makara squinted. A caravan, from the looks of it, heading north to Oasis. Will they attack us? Makara shook her head. I doubt it. Caravans are prime targets for raiders, so they usually have a lot of guards. If it's just the two of us, though, they might let us travel with them. They might have food, too. Definitely, Makara said, but for a price. What do you think we should do? Makara watched the slow-moving train of animals and people below, calculating. If we're to go with them, we need to hurry. With Brux so close, there's a good chance he might attack it. Sometimes caravans will cut loose some baggage and let the raiders take it, sort of as tribute. If Brux goes for that, then we might be in trouble, because among the things caravanners are most willing to drop are people they've picked up on the way. What do you mean? Slaves are one of the most valuable commodities out here, Makara said. They'd rather get rid of us than get rid of their precious cargo. She looked at me. So there's that to consider. Then again, Brux's gang is only five strong. Caravans are usually guarded with at least ten to twenty men, depending on the size and value of the train. If Brux goes for it, we might have a fighting chance. I watched the caravan below, weighing our options. There'd be food and protection, but it might mean becoming a target of Brux. We only had a bit of food left, and getting to Oasis with Brux on our trail had gotten much more complicated. The security of the caravan might be worth it. We need to decide now, Makara said. Let's do it, I said. At least talk to them first. Or we might just buy some food and head on our way. Makara nodded. I wasn't sure about what she thought, but she seemed to agree with me. Let's roll the dice, she said. We headed down the hill. As we neared the dust cloud, I could better discern the shapes moving inside it. People walked among animals laden with goods, animals with long necks and shaggy brown hair. Each had a hump on its back. Are those camels? I asked. Makar nodded. Yeah. Camels in California? Or are we halfway across the world without me knowing it? There were zoos before. You do know what those are, right? I'm not an idiot. There was this really big zoo in San Diego, which was not too far from here. There were zoos in other places, of course. Anyway, when Ragnarok crashed down, there was no one to take care of the animals. In the chaos, some escaped. Unlike most other animals, camels are built for harsh, dry environments. They thrived here, even if everything else died off. She shrugged. That's my theory, anyway. Seems like you've thought this out. Within a few minutes, we had caught up with the caravan. When we reached the road, Makara raised her hands high. Do the same, she said. They won't let us near until we check out. Check out? We could be raiders to their eyes. We have to prove we're really on our own. As the caravan pulled to a stop, I was beginning to have my doubts. This won't get us killed, will it? No worries, Makara said. The lost angels still carry a lot of respect around here. They'll know I was with Rain when they see this. 
She lifted the left sleeve of her black tee, revealing a tattoo of angel's wings. Every lost angel has one. They'll welcome the extra protection. Two men approached from the end of the train, wearing long brown robes made from fine material. Each had a hood drawn against the cold, making it difficult to see their faces. Each of them had a long brown beard that went down to his chest. I wondered who these guys were and why they were dressed so strangely. They both stared, waiting for us to speak first. We want to travel to Oasis with you, Makar said. We can offer protection. There are raiders in the area, so it would be good for the both of us. Raiders? Are you with raiders, girl? No. If I were a raider, would I have this? Makara lifted her sleeve again, revealing the lost angel's emblem. Both of the men merely stared, not seeming to be impressed. Look, Makar said. We sighted raiders on the other side of that hill. They'll know about you soon enough, so you might as well take us on. The men looked at each other. It seemed as if Makara might be swaying them. How many raiders? Five. This morning they were on the other side of those hills, Makara pointed. We just came from there. As the dust from the caravan settled, I noticed something disturbing among the pack animals. Something instantly made me want to turn and walk away. There were not only the animals and the strange cloaked men, but also other people, huddled, stooping, and chained. They were slaves. It seemed Makara noticed them too, from the way she'd gone quiet. Now the hooded men seemed all the more sinister, and more were filing our way, several of them holding rifles. I counted at least six of them. If you're traveling to Oasis, Makara said carefully, slavery is illegal there. Times are changing, girl. Rain is dead, and the Vegas gangs are always looking for fresh meat. Olan will let us stay the night, for fair compensation, of course. The man gave a yellow smile. Now, lay down your weapons, your goods, and see yourselves on your way before there's any more trouble. Now all six of the men stood in a line, ready to fight if we did anything sudden. It seemed as if we had no choice but to comply. At least our fate wouldn't be the same as the slaves, but being without our weapons, food, and bats would completely cripple us. Makara stood still, not complying with the man's demand. Put your weapon down, the man said. This is your last warning, Wastelander. Let me give you a warning, Makara said. You try anything and I'll blow your brains out. We're not giving anything up. Makara, I said. The man smirked. His companion stood next to him, saying nothing and waiting their leader's order. Several of the slaves were looking back with hollow, haunted eyes. I wanted to save them, only I didn't know if Makara and I could even save ourselves. Then the blaring of a horn came from the caravan, some sort of signal. At first I thought it was a signal for them to attack us, only neither Makara nor the hooded men made a move. In fact, they looked unsure. Makara smiled. There's those raiders I was talking about. Gunshots were fired from near the caravan, spooking the animals. That was when I caught sight of Brooks and his gang in the distance, almost lost to the dust, charging toward the caravan. For now, they hadn't noticed us, but if we stuck around long enough, they would. In the end, the caravan leader scowled, motioning for his men to defend the caravan. That was our cue to exit. Makar grabbed me by the arm, and for what seemed like the tenth time that day, we ran. After going about a mile into the desert, we slowed our pace to a walk. The gunshots had ceased, and I could see neither the caravan nor Brooks and his raiders. If they learned about us from the caravanners, would they come after us in the desert? We still need more distance, Makara said. When Makara saw me lagging behind, she knew she couldn't push my limits anymore. I wasn't sure how far we'd gone, but surely far enough to where Brooks and the others wouldn't pose a threat, at least for now. Soon it would grow too dark for them to track us out here. Hopefully they'd be satisfied enough with plundering the caravan to come after us. 
But even if the caravan gave Brux all the bats in the world, there was one thing it wouldn't give him. Revenge. That alone made me think this wasn't the last we'd see of him. Thankfully, we came upon a small house, standing alone in the desert wasteland. It looked so similar to the one we'd stayed in the last night that it could have been the very same. Let's hope no one's home, Makar said. When we arrived, the door was already wide open. Four wooden steps led to a wide porch jutting from the house's front, where two chairs still sat collecting dust. We went inside, finding the place empty and full of dust. The room was bare as if it had been abandoned before even Ragnarok came down. Makara dropped her pack and I followed suit. This would make for an adequate shelter tonight. I followed Makara back outside, where I took up one of the chairs. Makara peered into the distance. That doesn't look good, Makara said. What? I followed her line of sight to see what appeared to be a wall of cloud bearing down in the distance, boiling violently with flashes of lightning. Their tops must have reached thousands of feet high. If we'd come to the house fifteen minutes later, we'd have been caught right in the middle of it. Nasty one from the looks of it, Makara said. Better grab these chairs and step inside. It'll be a long night. What is it? I've heard of dust storms, but that just looks insane. We watched for a moment. I could hear the rumble of the storm, and already the wind was quickening as if in anticipation for the pending tempest. Well, there are dust storms, and then there are dust storms. The second of these are called Devil's Walls, a solid wall of dust and electricity that'll kill you if you're ever caught in one. Lightning strikes and getting buried are just a couple of the fun ways you could die. Will the house hold up? Probably. It's seen hundreds of storms by now. Hopefully it can stand up to one more. That's comforting. Come on, let's get inside. The clouds moved incredibly fast, and it was mesmerizing just to watch the approaching storm. The last gleams of the fading sun cast the clouds in hues of pink, purple, and orange. The shifting of light and shadow, together with the flashing lightning, gave the clouds a dangerous beauty. A beauty that would kill if it caught us out here. Makara pulled me inside, shutting the door tight. Chapter 28 it wasn't long before the first wave of sand blasted against the house's eastern side. From the groan of the wood, I thought it was going to cave in right there. Makaro was right, though. The house didn't seem as if it would be falling apart any time soon. Hope the storm gets to Brux and the rest of them, Makara said. That would make things a lot easier. For some reason, though, I felt as if Brux and his gang would be a bit more resilient than that. The boarded windows lent an additional layer of protection, but through the cracks I could see the flash of the lightning. Thunder boomed, shaking the floorboards so loudly that I felt it in my bones. Living underground, I'd never seen lightning, nor had I heard thunder. It was far louder and more terrifying than any movie made it out to be. It was under these conditions that we ate a quick meal, the last of the rice bread and a small ration of water. It was all the food we had left, so there'd be none until we made it to Oasis tomorrow. We were supposed to have been there tonight, but Brooks had put a kink in that plan. As I had last night, I lay down against the wall on the calmer side of the house, wrapping myself in my blanket and trying to ignore the growling of my stomach. Makara also lay down and was quiet. I closed my eyes, hoping that sleep wasn't far in coming. It wasn't to be, though. Between the howl of the wind, the flashes of lightning, and the exploding thunder, sleep was impossible. I had no idea if Makara was having trouble as well, because besides the occasional flash of lightning, the house was pitch black. All I wanted was to be warm. The wind seeped in through the cracks, and I even felt dust settling on my face and getting in my nose. Combined with my numbed hands and feet, I was more miserable than I could ever remember. Makara? 
She didn't respond, either because she was asleep or she couldn't hear me. I got up to stretch my cold limbs, hoping to warm up a bit. I wanted nothing more than to be back underground, where it was warm, where it was safe, and where there was always food. I would have killed for a hot shower. I lay down, closing my eyes. After a while, I seemed to drift off from sheer exhaustion. That was when a guttural bellow shook the entire frame of the house. I jolted awake and saw Makara standing on the floorboards beside me in the darkness. Something was out there, something big and something loud. Makara moved closer until her shoulder touched mine. Don't move, she whispered, barely loud enough for me to hear. I heard it pawing on the ground outside, its breaths and snorts loud enough to hear above the howling wind. It's one of them, she whispered. A demon. My heart pounded, and I breathed as quiet as I could, remaining still. Maybe, given enough time, this demon would go away. The storm raged on, and we waited for what seemed an eternity. It must have gone away at some point, because I heard nothing more, even when the wind started to fade. I think it's gone, Makar said. What could be that big? I don't know, Makar said. That virus can do weird things, make animals much bigger than they were meant to be. We must be near a blight. If I'd known, I would have taken us another way. We just stood there, not moving. In the end, though, we both lay down and went to sleep. The next morning when I awoke, Makara was already up and packing. The storm had ended and thin morning light filtered through the window boards, creating beams of dancing motes. Stay here, she said. I need to check things out. She pushed open the door, struggling at what seemed to be at least three feet of accumulated sand. She managed to get the door open halfway, squeezing out through the gap. A minute later, she came back in. Nothing out there, she said. No tracks or anything. Whatever that thing was, it's gone. Stick with the plan, I asked. Makara nodded. We lost a lot of time yesterday, but we still might make Oasis by sundown if we hurry. We left the house, traveling all day without seeing another soul. It felt lonesome out in the wastes, but given what I'd seen of people out here, that was probably a good thing. We avoided the road, striking northeast through the desert. I figured there'd be more cities out here, I said. There's nothing. There's Oasis. Heading east, you don't hit anything big until Raider Bluff on the Colorado. Heading west, you get to Last Town, which the Reapers drove into the ground a few years back, Everything around Los Angeles is under their thumb. There used to be a lot more settlements, but most couldn't protect themselves from the raiders or the reapers. The main one holding its ground is Oasis, mainly because of its wall and size. It stands right in the middle of Los Angeles, Raider Bluff, and Vegas, so it sort of acts as a trade hub. Is Oasis big? Not as big as any of those cities, but 500 people might live there. That's not too big, I said. It's bigger than you might think, Makara said. Even getting 50 people to work together for mutual survival is challenging. Oasis is pretty big because of its water. It's fed by an underground aquifer that people drilled to back in the day. Los Angeles is pretty dry, but rain got the aqueduct working again, and I guess the reapers have maintained it. It's the same for all the other cities, Vegas has the Colorado River and what's left of Lake Mead, and Raider Bluff has the Colorado. Makes sense, I said. We're somewhere north of an old world city called Yucca. There are still signs of it if you know where to look. Buildings half buried in the sand, that sort of thing. The day was warmer than yesterday, and the red clouds had dispersed even more, despite the sandstorm of yesterday. Even so, the sun was well hidden behind those clouds. The vegetation was bare to non-existent, and it only seemed to get bleaker the farther we headed north. Just seeing all these dunes made me feel more tired and thirsty than I already was. 
We were already rationing our water. Between us, we had just a few mouthfuls left. We never stopped, not even once as we plodded north. My lips were chapped and dry, and my tongue felt thick. I was getting used to the work of walking, though there was a constant gnawing at my belly. The promise of a hot meal was all that kept me going. We passed a few buildings, hills, rocky outcrops, and the day never brightened beyond a dull, monotonous red. As evening came, we crested a final rise, seeing a sand-covered valley spread before us. The valley was enclosed by a ring of low, brown mountains, and in the center of it was my first sight of oasis. A large number of wooden buildings crowded around the oasis, about the size of a small lake in the center of the valley, and a circular wooden wall surrounded the entire settlement. The settlement itself only took up the southern side of the enclosed area. The northern side held fields of crops, what appeared to be mostly wheat and corn. It was a wonder how anything could grow in that hard earth, but I suppose there was light enough for the plants to grow, along with plenty of water from the oasis itself. After everything we'd been through, we were finally here. We found the road again, making sure it was empty both ways before striking into the desert valley. The sky grew dark, and it was thirty minutes before we stood at the wooden gate. Two guards sat in fold-out chairs, watching from a sentry tower rising beside the gate. They'd been watching us approach for a long time, but neither made a move to let us in, and neither said a word. One was tall and black, chewing on a cigar, letting the ash fall to his feet. The other was pale, with cropped blonde hair. Both were well-muscled and held rifles in their hands. What do you want with us, raider? The black guard called down. You know, you and your ilk are unwelcome within these walls. I'm not a raider, so you shouldn't accuse me of being one, Makar said. Her calm voice carried well, despite its lack of volume. We're just travelers, seeking a place to rest for the night. You have some nerve for showing up here, the guard said. The caravan leader warned us about you. He spied you with the raiders yesterday, made sure to give us a good description. Let's shoot them and be done with it, the blonde guard drawled. The black guard smiled at that, seeming to be of a similar mind. I was ready to turn around and cut my losses, but Makara stood her ground. Look, we're not with those guys, Makara said. That caravan leader definitely gave it to you the wrong way. Let me speak to Elder Olan. Tell him Makara Angel Neth wants to talk. The black guard's eyes narrowed. The Elder doesn't need to talk with scum like you. I suggest you turn back before I put a bullet in your head. Olan knows me, Makara insisted. And I knew Rain. I'm Makara of the Lost Angels, and if Elder Olan tells you that it's a lie, then I invite you to take that shot. The guards exchanged curious looks. Clearly, they'd believe the caravan leader about us, but Makara's boldness had cast some doubt. Finally, the blonde guard nodded, and the black guard addressed us again. Those aren't light words you speak, angel, he said. Many would claim allegiance with the angels for false gain, do you have any proof? This, Makar said, lifting her sleeve. I have their sign on my arm. The blonde guard fiddled with something behind him. A spotlight clicked on, throwing a beam of bright light onto us, making me hold a hand to my eyes. After a moment, the light clicked off. I'll talk to Olan. Until then, wait here and don't cause any trouble. The black guard left, while the blonde guard continued to stand watch, holding his rifle and looking ready to use it. Don't say a word, Makara said softly. With luck, Olan will remember me. I thought you said you knew him. A bit indirectly, Makara said. But once he knows I'm an angel, he'll let us in for sure. Why's that? For Rain's sake. He wasn't like the other gang lords. He helped build Oasis's walls, and he's the reason the town is so safe from raiders. 
I could only hope Makara was right. I was beginning to have my doubts. All the while, the blonde guard stood as still as a statue. And there's one other thing, Makara said. Olan and Rain were brothers. Chapter 29 With the night came the chill, and it wasn't long before I was shivering. Makara gave a small hiss, making me stop. Finally, the guard returned. He stared at us for a moment before speaking. Elder Olan wishes to speak to you. A moment later, the gate creaked open, rolling back inch by inch and revealing the town within. Buildings were lost to darkness, but there appeared to be a wide dirt road with ramshackle wooden buildings rising on either side. The guard climbed down from the tower, while the blonde guard gestured with his head at the gate. Makar and I walked forward, and as soon as we arrived at the threshold, the black guard met us there. First, you need to surrender your weapons. No guns are allowed in the city by non-citizens. When you leave, they'll be returned. Makar didn't look happy about that. As she opened her mouth to protest, the guard cut her off. This is unconditional, the guard said. Your weapons, please. Makara sighed, giving the man her handgun. She also took off her pack, dug into it, and retrieved another handgun, emptying the magazine before handing it to the guard with narrowed eyes. Seriously? I asked. You've had another gun this entire time? She looked at me. What about it? I could have been using it. Maybe later, she said. I had to make sure I could trust you. After we speak to Olan about your citizenship, you'll get it back. Makar saying that reminded me that we'd be going our separate ways soon. From what she'd told me about settlements earlier, getting citizenship wasn't an easy process. Hopefully it would be as simple as handing over a few bats. Otherwise I'd be stuck in this town without a weapon. It was gracious of Makara to give me her extra gun, but it wouldn't do any good unless I could use it. I didn't trust this guard, or anyone for that matter, to keep it for me. This way, the guard said. We followed him onto Oasis's main drag. Shabby buildings of sheet metal and wood lined both sides of the street. People watched us from the sides, dressed in tattered, colorless clothes, almost none of it of one piece. For the first time, I realized what a commodity clothes were and how much I'd taken them for granted. All bunker residents had standard-issue, wear-resistant pants and shirts, along with camo and warm-weather gear for recons. If anything needed to be mended, there was the spare material to do so. These people had no such luxury. They had to make do with whatever they had, which wasn't much. It was a reminder of how good I'd had it. And it wasn't just the clothing I noticed. The men had long, thick beards and intense, dark eyes. There was little beauty left in the women other than the young. The harshness of life had taken it from them early. Their faces were gaunt and well beyond their years. No one said a word as we passed. There was no greeting or welcome. There was just calculation in those eyes, wondering who we were, whether we were dangerous, whether we could be taken advantage of. These people were scraping to get by, I wondered if it was just the harsh environment or the city's leadership. Either way, if this was the best a walled city had to offer, maybe I didn't want it. For the first time since leaving Bunker 108, I realized everything wasn't going to mend itself just by finding a city. With my share of the bats, I might be able to live comfortably for a while. Enough time for me to think of another plan. At last, we came to the oasis itself. Palm trees surrounded it, but they were shriveled and long dead. A beaten road wrapped around the oasis, lined by wooden buildings, the windows of which stared like empty eyes. At the edge of the water stood a tall man with his back to us. He stared across the dark surface of the oasis, not turning around at our approach. I knew this was Olan, because two guards stood on his either side, watching us warily. When we came to a stop, Olan turned, gazing at us with calculating blue eyes. Unlike the other people of the town, 
Olan was well-fed and his face clean-shaven. He was balding with a ring of gray hair. His wrinkled face displayed a toughness that didn't come from the hardships of life, but rather from inflicting hardships on others. I immediately didn't trust him. Elder Olan, Makara said. Thanks for seeing us. The guard who had escorted us stood by and watched like a hawk. Olan's eyes went from Makara, then to me. I gazed for a moment into his cold, blue eyes. Then he spoke. Welcome to Oasis, Makara of the Lost Angels. He looked toward me. And who is this? His name is Alex. I was hoping that you might take him on here. He came from one of the bunkers, and he needs a place to stay. One fourteen, Olan asked. I shook my head. One oh eight. Olan's eyes widened. He hadn't expected that, but he quickly recovered. So, our dear CSO is dead. What did he know of Chan? Apparently something. Chan must have had more ties to the outside world than he'd let on. You know him, I asked. No might be too strong a word, Olan said. We knew about each other, so let's just put it that way. He's dead now, I said. How did it happen, if I might ask? I didn't want to tell him, but Makara and I needed his help. He had control of this town and the food that would feed me tonight and the foreseeable future. I didn't want to tell him the whole story about the Xenovirus, so I kept it simple. A sickness, I said. I barely escaped and would be dead if not for Makara. A sickness, Olan considered. Yes, there have been rumors of a new wasting death. Bodies have been found in the desert, bloated and ripped. Olan turned his gaze to me. Many seek the safety of these walls, but we cannot take on anyone else. Times are tough, as I'm sure you've seen from all the poor people you've passed. We're on half rations until we can bring in the harvest, and they wouldn't stand for it if I extended my charity now, which is always my first inclination. These walls are the only safe place in the wasteland, Makara said. They are also walls that the angels helped you build. Olan put a hand over his heart. And I'll never forget it. What about you, Makara? Would you seek the sanctuary of Oasis as well? I've left the raiding life behind, Makara said. I'm ready to start fresh. To start off, I'd like to stay for a few days to help Alex adjust. After that, I'll be on my way. To where, if I might ask? If not raid or bluff, then where would you go? You know where all roads lead, Makara. Right back to where you started. Makara said nothing, understanding the implication. It was either live an oasis, become a raider, or starve. I could use someone of your skills, Makara, Olan continued. And for the sake of my late brother, I'd be willing to take you on, if only times weren't so hard. You should have come here first. You know I would have taken you in after the angels fell. There was safety here and family. But you chose another path. A darker path. What do you mean, family? Makara asked. Yes. Did you not know? No. Know what? Olan smiled. Your brother, Samuel. He was here. Makara's eyes widened. Samuel? Samuel was here? When? Where is he? Makara's hands shook either from nerves or excitement. He's gone now, Olan said. He came two years ago, thinking he might find you here. Even though he didn't find you, he stayed for a while. However, about a year ago, he went to live at Bunker 114. Dr. Lucan came to trade for supplies, and I suppose Samuel impressed him with his knowledge. Shortly after, Samuel left Oasis to study with Dr. Lucan and help him with his research. Makara hung on Olan's every word. The brother she'd thought dead was in fact alive. Only Samuel might not be alive anymore. If he had been at Bunker 114, there was a good chance that he died with the bunker. 
Olan continued. I last saw him two weeks ago, actually. He returned from 114, asking if he could stay here for a while. Samuel refused to say why he left, but from what I could get out of him, it seemed Samuel had a disagreement with Dr. Lucan. A disagreement? Makara asked. What kind of disagreement? Samuel wouldn't say, Olan said. But the main point is, after a few days of his being here, we received a distress call from Bunker 114. All attempts to communicate with them have been met with silence. Samuel led a patrol to 114 to find out what happened. Olan shook his head. We haven't heard from him since. Where's Bunker 114? Makara asked. I need to get there immediately. It's not far. It lies in the heart of Cold Mountain, about fifteen miles northwest. Olan eyed Makara critically. Of course we fear the worst. The entire team had weapons and supplies that can't be replaced, and I don't want to risk any more of my men to retrieve them. If you were to go, then I'd be glad to have those weapons back. If you can manage that much, there will always be a place for you within these walls. Olan glanced at me. And your friend, as well. Makara looked at me. It didn't take me long to decide. Makara and I can both go. I don't want to give either of you false hope, Olan said. Samuel, along with everyone else on the patrol, is probably dead. He paused. And it will be dangerous. There might be a chance you won't make it back. I need to know the truth, Makara said. Besides, this is a way for us all to get what we want. You can get your lost supplies, I can find out about Samuel, and Alex can find his home. I've been in and out of much worse. Even though Makara said that, some part of me doubted it. I couldn't imagine facing another situation like Bunker 108. Only this time, Makara and I would be going in rather than me coming out. Olan nodded. Very well. It seems like your mind is made up so we'll see that you're both fed and given beds for the evening. Ren will see to both. He'll take you to our boarding house by the gate. Get some rest, and we'll make sure you're good to go in the morning. Thank you, Olan, Makar said. We'll bring those supplies back. I'll make sure of it. I hope you can find your answers, Olan said. Who knows? Maybe you'll make it back alive with Samuel and the rest. If you do return... I'd like to know what was strong enough to kill a patrol of my best men. When Olan put it that way, going to Cold Mountain seemed like a bad idea. Yet this was our only way into a safe home, and it was the only way Makara could find out about Samuel. In my mind, there was no other choice. Ren, show our guests to their quarters. Ren, the guard who had brought us here, nodded his acknowledgement before turning to us. Follow me. We followed Wren down the road from which we'd come. The street had emptied, and from our left, yellow lights lit the windows of a building that seemed to be a bar or a saloon. Inside, I could hear raucous laughter and booming electronic music. I thought of the caravan leader who Wren had mentioned was here and wondered if he was in there. Hopefully, we could avoid crossing paths with him. We walked until we stood in front of a sheet metal building that rose beside the wall, Calling this place a boarding house was a little generous, but if there were beds inside, I wasn't going to complain. This is it, Wren said. Get situated and I'll bring you something to eat. After Wren left, we went inside. I was relieved to find the place completely empty. Apparently, the caravanners were staying someplace different. On the left side of the room were several rows of bunks, each containing mattresses that were so dirty and disgusting that I would have almost preferred to sleep on the ground. The other half of the room contained a wooden table. Other than that, there was no ornamentation. We stashed our packs by the bunks in the corner and went to sit down at the table. There was one thing that I'd been curious about ever since we got here, so I had to ask Makara. Where did you get that extra gun? It was Brux's, she said. We'll be getting our weapons back tomorrow. I'll even show you how to use it. Makar's thoughts seemed to be far away, and I didn't blame her. 
She had learned her brother might still be alive, and until she found out for sure, she would never be at peace. How are you feeling? I asked. She gave a long, heavy sigh. Just shocked. Completely shocked. I thought he was dead for these last two years. If I'd known, I probably would have found him by now. There's only a few places you can go in the wasteland, so it wouldn't have taken long. She sighed again. Samuel was all I had, but I'm definitely not getting my hopes up, especially from what Olan said. Well, I said, we'll be closer to knowing the truth tomorrow. And that's what I'm most afraid of. I've lived the past two years assuming he was dead. What will he think when he finds out I became a raider? I did it because I didn't care, but now, maybe I do. You can worry about that later, I said. Let's just get some rest. We're gonna have a full meal tonight, so let's just try to enjoy it. Makara nodded, but her thoughts still seemed far from the present. I had to try to bring her back, or she'd go crazy thinking about it. So, what's the deal with Olan, anyway? He's smart, but he can also be cruel. Thankfully, he isn't half as capable as Rain was, or else the entire wasteland might be under his thumb. Still, he built Oasis and his people follow him without question. I almost don't want to stay here, I said, but it's hard to argue with a full stomach. From what he said, it sounds like times are tough. All those bats will be gone once you buy the essentials, Makara said. They're only good enough to start your life, not live on indefinitely. At that moment, the door opened. Ren walked in carrying two steaming trays of food. I could tell from the downward twist of his lips that he didn't relish the task. He set both trays on the table with a clump, almost spilling my food. I was glad to see that the tray was stacked high, though, with potatoes, beans, corn, and even a dash of meat, which looked to be pork. Ren left without another word, shutting the door a little too hard. Charming, I said. This place doesn't like strangers, that's for sure, Makara said. We dug in with the forks that came with the tray. When you go without eating much for a while, you get full quickly. I had to force myself to finish, even if it felt as if my stomach would burst. I didn't know where my next meal was coming from, so I made sure to eat everything. After I gulped down some water, Makara and I just sat for a moment. We were both tired and didn't say much of anything. I could tell she wanted to be alone with her thoughts, so I left my empty tray and picked out a bunk for the night. I wrapped myself in my blanket. The mattress might have smelled weird, but at least it was soft and comfortable. I closed my eyes, dreaming of a future that didn't involve getting shot at or living on the run. A future with three square meals a day and some semblance of routine. The only thing was, I had to risk my neck a few more times before that could happen. Chapter 30 We woke early when Wren brought us a breakfast of oatmeal. We ate quickly, packed up, and were escorted north through the town. It was cold, but the calm skies and light breeze promised a warmer day. As we walked by the oasis, the water was still and dark in the pre-dawn, as smooth as glass. Nothing moved as we walked north along a dirt road that cut between fields of wheat and corn. A large portion of the crop had been withered by the harsh, dry environment, when we arrived at the gate, the blonde guard from yesterday stood shivering in the cold. He came up to us and held out both of the handguns Wren had confiscated yesterday. Once you're out the gate, strike due northwest, the blonde guard said. You'll see Cold Mountain, tallest one at the end of the range to the west. If you make a straight path there, you should be there by evening. Thanks, Makara said. Be careful, he said. No one's been up that way in a while, but we've sighted a couple of blighted animals from the walls. I looked at Makara, but she just nodded, as if we'd handle ourselves just fine. Thanks for the warning. We'll be back soon. The blonde guard unbarred the gate before pulling it open, revealing the red waste outside. We exited Oasis, following the brown line of empty road that ran as straight as an arrow until it hit some mangled hills on the horizon. 
It wasn't long before Makara took us off-road. The valley was mostly flat, with only a few scattered rocks and boulders, which made it almost as easy to traverse as the road. Dawn had yet to color the eastern sky, so the western mountains were cloaked in shadow. At the end of that range, though, I could see the cold mountain clearly, as the blonde guard had said. I didn't know if the mountain was called Cold Mountain in the Old World. It wasn't hard to imagine a lot of the old names being lost and being replaced with ones far more practical. As we continued our way northwest, the sun crested the eastern hills, basking the desert valley with a golden glow. Makara pulled to a stop. What's up? I asked. She handed me my gun. I think it's time you had this. I examined it, seeing that it was made by Beretta. The guns in Bunker 108 had all been American-made, so the Beretta's workings would be new to me. The gun had a lot of scratches and scuffs from the years, but the fact that the gun was still working was a good sign of its quality. The design was sleek and rounded, almost artful. This was one of Brux's favorites, Makara said. It's killed a lot of people over the years. She took the magazine out of her pack that she'd put in the day before, handing it to me. As I clicked it into place, she dug deeper into her pack, producing an extra magazine along with a leather holster that would clip on my belt. As I clipped on the holster, Makara explained the basics of the gun. Fully loaded, it shoots 17 rounds, she said. Nine millimeter, of course. Next, Makara showed me two boxes of ammunition in her pack, each containing a hundred rounds. Where'd you find all this ammo? I asked. We raided it, Makara said. Just another thing we pissed Brux off about. Still, don't go wasting it. You'd be surprised how fast you can go through them. Don't use the gun unless you have to. I'll keep that in mind. The guard said there might be some turned animals up ahead. They can be dangerous, especially the ones that are predators. Coyotes, wolves, feral dogs... The dogs are what you have to watch out for the most. There's more of them, and they run in packs. What do we do if we run across them? Shoot them down in that case, Makara said. There's no time to worry about saving a bullet when your life's on the line. I holstered the Beretta. Thanks, I think I got it. She gave a terse nod. Let's move. We resumed our journey northwest, and the miles seemed to walk themselves. Looking behind, the road was no longer visible and neither was Oasis, though I could see the tinge of gray smoke clouding the red sky in the town's direction. Looking ahead, Cold Mountain appeared no closer than before. Makar set a quick pace to where we were probably chewing up a mile every fifteen minutes. How far do you think it is? I asked. Ten more miles, if I had to guess, Makar said. We're making good progress. As the sun peaked in the sky, the mountain definitely seemed closer than it had before. We were probably over halfway there, but the terrain was starting to get rougher. We passed jagged hills and were forced to circumvent boulders. Still, Makar kept a quick pace well into the afternoon. From our position, we could now see Cold Mountain's peak rising before us like a giant wicked tooth. It was almost invisible due to a blanket of reddish haze. I noticed something else, too, as we drew closer, something that made my skin crawl. The coloring on the mountainside was completely unnatural. Where I'd expected a reddish brown, it was painted in almost surrealist hues of purple, pink, and burnt orange, seeming almost to glow. It was hard to tell if that glow was coming from the mountain itself, or if it was merely reflecting sunlight. We stopped to have a longer look. Multicolored layers of something toppled down the mountain in frozen waves. Strange living things, like trees, but not quite trees, spiraled from the colored surface below. Some of them were small, probably no higher than my waist, while others were tall enough to be trees, and some were a good deal taller. These things grew out of the colored ground, and another mile we'd be right on it. A blight. Makara said. No wonder they didn't come back. I remembered that monster who'd lurked outside during the storm. Makara had said there must have been a blight nearby. Was this the place the turned animals had come from? Makara just watched, as if deciding what to do. 
I've never seen one this big. It's taking up the whole mountain. They're usually smaller? She nodded. Much smaller. Most you can cross in a minute or two, but this will take hours. She took out her gun, nodding for me to do the same. Shoot anything that moves. As we neared, my fears were confirmed. At first it didn't register because I'd only seen xenofungus in my dad's lab in small quantities. Seeing an entire mountain covered with it was frightening. As we walked, the blight just kept getting closer and closer, and I could only wonder what monsters were lurking in its borders. We began passing patches of fungus growing on rocks, but we had yet to step onto the main part of the blight. Soon, a sweet yet spicy aroma filled the air, and it only became more pungent as we neared. The smell didn't seem to be harmful, but it was a bit sickening. And then, we were there. The rocks and dust ended, only to be replaced with a line of purple fungus. It stretched over the entire eastern slope of the mountain, and somewhere in this mess was the entrance to Bunker 114. Makar and I walked into the blight, the fungus squishing beneath our boots. It felt soft beneath my feet, and it was disconcerting how easy it was to walk on compared to the hard earth before. We should stay away from those trees or whatever they are, Makar said. It'd be hard to spot an ambush until it was too late. We stuck to the open terrain, taking care to avoid the xeno trees, there was no proper name for them that I knew of, but I supposed if the xeno prefix could be attached to fungus, then it could be attached to the trees as well. And there were other strange plants other than the spindly, spiraled xeno trees. Vertical pillars shot straight up from the fungus, anywhere from ten to twenty feet tall. Their ends curved and opened like bells, from which dripped pink slime that collected in depressions, forming ponds. The ponds overflowed, causing the excess slime to flow in icky streams downhill to collect at the edge of the blight. It was as if the slime was solidifying, which might have been the way it spread the blight outward. We worked our way around the fungal pillars. It was eerily quiet and hard to shake the feeling that we were being watched. By late afternoon, we'd walked across the entire eastern face of the mountain, and there had been no sign of the bunker entrance. We'd have to find it quickly. Darkness would fall soon, and getting caught out here at night was a terrifying thought. We wrapped around the flank of the mountain and onto its northern face. This entire side was also covered with multicolored fungus. Clouds of insects swarmed near the bell openings of the pillars, but what interested me most lay at the center of the slope. The opening of a cave obscured by shadow, seeming to lead right into the heart of the mountain. That has to be the way inside, Makara said. As we crossed the purple xenofungal field, I again couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching us. I looked around, but saw nothing. I remembered what Makara had told me. If you ignored a feeling out here, you could be as good as dead. Do you feel like we're being watched? As Makara paused to listen, I turned to where we'd come from, seeing nothing but multicolored miles of blight. And when I turned around again, they were right in front of us. Two dog-like creatures had snuck up on us, and it wasn't hard to see how. Their purple hue blended right into the fungus, and they would have been impossible to see until it was too late. They were both large, but what I noticed the most were the eyes, completely white and glowing. In tandem, the turned dogs pounced on Makara, and she tumbled backward into the fungus, her gun was knocked from her hand, landing in the fungus several yards away, completely out of reach. The dog's jaws snapped, edging closer to her neck. She only held them at bay with both of her arms, a hand grasping each of their necks. I stood still to get a steady shot, knowing that if they didn't hit, the results would be disastrous. Letting out a breath, I fired twice at the dog that was closer to Makara's neck, both of the bullets plowing into its head, Purple ooze spewed from the back of its skull, and the creature yelped as it went slack against Makara's body. The other dog shook itself from her grip, turning to face me. It snarled as it charged at incredible speed. 
I fired several times, not having the chance to establish proper aim. The bullets tore into the dog's chest. Despite those critical shots, it did no good. The dog did it slow, nor did it seem to register the pain. Before I could get another shot, it was on top of me, lunging through the air at an unnatural height and letting out a shrill shriek. Its full weight was thrown against my chest, and it pinned me to the fungus below. Its completely white eyes bored into mine as it forced its neck down, its jaw agape and dripping, stinging saliva onto my neck. As I pushed against it, I could feel its muscles bulging beneath its thin, sticky skin. The dog forced its way down, its flashing teeth just inches from my exposed neck. Then a gunshot sounded, and its weight collapsed onto me. The dog quivered a moment before growing still. I pushed the dog's body off me, adrenaline still surging through my veins. I scrambled up to see Makara standing there, her handgun out. Did it get you? she asked. I shook my head. Only my neck was stinging from where the dog's saliva had made contact. I could feel the icky liquid flowing down my neck. Your skin is red, Makara said. She tossed me her canteen. I hastily screwed off the lid and poured the tepid water on my neck, wiping it off with my sleeve. I seemed to have gotten most, if not all of it, off. Thanks. Makara came closer, examining my neck. It doesn't look bad, just red. I think you'll be fine. I had no doubt the dogs had been infected with the xenovirus. What I didn't know was whether that virus could also target me. I doubted the version that infected them would also infect me, though I had no way of truly knowing. Let's just keep moving, I said. Thankfully, there were no more attackers, but all the same, we scanned the surrounding fungus to make sure we weren't going to get ambushed again. We made it the rest of the way to the cave. Standing in front of it, the air smelled cool and damp, but beneath that earthy aroma was the faint stench of rot. There was nothing left but to work our way down the slope. Once we were a good way in, Makara took out a flashlight and clicked it on, only to reveal five dead bodies, utterly mutilated. Something really big had torn these people limb from limb, a bloody head lay in a corner, surrounded by a ring of pink fungus that seemed to be feeding off of it. The rest of the body parts had been gathered into a twisted, gory pile. No, Makara said. As she started toward the pile, I grabbed her by the hand. Are you crazy? Don't go near that. Makara stopped. But Samuel might be in there. I have to know for sure. Might? He probably was, but I wasn't going to say that to Makara. The bodies were not just ripped up. They were rotting and had been rotting for at least a week. That corresponded with the time the patrol had set out from Oasis. The way the fungus seemed to be feeding off the bodies just made recognition all the more difficult. There's nothing we can do, Makara said, shaking her head. We have our answer. They're all dead. We can't stay here any longer, I said. Let's just get those supplies and head back. Guns and packs had been strewn haphazardly all along the fungal surface. It was a treasure trove, and it was easy to see why Olan was desperate to get it back. I tried my best to ignore the dead bodies, but the stench was unbearable. We had packed all we could, but getting all this stuff back to Oasis would be a challenge. There was no way we could carry it all. We'd each have to carry a load meant for three people. So we prioritized the weapons, the ammunition, and the medicine, because those were probably the most valuable. If Olan wanted the rest, he could risk his own neck for it. I'll take this pack, and you can get that one, Makar said. All right. It was as I was reaching for the pack that the cave suddenly darkened. At first, I wondered why Makara had turned off her flashlight, and I looked over to see that it was still on. Puzzled, I looked up at the cave entrance, only to see five figures blocking the opening. At that sight, I felt a cold dread overtake me. Hey, Makara, came a nasty, gravelly voice. You miss me. It was Brooks.
Makara acted fast, clicking off her flashlight, which would make it impossible to see us from above. Run! Makara took off, and I ran after her. Of course, running blind for long wasn't a good idea, but with Brux's gang firing on us, we didn't have a choice. Bullets whizzed by as Makara and I ran deeper into the cave. I'll find you, Makara, Brux yelled, his voice already distancing. I'll track you down if it's the last thing I do. After a moment, the shots ceased. After stumbling our way in the darkness for another minute, Makara finally turned the light back on, revealing a narrow passage completely covered with pink xenofungus. We rounded corners, the surface sloping deeper into the mountain. Soon, a thin trickle of a stream collected at our feet as we splashed our way forward. As we progressed, the light revealed scenery more and more alien to the eye. Pink and purple fungus hung in stalactites, dripping pink slime that stained the water pink. There was a curious deadening of all sound, caused by the organic growth absorbing sound. A pungent, sickly sweet smell burned my lungs, far more powerful than it had been on the surface. It made me feel dizzy. Makara, I don't know if I can go on. She looked back. We can't stop now. They'll follow us down here for sure. Makara's voice came out so garbled that it was hard to understand what she was saying. I felt myself fade out until a hand stung my cheek. Wake up, damn it, Makara yelled. Do you want to die here? I pushed forward a single step. I heard voices coming from behind as if from another world. I had no idea what was going on, but I couldn't keep standing. I fell to my knees. Keep going, Makara. But she didn't go on either. She fell to the ground beside me. I tried calling out to her, but I couldn't even form the words. My only desire was to lie on the bed of fungus beneath me, to even be surrounded by it. Even better, to become a part of it. As I settled my cheek against the fungus, a curious itching covered my face, but I was too tired to care. All went dark. Chapter 31 I swam through dreams, peaceful dreams, the kind you never want to wake from. I saw my father, Chloe, and even my mom. Everything was in its right place, and there was no reason to worry or fear. Bunker 108 had never fallen, and that man from Bunker 114 had never been found. I never wanted the dream to end, but in the end, it began to fade. I opened my eyes, finding only darkness. It was cold, and at first I couldn't see anything. I didn't know where I was or what had happened. Soon, I could make out the outline of a small room. There was a desk in the corner, and I could feel a bed beneath me and a sheet above. Then my memories returned. The corpse pile. Brux chasing Makara and I into the cave, and then... Darkness. Makara? My voice came out soft and raspy. The mere act of speaking sent me into a fit of coughs. A moment later, the door opened, letting in a flood of light so bright that it hurt my eyes. I shrunk back as the door closed. Sorry about that, came a deep male voice. You've been out of it for a couple of days, but that's the first sound I've heard out of you since I found you outside. I forced myself to sit up. My throat was dry. All I wanted was something to drink. You have water? A moment later, I heard the sloshing of water in a canteen. The man came over and handed it to me. From its curved shape, I recognized it as my own. I unscrewed the cap and drank deeply. Once I drained the entire container, I took a deep breath. Where am I? You're in Bunker 114, the man said. And I'm Samuel Neth, Makara's brother. Samuel? I saw him nod in the darkness. I found you and Makara while collecting samples in the cave. You ran right into the sleeping spores. They cover the floor in front of the bunker entrance, so it's impossible to pass them without the proper breathing equipment. 
If I hadn't come along, you'd both have been dead. Or worse. My eyes were starting to focus, and even in the darkness, I could discern Samuel's features. I could tell he was tall, all angles and hard muscle. He had broad shoulders, light brown skin, and a shaved head. His brown eyes were focused and serious. He seemed to be in his early to mid-twenties. Where's Makara? Still asleep. He walked back to the door. You mind if I flip the light? Go ahead. The sudden brightness burned my eyes, but I was now in a better position to adjust to it. We thought you were dead, I said. You were the whole reason we came here. Makara will go crazy when she finds out you're still alive. All those bodies in the front of the cave. We thought the worst. We're not out of this yet. We have no way past the sleeping spores because there's only one breathing mask. And believe me, I've searched everywhere for more. We wouldn't have even come down here if the raiders hadn't chased us into the cave. Raiders? They've been following us for the last few days, I said. I kind of stole their stuff. You stole from raiders, Samuel chuckled. That's ironic. Yeah, I guess. Now that you're awake, there's something I've been meaning to ask. What's that? Samuel paused a moment. You're from Bunker 108, aren't you? Even at the mention of Bunker 108, the painful memories resurfaced. It was hard to make myself answer, and when I did so, my voice was unnaturally thick. How'd you figure that? Your hoodie, Samuel said, pointing to my right sleeve. Of course that was how he knew. The number 108 was patched into it. At my lack of response, Samuel continued. It's gone, isn't it? I nodded. Yeah, I think I'm the only one left. It got everyone there. I shook my head. I couldn't deal with the emotion of remembering. It had happened over a week ago, and everything was still fresh in my memory. I'm sorry, Samuel said. I know a bit of what that feels like. Everyone here was like family to me, but then... A scream sounded from the room next door. Makara. Samuel's eyes widened before he dashed out of the room, gun in hand. I got up from the bed, drew my Beretta, and ran after him. Samuel went into Makara's room next door, and I followed him in. Makara. At his voice, Makara looked at him, her eyes wide. Samuel. Samuel, you're alive. She got out of bed and threw herself on him. She closed her eyes, and tears fell down her face. She let out a suppressed sob. I can't believe it, she said. I thought you were dead. There were more than a few times I thought I was, Samuel said. I looked everywhere for you. I'm sorry, she said. I should have gone to Oasis, but I went down a different path. She parted from him, seeming to remember herself. Samuel... What the hell happened after Los Angeles? There'll be time for all that later. Right now we have a bigger situation on our hands. What do you mean? Samuel shook his head. You and Alex have been asleep for two days. I found you both knocked out by the sleeping spores not far from the bunker entrance. The raiders? Samuel shook his head. Gone. Alex told me about how they chased you both in here. Well, at least they didn't follow, Makar said. I just wonder where they are now. They've probably taken all the supplies that were meant for Olan. They can't reach us here, Samuel said. That said, we're not out of the woods by a long shot. Bunker 114 is dangerous. I've secured this small part of the dorms, but everywhere outside of it could kill us in an instant. What do you mean? Makar asked. We have to get to the top of Coal Mountain. There's an elevator shaft that leads up there from the reactor level. I doubt the elevator still works, but according to the bunker schematics, there should be an access ladder in there. However, getting there means we'll have to go through the most dangerous part of the bunker. And we can't go out the way we came in, I said, because of the sleeping spores. Samuel nodded. That's right. 
We'd have to find extra gas masks, but there's only the one. So what's your plan? I asked. First things first, Makar said. I need to eat, and I need to know what's happened with you for the past two years. Unless getting out of here has a time constraint. No, the bunker won't be getting any more dangerous over the next few days, as far as I know. There's a kitchen just across the hall, filled with plenty of frozen food. At the mention of food, I realized just how hungry I was. Neither Makara nor I had eaten since Oasis. We left Makara's room and headed down the corridor to the kitchen. It was a small space, narrow with white counters on either side. Samuel went to the freezer and got out some ready-made meals of chicken and veggies. We warmed them up and dug in. It didn't really taste that great, even with how hungry I was, but it was food, and I wasn't going to complain. Once finished, Samuel led us down the main corridor toward a small break room containing two sofas, a flat screen, and a pool table. Once we'd settled in our seats, he turned to Makara. I guess it is a good idea for us all to get caught up, Samuel said. Let's start with you, Makara. What happened after Los Angeles? I'll tell you my side of things after, because it leads right into what I've discovered here and what we need to do to get out. Makar nodded, seeming to collect herself for the telling of a long tale. Up until now, I'd only heard bits and pieces, but now I would get the full story, or at least a sizable portion of it. I guess I'll start when our ways parted two years ago, Makara said. It was the day Rain died, the day the lost angels fell. She paused, her eyes growing distant. And it was the worst day of my life. I don't know why this detail sticks out, but that day was strangely warm, and I guess it all began when I was standing on the roof of the Lost Angels headquarters. Makara turned to me. It used to be a 13-story bank just west of downtown. Now I guess it's only rubble. Even if this had happened two years ago, it was clear that it still haunted Makara, and it probably always would. I was watching the sunset when the streets came alive with hundreds of black reapers. They seemed to come out of nowhere. One minute, there was nothing. Peace. Then the next, they were swarming the streets on their bikes and recons, closing in on the building. Before I could do anything, Samuel ran onto the roof to tell me Rain was dead, that he had been assassinated and that we had to run. Samuel said nothing, only listening. We both waited for her to continue. I don't remember feeling the grief then, only shock. I could do nothing but follow Samuel downstairs. We flew down the flights, running out the back door like cowards instead of dying with the rest. She looked at Samuel. You told me it was what Rain wanted. It was, Samuel said. It was his last request. Makara's eyes watered with tears. I never did get to thank him for that. She collected herself before going on. We made it outside, where we found some angels engaged in a firefight. They were vastly outnumbered, and that was when I realized there was no hope for us. We ducked behind some craters for cover, but that's when the mortars came. Makara paused a moment. The explosions rocked everything, and all I saw was the fire. All I smelled was acrid smoke. My hearing faded, and there was nothing. I felt nothing, saw nothing, knew nothing, as the rubble crashed down around us. She said nothing for a while. Samuel and I waited for her to continue in her own time. Somehow I survived all that, even managing to crawl out. By the time I did, I thought Samuel was still buried, dead. I made a pointless search for him, but the reapers were coming, and there was a chance the building would get mortared again. Everyone around me was dead. I remember body parts lying around from where they'd been blown to charred, bloody bits. If I stayed, I knew the reapers would find me. And let's just say life as their slave would be far worse than death. So, I ran. I ran east through the streets, managing to escape HQ. I ran through decaying buildings, hopped toppled fences and scaled broken walls. Through the explosions, through the thunder, through the gunshots. I didn't look back. And when I finally did, 
I was miles away. The Lost Angels Tower was a heap of ruins, smoking in the last light of evening. It felt as if my life had also burned away. She took a drink from her canteen before continuing. After that, I wandered for weeks. Some nights I found food, some nights I didn't. Winter was on the way, and I knew it would be death if I couldn't find a safe place. That part of Makara's story hit home with me. No wonder she had wanted to help me. She knew what it was like. Soon, I fell in with a group of raiders. At first, one of the men wanted to use me to keep me as his. But I shot him dead. I didn't care what they did to me. I didn't care about anything. I had to remake myself as a killer to survive. I would have welcomed death at that point. I was waiting for one of them to move to take me, and at that point I would have put a bullet in myself. But the leader of that raid, a man named Char, who is now the Alpha of Raider Bluff, smiled. She smiled a bit with remembrance. He gave me food, clothes, and offered me a place in the raid. No one liked Geo anyway. Long story short, I was in. We raided through the autumn. We killed, we stole, and the men did worse. But never once did they touch me. I was one of them. It wasn't right to live this way. I know that now, and I knew that then. I just didn't care. Over time, I realized I was becoming less and less of a person, like my conscience was vanishing. I couldn't be concerned about that, though. All I wanted was to raid, to become rich beyond my wildest dreams. It was a goal. It was some reason to get up in the morning, even if the reason wasn't that great. At last, by October, we headed west out of the valley and down I-10 into the Mojave. We traveled for weeks until we reached Raider Bluff. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. The city was so much different from L.A., where L.A. is a maze of decaying, abandoned streets with small parts that are controlled. Raider Bluff was built entirely from scratch on a giant, three-tiered mesa, the city has three levels, including the fortified Alpha's compound at the top. We brought camels of goods, sold them for bats, and were treated like royalty. I allowed myself a smile then. It was my first success in a long time. My first reason to live after everything that had happened. With my share of the loot, after paying the Alpha's cut, I traded for guns, food, clothes, and more. It was all mine. Everyone in town wanted to know who I was. The woman raider. The women in Raider Bluff don't have much status. There are exceptions, like my friend Lisa, who runs a bar called The Bounty, who I became friends with. When winter came on, I hardly stepped outside that place. I rented a room there and holed up for the winter, drinking way too much. Even after getting all those bats, I still wasn't happy. I hardly remember the winter of 2058. When the cold season ended, raid leaders began to search for new recruits. Dozens approached me after hearing about Char taking me on, but I turned them all down. I don't know why, really. I think all my issues were starting to catch up with me, and the constant drinking didn't help. Lisa kept telling me to sign on with someone good, but I refused. I only wanted to raid with Char, but Char was making his bid for becoming the new Alpha. It was by the time the raids were leaving Bluff that I realized my bats were running thin. Without the bats, I couldn't eat. But more importantly, at least to me at the time, I couldn't drink. So I entered into a raid with the next leader who approached me. His name was Brux. Makara gave a tired smile. Brux was especially cruel, even for a raider. His specialty was slaves. Women, mostly. I didn't know this at the time, and Lisa warned me against going with him, but I didn't care. I knew he brought back the loot, and that was all I wanted. That year I saw the most terrible things. I won't repeat them here. I was given little to no respect with Brux's group, unlike Char's. The only way I could get respect was from senseless acts of brutality. When things got especially bad, I'd fly into rages and threaten to take my share back to Bluff, Brux wouldn't hear of it, though. Strange as it might sound, his presence kept the others from ganging up on me. He wanted to make me his woman, 
But I can't be anybody's, and especially not to a man as vile as him. But Brooks would also watch me on those cold nights, when he thought I was sleeping. Countless times he tried to have his way with me. I discovered that he didn't protect me from the others out of any sort of kindness, but out of pure selfishness. I learned to remain aware of the danger, but all the same, he never let me be, no matter what I tried. I thought that year would never end. The months passed into summer and early autumn. For all the bad times, it was a good year with lots of loot. Twenty slaves, one hundred camels, along with all the loot we found in a completely untapped bunker. That had been the biggest find of the year. I collected four times the bats with Brux as I had under Char. Makar looked up from the floor, looking at us both for a moment. How could I do this, you might ask. I don't know myself. I didn't care about anything. I was past that. Makar stopped talking. I wasn't sure if the story was over or if she just wasn't sure how to go on. Samuel and I just listened, waiting for her to continue. What caused you to care? I asked. Makar's eyes became focused once more. That didn't happen until the next season. There are two seasons in Raider Bluff, winter and summer. They're sometimes called the cold season and the warm season. In the warm season, you raid. In the cold season, you hide and try not to freeze to death. That winter, the end of 2059, I told Lisa I was done. But I couldn't be done. It's not that easy. Raiding, once chosen, can never be abandoned. One, because no settlement will take you. And two, once you give up raiding, even raiders won't have you again if your new life doesn't work out. You either raided or you starved. It was that simple. And there was something else I didn't know. Brux had marked me. It was believed, however falsely, that I was his woman. The other raid leaders were afraid of him, so they didn't dare ask me to raid with them next season. There was nothing but to go with Brux again that summer. And believe me, I did a lot of drinking to prepare for that. At last, though, the time came and we left Bluff. Things seemed to go well at first, even better than the previous year. And then, there was misfortune upon misfortune. First off, a sandstorm killed two men and buried our first two months of loot. We spent days trying to dig it up, but it was lost. Brux ordered us to keep moving. After that, though, it was like we were cursed. Everything was lean. Lean? I asked. Had been picked over already. No loot. She sighed. We trekked north, far from normal raiding territory. For miles and miles we walked, until we reached the ice lands, so called because there the snow never melts. It's dangerous, even in the summer. The nights can be terribly cold, but since it's harder to raid up there, that means there's more loot. Most raiders don't even risk it, but Brux is a risk taker. We were trying to find an old world military base outside Portland, but we got lost in a blight. This was the first blight I'd seen on the west coast. It was nothing like the one covering this mountain, but it was still large enough for us to lose our way. We had wandered into it during the middle of the night and were ambushed by a pack of turned wolves. We killed them, but we lost two men in the process, at which point Brux called for a retreat back to the south. More died during the journey, but somehow we found our way back. Just six of us out of an original twelve. In the wasteland again we found food, but little else. Whatever we raided became lost or went straight to Brux. We were on I-10, camping the caravan routes and hoping for a lucky train, but instead we came upon a sick man, a government man based on his Bunker 114 uniform. Everything had come full circle. I leaned forward as she continued. Brux stabbed him, and we dragged him off the road and left him for dead. Little did we know we were close to Bunker 108. That bunker ended up taking him in, and that man spread the blight sickness to everyone there. So that's how it fell, Samuel said. She nodded. It was our fault in a way, but we didn't know the bunker was there or what would happen. I'm not sure if knowing that would have changed things. 
when I sighted you guys. Makar looked at me, then shook her head. Brux started making plans to take Bunker 108 down. Not with what we had, but he was going to organize a big group for the next season to come back. Makara looked at me. I didn't tell you that part, Alex, and I'm sorry. It was hard to say what would have happened if that had come to pass. Chan had been so careful that we probably would have seen the raiders coming days ahead and prepared a defense. I don't think it would have been that easy, I said. And if they do decide to go back, they'll be in for a nasty surprise. Samuel spoke next. Before Alex told me Bunker 108 was gone, I was hoping that I could find my way there myself. I wanted to learn more from a certain man named Dr. Keener. Samuel turned to me. Did you know him? I tried to suppress the flood of emotion that arose just from hearing that name. Finally, I made myself nod. Yeah, he was my dad. Samuel's eyes widened. Really? I'm sorry, I had no idea. He was a scientist, though, wasn't he? He studied the xenovirus. I nodded. Yeah, but he knew a lot more about it than me. I frowned, suspicious. How do you know about him anyway? Everyone in Bunker 114 was aware of Dr. Keener's research. From time to time, notes would even be sent back and forth between us. Why were you hoping to talk to him? To learn more about the xenovirus, Samuel shook his head. I'm sorry, Alex. I won't talk about it if it's too difficult. Yeah, that would probably be best, I said. Let's just get back to Makara's story. Makara waited a moment before picking up where she had left off. After all that, we headed for Raider Bluff. We camped on some hills and waded by the twin roots as we had in the old days. But that night was unusual, because Brux slept deeply. It was even more unusual when I saw a boy crawling into our camp. With eyes half opened, I watched as he crept up to Brux's backpack, picked it up and simply walked off with it. The backpack with all the bats and Brux's reserve weapon. Instead of stopping him, I just watched him go. He disappeared into the darkness. I waited, and in time I saw my chance to get out of there. I realized for the first time that I could have done this long ago, that I didn't have to stay here if I didn't want to. If the boy would share the bats with me, I could buy my way into one of the towns and I'd never have to raid again. It was a gamble, but my life was not getting any better. I left Brux and his gang and the raiding life forever. Makara went on to explain everything we had both gone through, how Brux had attacked us again, our trouble with the caravan, the sandstorm, and the monster that had been outside. The meeting with Olan and our agreement to find and recover supplies for him. Next, I told my story. A little of my life in the bunker and what had happened with the infection. I kept it brief. Though it was hard, I talked about losing both my father and Chloe. Samuel seemed especially interested when I talked of my dad's research on the xenovirus. I told him what I knew telling myself that Samuel needed to learn all he could, however little that was. I've read all your father's research, he said. He makes some interesting observations on the evolution of the xenovirus. Tell me, did he... You've made him talk enough, Samuel, Makara said. He needs to recover from the week he's had. I couldn't argue with that. It was all I could do not to fall asleep on the couch, despite the fact that I'd been out like a light for almost two days. All right, Samuel said. It is eleven at night, after all. In the morning, I'll tell you what I've found out since being here. Then we can make a plan for our escape. We each went to our rooms and to our beds. I was asleep almost as soon as my head hit the pillow. Chapter 32 when I woke up, I was sore all over. I stretched my legs and headed to the kitchen to find some breakfast. As I was warming up a ration in the microwave, I saw a faint trail of water leading from the hallway into a room on the other side of the kitchen. It definitely hadn't been there yesterday. I left the hum of the microwave behind and went to the door. It was open a crack and dark inside. I paused a moment before tapping it open. 
The door opened slightly, revealing Makara toweling herself off after clearly taking a shower. She was facing away from me and very much naked. I panicked and backed out just as she started to turn. I didn't think she saw me, but still I felt my face flush. I hadn't realized she was staying there because she'd been in a different room yesterday. And from what I saw, the image would be sticking with me for a while. My face was still burning as I walked back to the kitchen where the microwave was beeping. I took out my food. I looked back at the door, but Makara was still in there. She emerged wearing new clothes, camel pants, and a black tank top. Without the dirt smudged onto her cheeks, she looked like a different person, and she was quite beautiful. Not that she wasn't before, but still, I found myself a loss for words. Showers are down the hall she said with a knowing smile. I fumbled my tray, nearly spilling my food on the floor. Ugh, all right. She looked at me, shaking her head. You're so cute when you're embarrassed. I didn't know you were in there. I'm sorry, I just saw the water and... She rolled her eyes. Shower up, you reek. Samuel's already in the break room. I think he wants to get started soon. Am I the last one up? Yeah, we don't have a lot of time, so try to hurry. You guys could have woken me. We tried, twice, like talking to a rock. I felt my face go red. Fine, just, she raised an eyebrow. I'll meet you in there, I said. I practically inhaled my food and headed for the showers. I let the cold water run over me for about two minutes before the shock of it made me step out. I couldn't even get suds. Still, it was better than nothing. In the shower, I kicked myself when I realized I'd forgotten to find some new clothes. Unlike Makara, I wasn't comfortable walking out in the hallway wrapped in only a towel. However, after getting out, I found a clean set of clothes waiting for me on the bench. I frowned. How had Makara snuck in here without me even knowing? And what exactly had she seen? When I put on the clothes, they fit remarkably well. I just wondered where she'd found them in such a hurry. I went into the break room to find Makara and Samuel already waiting. Makara made no mention of getting me clothes and acted as if nothing had happened. I could be thankful for that, at least. As soon as I was seated, Samuel began his story. I guess I'll get started. First, he looked at Makara. Like you, I got caught in the rubble of Lost Angels headquarters, but by the time I got out, I realized you were already gone. I'd heard you digging your way out, so I knew you were still alive. I followed your trail, heading east, but it went cold by the time I was out of the city. I had no option but to go to every settlement in Southern California and ask about you. That alone took months, but at every place it was the same. No one had seen you. After a few months, I had to face the truth— you were gone. Finally, I settled in Oasis. Olan was Rain's brother, so I thought it might go well for me there. That was far from the case, though. Olan runs the place like a cult. There have been killings. I couldn't find a way out, but thankfully I was presented with the opportunity the day I met Dr. Lucan. He came with a patrol from Bunker 114 one day to trade for supplies. Olan had me watch with him as he brokered a deal between Oasis and 114. After the meeting, I introduced myself to Lucan, telling him about my escape from Bunker 1. When he heard of my first-hand experience with the Xenovirus, he told me of Bunker 114's research, and I expressed interest in helping out. Lucan offered me a place there, so I accepted. Olan wasn't happy to see me go, but it was exactly what I needed. Over the next year, I learned a lot about the Xenovirus. While the basic structure of it is the same, there are various strains, each strain affecting a different species, from microbes to even human beings. New strains were always being discovered in the wild during the heyday of our research. We were trying to pick up where Bunker 1 left off, a seemingly impossible feat without having access to their data. A lot of the times I would go out to collect samples, there was a blight about ten miles north of us. I started noticing a pattern, however. The xenovirus is increasingly affecting more and more complex organisms. 
I knew from my experience at Bunker 1 that the xenovirus affected animals. However, up until last year, I'd never seen it here in California. There were several more important discoveries we made, obvious in retrospect. The bigger the blight, the more complex its ecosystem. Bigger blights are older, and the xenovirus has had more time to evolve and affect greater numbers of life forms. The infestation to the north was growing ever larger until even the animals were becoming infected. We knew, with enough time, that Bunker 114 and even Oasis would be in grave danger at current blight expansion rates. Our research switched focus from trying to understand the virus to trying to fight it. As part of our research, we brought back a live rat specimen that was infected with the disease. Collecting one was difficult and dangerous, but ultimately successful. It was a nasty creature, hairless, pink, sticky skin, and totally white eyes. The turned rat was brought back to 114 and given into the care of a woman named Carrie Wilson. Here Samuel paused and gave a long sigh, as if dreading the part that came next. Dr. Wilson was a brilliant scientist and my friend. One day she was transferring the rat to another cage when it escaped and bit her. We thought it was nothing at first. It was well known that specific strains infect specific animals. However, the xenovirus is a funny thing. A frightening thing, I should say. And there are always exceptions. While in most cases cross-species infections can't occur, this was not one of those cases. That night, Carrie complained about being sick and turned in early for the night. The next morning, I realized something was wrong when she didn't join us for breakfast. I went to check on her in her room. Samuel hesitated a moment before going on. We knocked, but there was no answer. Finally, we opened the door. Carrie was lying still, her face completely pale, her eyes open. She wasn't moving. I knew, even before confirming her lack of pulse, that she was dead. Samuel sighed. It all happened so quickly. Even in our tests with lab animals, the incubation period of the virus has varied widely. We don't know what causes it to work fast in some cases and slow in others. It makes it very difficult to predict. This, however, was nothing like what we expected. We immediately quarantined her in a small room in the research lab. Dr. Lucan wanted to do an autopsy. I protested out of respect for her dignity and her memory, but most of the other scientists wanted to know as much as they could about what the virus had done to her. They argued that it was what Carrie herself would have wanted. I wasn't so sure of that, but all the same, I agreed to assist them. So there she was in the operating room. I could tell she had visibly changed, even from that morning. All her hair had fallen out, and her face became deathly pale, revealing blackened veins beneath pink, cadaverous skin. Because of her being medically dead, the changes the virus was making seemed impossible. We knew from our animal testing there was a chance that she would come awake as something different. For that reason, she was placed in restraints. And in time, it became clear that she wasn't truly dead. After a few hours... Her arms and legs began to twitch. Samuel stopped talking. I thought he might go on, but what he had said so far had emotionally drained him. I wouldn't be the one to push him on if he didn't want to talk about it. Just when I thought he wouldn't speak again, he made himself go on. What resulted was madness, Samuel said. She was kept restrained, but by this point, she'd fallen under the full influence of the virus. When she became too difficult to handle, she was placed in the holding cell. Dr. Lucan informed us all that rather than put her out of her misery, we were going to use Carrie as an opportunity to study the effects of the xenovirus on a human subject, someone who had once been our friend. Samuel shook his head. Most agreed with him, but it was too much for me. I tried to persuade everyone to see things my way, that it was too dangerous and that we needed to end our research on Carrie out of moral necessity. Some of the scientists half-heartedly agreed, but none were willing to stand up to Dr. Lucan, who could be bullheaded sometimes. That was why I informed Dr. Lucan of my resignation. I had my bags packed in an hour, and that's the only reason I'm alive today. Samuel sighed. We all knew what part came next. 
Days later, Oasis received a distress call from 114. There were sounds of a struggle followed by silence. Of course, I knew what had happened, but Olan insisted on sending a team there to investigate all the same. More than anything, I think Olan was interested in the loot Bunker 114 contained, though he didn't say that directly to me. Five other men and I were selected for the task. I had my own reasons for going. I wanted to figure out exactly what had happened after I'd left, namely by accessing Dr. Lucan's research. I knew someone would have to continue to research and study the xenovirus, because after seeing its effects, I knew the threat it posed to humanity. My eventual plan was to compile the research and forward it to Bunker 108, and, failing that, to take it there myself. But even in the few days I'd been away from the bunker, the infestation had grown exponentially. Xenofungus covered the entire north face of Cold Mountain. As you both have already seen, the mission was a disaster. Carrie ambushed us at the cave entrance, and it was then that I got my first look at her. She'd grown to twice her size, something that should have been impossible. Whatever humanity she'd had was gone now. Her monstrous face was twisted, grotesque, and she stank of death. Blood and flesh stained her mouth as if she'd fed on people. She had curved claws, extending from elongated fingers. And those eyes. I'll never forget those completely white eyes staring into me. Everyone tried to run, but I was the only one who managed to escape. There was another man with me, but he didn't get his mask on by the time we reached the area with the sleeping spores. I put on my mask as soon as I noticed the strange smell, but unfortunately he didn't do the same. Later, when I went out to check, his body was no longer there. I ran into the bunker directly to the dorms and worked to secure it. There was only one entrance, so I sealed the door and locked it tight. From the attached archives, I could research the xenovirus in relative safety until I was ready to make my escape. He paused. It didn't take as long as I thought it would. I figured out all I need to make my next step. The last thing I was expecting was for my sister to show up. But the plan remains the same. And if there is to be any hope of stopping the xenovirus, we're going to have to get out of Bunker 114. We sat quietly for a moment, soaking in the information. It wasn't long before Samuel resumed speaking. All of this leads to my next point. In the research database, I found Dr. Lucan's research notes, the first description, however brief, of the human xenovirus. You said she was twice as large as a normal person, I said. That doesn't sound anything like what I saw at Bunker 108. I don't pretend to know all the answers, but we at least have some of Dr. Lucan's notes documenting the transformation of a human into... something else. The four steps seem to be infection, followed by a comatose state, leading into death, followed by a reawakening brought about by a physical stimulus. Lucan noted, even after the transformation, that Carrie would not move unless there was something alive in the vicinity. Infection is stage one. The coma is stage two. Death, stage three. And the final stage, stage four, was where Carrie was no longer human. I won't go into the details of how the xenovirus works on all of its levels. I'm only concerned with telling you its ultimate purpose. As with any virus, that purpose is to self-replicate, and it accomplishes this by directing the host to attack all living things in sight. Live specimens were given to Carrie to feed upon. That way the scientists could continue their research. Dr. Lucan was willing to scrap our animal specimens for the sake of understanding Carrie's transformation and it wasn't long before they'd gone through them all. As she ate them alive, only growing stronger, her biomass increased. Not just her weight, but her skeletal structure, her muscles, her hunger. Eventually, it became too much. She was able to break free from her cell only a few days after she'd been put in. I hadn't said a word up to this point. It was hard not to be sick at what I heard. So, that thing... Makara shook her head. It's still alive? Samuel nodded. Yes, very much so. I don't know exactly where she is, but I can sometimes hear her roaming the bunker. There must be some source of food for her down here. She can't be surviving off people alone. 
Does she know we're here? I asked. I'm almost 100% sure she knows, Samuel said. She has no way in here. Even she couldn't break down the security door. The only way she can get us is when we come out. The sleeping spores are sounding like a better option, I said. Even if we had enough gas masks, it still wouldn't be a good idea. Carrie ambushed us there once, so it would be foolish to test our luck again. Samuel paused. Which brings me back to the elevators that go to the top of Cold Mountain. That's our best shot. Wouldn't that be worse, though? I asked. We'd have to go through the entire bunker just to get there. Let him explain, Alex, Makara said. Samuel continued. We'll have to climb to the top of the elevator shaft, assuming the power is out, which it probably is. If the power's out, then how come the dorms are still working? Makara asked. Backup power, Samuel said. It won't last forever, though, and I'm not sure if it extends to the elevators. I'd assume not. My main reason for wanting to get there is because of the motor pool. It has vehicles? Makara asked. Samuel nodded. There are several recons there. Free recons, Makara mused. If we could each grab one, we'd be set for life. I can't drive, I said. I don't trust myself behind the wheel either, Samuel said. But I do have another purpose in mind. Of course you do, Makar said, sitting back. While researching the xenovirus, I discovered a curious citation by a certain Dr. Cornelius Ashton. Makar looked up. Cornelius Ashton? That name sounds familiar for some reason. I recognized the name immediately. He authored the Black Files. My dad talked about them, but he's never actually read them. He'd wanted to get his hands on those files for years. Samuel nodded. No one knows what's in them, but it's assumed the Black Files contain a wealth of information about the Xenovirus that was lost when Bunker 1 fell. No one thought to save the data and take it back west or even to transmit it. Samuel sighed. To think of all that information. There might even be something about a cure or how to stop blights from growing. How do you know if that'll be in the files? Makara asked. Sounds like wishful thinking to me. Dr. Lukin and Dr. Keener certainly seem to think they held something, Samuel said. Though much of our knowledge of the Xenovirus comes from the Black Files, no one has ever actually read them. Think about it, Makara. The Xenovirus was in a higher state of evolution while we were living in Bunker 1 in Colorado than it is here in California. With their personnel and resources, Bunker 1 would have gathered an amazing amount of research. If only they weren't so secretive, that research might be open to all. As it is, though, there's no way to access it. Except one. Makara and I looked at each other. I had no idea what any of this meant and why it meant we had to sneak past Carrie, climb up a long elevator shaft, and commandeer a recon. Samuel, Makara said. What are you saying? Think about it, Samuel said. We might finally know the origins of the Xenovirus, where it came from, how to stop it, answers we can't find here. You better not say what I think you're going to say. Don't tell me, I said. Samuel looked at Makara, then me. We have to go back, Samuel said. We have to find Bunker One. Chapter 33 No one said anything for a long while. What Samuel had just said was unthinkable. Find Bunker One? Crossing a thousand miles of cold desert sounded like suicide at a time of year that the weather would be getting downright nasty. And once we got to Bunker One, it was possible that the monster still lurked in the darkness over a decade later. What do you mean, go back? Makara asked. Even with a recon, that's a lot of open terrain to cover. And winter is coming on. How do we even find... I'm not pretending to know all the answers, Samuel said. But I do know that the Xenovirus could take over the world. The blights have grown for all our lives with no sign of slowing. It could engulf the entire planet if no one does anything. So, I said, we're the heroes? 
I can't do this alone, Alex, Samuel said. If not us, who will? I paused. I just wanted to be in a town with plenty of food and safety. I was tired of this running around. But the xenovirus had already ended two of the final four bunkers in the last week alone. We were down to just two now, and even I didn't know where those were or how much longer they'd last. And it wasn't just the bunkers that were in danger. How long before entire towns were leveled? And who else in the world besides us knew about the xenovirus's threat? Bunker 1, Bunker 108, and Bunker 114 were all gone. There was no one else to figure out what to do. No one but us. That thought alone was probably more terrifying than its implication. It meant we had a moral obligation to find Bunker 1. If no one else did it, the entire wasteland was at risk. Maybe even the entire world. This could be nothing, though, Makara said. Do you really want to risk our lives traveling 1,000 miles across the desert and mountains with winter coming on, especially when there's no guarantee the black files will contain any useful information? And, need I remind you, at the time of year when raiders are returning to bluff? Yes, Samuel said. We have to take that chance, because no one else will. Makara folded her arms and scowled. She didn't like this, and I didn't blame her. I didn't like it either, but I saw Samuel's point. If we could find a cure for this thing, wouldn't it be worth all that trouble? Makara cast me a worried look. I wondered what she was thinking. Return with us to Oasis, Samuel, Makara said. We can wait out the worst of the winter behind walls. When spring comes, we can go. Samuel frowned. That takes too much time. Besides, Olan is a weasel, and I don't trust him. No argument there, I said. A thousand questions crossed my mind. Was I going to Colorado? How would we find it? Where would we find food? How would we survive the winter? How would we even escape Bunker 114? First, let's talk about getting out of here, I said. The rest is pointless if we end up dying before it can ever happen. I agree, Samuel said. Sometimes I think too far ahead. Makara leaned forward. So how do we get to the motor pool? We have to leave this section of the bunker, Samuel said. Travel the corridors until we reach the elevators. They're located in the power plant. Large reactors take up the entire floor and there's a bridge we can take over them. The elevators probably won't work, but we can climb the ladder of one of the elevator shafts until we reach the nest near the peak of Cold Mountain. The nest was actually the main entrance to Bunker 114 when the first refugees came in, but the area has been closed off for a long time. However, the motor pool is there. From the motor pool, there's access to a mountain road that hopefully won't be buried by rock, sand, and snow. Even if it is, a recon should handle it fine. We'll need a recon if we're to ever make it to Bunker 1. How do we know the recons still work? Makara asked. They're too valuable an asset for 114 to have let them fall into disrepair. They'll be running fine. There should be three, so it's hard to imagine all of them not working. I guess that's true, Makara said. The only part that worries me is getting past Carrie, Samuel said. I gave a short laugh. At least you're only worried. It kind of takes my absolutely terrified down a notch. Seriously, Makar said. How do we get past a monster that leveled an entire bunker? The best idea is not to fight, Samuel said. Infected creatures only move when given a reason. Loud noises will only attract more of them. And just how do we kill something that big without firing a weapon? Makara asked. If it comes down to it, we'll shoot, Samuel said. They fall just like we do. They might have a great deal more pain tolerance, but a sure way is to go for the head. If we have to fight this thing, aim for the head, I asked. Samuel nodded. If we do this right, we shouldn't have to even fight. All the same, it pays to be prepared. What else do I need to know? I asked. Nothing. 
Just follow my lead. Thankfully, we're in the dorm, so there'll be plenty of supplies. Everything we'll ever need. Warm clothing, food, and spare ammunition. Colorado is a long way, and I don't mean to die on the journey. I looked from Samuel to Makara. It seemed as if things were already decided. In the end, I knew I had to do this, if only to continue my dad's legacy. I had the chance to learn things he never could, and if the Black Files had an answer for stopping the Xenovirus, then it was worth the journey, even at the risk of my life. It wasn't like I had anything else better to do anyway. The alternative was staying in Oasis, twiddling my thumbs, which wasn't all too appealing. I'm for it, I said. It's what my dad would have wanted. I think it's what I want, too. Samuel nodded. Good. Makara? She let out a long sigh, and it was a moment before she answered. I don't like it, but I'm not going to bail on my brother just when I found him. I still wish we'd wait behind walls until spring, but I see your point. It might be too late by then. She shook her head. I know I'll regret this, but I'll support you, Samuel. I'll help you get to Bunker One, and so help me God, I'll even help you after that. I'm with you to the end. Samuel nodded gravely, knowing that Makara never spoke lightly. I realized then just how serious this was, and I realized there was a good chance, if what Makara had told me about Bunker One was true, that we wouldn't be coming back. Let's suit up then, Samuel said. By tonight, I hope we can be on the road heading east. We all knew what had to happen before that, though. We had to get out of here alive. We went through each of the rooms to scavenge for supplies. Makara listed off all the things we'd need. Cold weather gear, a few weeks worth of food, extra weapons and ammunition. After packing as many of the frozen meals as we could, we went hunting for cold weather clothing. We found plenty in the dorms, and it was in the last room at the end of the corridor that I found a heavy desert camo jacket to wear over my hoodie, along with a beanie, gloves, and thermal underwear. With all that protection, I'd be more than ready for the high altitude of Colorado. That was, if we survived long enough to make it there. The temperature outside was already cold, so it was hard to imagine what winter would be like there. I didn't know how long the journey would take, but I felt we'd be lucky to make it there in anything less than a week. Whatever room was left over, we filled with additional food and ammunition. Samuel's pack was larger, so he carried a lot of miscellaneous supplies. A handheld radio, a lighter, a small electric stove, among other things we'd need topside. He easily carried the most of all of us, but he was also the strongest. In one of the rooms, I found a long, serrated combat knife that clipped easily to my belt. I equipped my Beretta on my left hip opposite the knife. My pack was already full, but there were a few extra boxes of 9mm I wanted to squeeze in. Somehow, I found the room. By the time all was said and done, my pack must have weighed at least 70 pounds, which was almost half my body weight. When Makara saw me lugging it around, she shook her head. You need to lighten your pack, she said. I know you're trying to be a hero, but there's nothing heroic about not being able to defend yourself because your pack's too heavy. In the end, Makara was right. I ended up ditching a couple of handguns, an extra set of clothing, and a single box of ammo. Makara also emptied out one of my jugs of water. It was amazing how much lighter my pack felt after all that. Putting it back on, it was much more manageable. With the water gone, I decided to slip that ammo box back in. At last, we were all packed. We made our way to the vault door that served as a secure barrier between the dormitories and the rest of the bunker, the part that Carrie roamed. All right, Samuel said. I'm opening the door. Remember, no talking, no guns, and step lightly. Knives only if we have to fight, unless we're really in trouble. A chill passed over me. I didn't even know where to begin killing something with a knife. When Makara retrieved her blade, I followed suit. I did my best to suppress my nervousness, but it was a losing battle. Just follow my lead, Makara said to me. I nodded, saying nothing as Samuel turned the wheel that would unlock the door. Makara's face was calm. 
I wondered how she could be so cool and collected at a time like this. The door creaked open, echoing into a dark, empty corridor filled with loose papers, broken electronics, and snapped lines. Even worse, blood stained the walls and streaked the floors, dried from having been there for a while. A rotten musk clung to the air, making me want to gag. Ahead, the corridor angled ninety degrees to the right into further darkness. A yellow arrow on the wall pointed to the right, reading, Exit. Samuel said nothing, walking out of the dorm with surprisingly quiet feet. We followed his lead. When we rounded the corner, the light from the dorm was almost completely extinguished, making it impossible for us to proceed onward without a flashlight. Makara clicked hers on, revealing what looked like the scene of a grisly murder. Blood was everywhere. The walls, the floor, and the doors. It was as if Carrie had consciously painted everything to mark her territory. Even more chilling was to see the fungus growing in the corners. The infestation wasn't just outside the bunker. It was inside, too. The corridor was quiet and cold. There was a deadening of sound, our footsteps not echoing in the confined space. We walked for several minutes until we came to an intersection. A rush of cold wind blew through the deserted corridor. I couldn't tell from where it had come. One thing I did know was that it wasn't natural. Samuel held up a hand, warning us back. Makar and I remained still as he crept forward to the crossing. He now stood in the middle of the intersection, peering down each of our potential paths. The longer he stood there, the more nervous I felt. Then, a massive blur rushed past the intersection on multiple legs. Samuel cried out as he was lifted into the air. Samuel, along with whatever had snatched him, disappeared from view. Makara charged into the darkness, with me right behind her. We turned in the direction Samuel had been taken, but the hallway was empty. However, a trail of clear, gooey liquid led to an open doorway on our right. Makara and I followed the trail. I withdrew my gun. The time for being quiet was over. We turned into the room, finding it to be a common area. A blood-stained pool table stood in front of us, and a shattered flat screen sat in the far left corner. Makara shot the flashlight beam around the room, revealing broken glass, patches of pink fungus, and a broken table. But there was no sign of Samuel. But that strange wind blew again, chilling me to the bone. Whatever that thing was, it was close. I spun around, thinking to catch it behind me, only there was nothing but darkness. We need to keep looking, Makara said. I followed her across the room, broken glass crunching under our boots. But then, Makara's flashlight beam fell on something we'd both missed. A couch, and on it seemed to be a body. No, Makara said. As Makara and I ran forward, I saw that it was Samuel. His eyes were open and moving around, but he was powerless to do anything because his entire body had been wrapped in a thin, white coating of... something. His legs, torso, and even his mouth had all been covered with the stuff, rendering him completely immobile. Though it was clearly thin material, it was also strong enough to where he couldn't break out of it. Makara had already gotten out her knife to begin slashing the stuff off. Samuel groaned, his eyes looking intently toward the ceiling and widening. Something was up there. As my eyes looked above, I didn't see anything at first. Just a large, dark spot on the ceiling. Once again, that cold wind tickled the back of my neck. A high, garbled cooing came from above, and suddenly... Something like a dozen glowing white points shone. It took me a moment to realize they were eyes. Makara? She shined her light up, revealing an enormous spider spanning a good third of the ceiling. Nothing could describe the horror I felt. Turned dogs were one thing, but a turned spider that was a good hundred times larger than the real thing was far worse. As Makara gave a blood-curdling scream, dropping her flashlight, I was surprised that my own reaction was saner. 
I aimed my Beretta up just as the spider opened its mouth, revealing a curved, blade-like stinger. I pulled the trigger, but the safety was still on. I cursed as I clicked it off, but I was forced to jump out of the way as a clear liquid dripped from the end of the stinger. The spider screeched, swiping at me from above. I backed toward the wall, even as Makara crawled on the floor toward the other end of the room. That was when a hairy, muscular leg clobbered me from above, the impact so great that I was forced to the floor, sliding until I slammed into the wall. I felt the wind knocked out of me for a moment. I struggled to get up, ditching my pack in the process. Makara still hadn't joined the fight, which meant I was the only one facing this giant creature. And this spider was huge, and just now stepping down from the ceiling. Each of its eight legs was the height of a person, its coloring pink with purple splotches. Slime coated the entire spider's form, collecting beneath its body. Its two large serrated pincers opened and closed. Its many white eyes glowed as they stared at me. Maybe Makar's flashlight was still on the floor, pointing in the opposite direction. But the spider's eyes, strangely enough, glowed enough for me to see by, casting a white pool of light that illuminated my half of the room. The spider started forward, the cruel and pointed blade between its pincers flexing back and forth. Unlike so many times before, Makara wouldn't be able to help me here. I did my best to hold my Beretta steady, shooting three times at its open mouth. I could tell where the bullets entered, but the spider gave a pained squeal with each shot. Purple liquid oozed from the side of its head where the bullets had gone in. I shot once more, this time hitting the spider in one of its many eyes. As purple liquid gushed out, it shrieked far louder than it had before, its breath reeking with the rot of past victims. Still it crawled closer, mere feet away. I aimed for the eyes and shot over and over right into its wide face. It opened its mouth to scream again, and as it moved forward, I slid along the wall to avoid its pincers. Though shooting its eyes seemed to be hurting it, I wasn't stopping it. Soon I'd be at the end of my bullets, and I probably wouldn't have time to swap out the magazine. I decided on another tactic. Its mouth was still open, so I switched my aim there, firing the remainder of my magazine. It was with those shots that the spider went rigid. I continued to back away, putting as much distance between myself and the spider as possible, jumping out of the way as its form collapsed against the floor and its legs splayed out, even so, the hideous creature made a last, feeble attempt to crawl on its belly toward me. I had to finish the job quickly. I reached into my pocket for my spare magazine, but the spider, with surprising agility, reached out a leg and swiped the magazine from my hand. It clattered to the floor, far out of reach. As the spider dragged itself forward, there was nothing left but my knife. I took it out of its sheath, going into a crouch. The spider summoned the last of its strength to execute a final surge forward, its pincers wide and ready to clamp down. I stepped to the side, tripping over one of its thick, hairy legs. Though the falling was involuntary, it also allowed me to dodge its attack while inadvertently getting to the side of its head, right where I needed to be to deliver the final blow. Gripping the hilt of the knife tightly, I stabbed into the spider's head over and over. Every time my knife made a cut, purple goop surged from the wounds, spraying upward and misting the air. The spider made a pitiful squealing noise, and with each stabbing, its life ebbed all the more. At last, its muscles slackened, its entire frame giving a final shudder before settling into death. I retrieved my knife for the final time, its blade coated in sticky purple slime. Just then, the smell hit me. I gagged as I turned from the giant monster, wiping the blade on one of its hairy legs before sheathing it. I stepped away and began my search for Makara. I'd last seen her crawling to the other side of the room, and the fact that she hadn't helped me in the fight made me fear that she'd been hurt, or worse. I rounded the spider's body, seeing Makara's flashlight still pointing at the wall. But there was no sign of Makara herself, I picked up the flashlight, shining it around the room. 
The beam passed over Samuel, who seemed to be fine, if still bound by the spider silk. I walked around the couch, finding Makara huddled behind it and shaking with her eyes closed. Makara, you all right? As I kneeled in front of her, her eyes opened. It didn't look as if she'd been injured in any way. She was trembling, though, so much that I worried that some of the poison might have gotten into her. Makara? At last, she spoke. I'm, I'm fine. I just, I can't do spiders. Well, it's dead now. Get a hold of yourself, because we have to take care of Samuel. Her eyes seemed to focus. It's gone? I nodded. Deader than dead. After 17 bullets and about the same number of stabs, I'd be surprised if it wasn't. She looked me up and down, obviously noticing all the purple slime and spider bits on me. I'll have to clean up later. We need to get Samuel out of that spider silk. At last, Makara nodded, allowing me to help pull her to her feet. We went to Samuel and began to help him out of his cocoon. It looked as if he were trying to say something, only the silk had completely covered his mouth. Luckily, it isn't too thick, Makara said, starting to cut the silk carefully with her knife. It shouldn't take long to get off. Even as Makara cut strand after strand, Samuel couldn't move. It was a few minutes of us working together before he could shimmy the rest of his way out. By then, he'd started helping us pull the stuff off himself. I would never have imagined that a spider could grow that size. It made me realize just how much the xenovirus could affect living things. It also made me wonder what else could be lurking in this place, and it reminded me that Carrie was still out there, somewhere. At last, Samuel was on his feet, brushing the last of the silk from his body. That was too close, Makara said. Don't go wandering off like that again, Samuel nodded. I didn't want to risk everyone, but you're right. We dodged a bullet there. We need to keep moving, I said. We're almost there, Samuel said. Follow me. Chapter 34 Before leaving the room, I found my pack and reloaded my spent magazine, along with retrieving the one the spider had knocked out of my hands. Once I was locked and loaded... We left the room and followed a series of dark corridors, no longer being as cautious. Anything in this bunker would have heard the sounds of our fight, so there was little point in stealth. As we navigated the dark twists and turns, it was hard to believe I'd dealt with that spider entirely on my own. It gave me a confidence boost, but at the same time, I knew I couldn't feel too secure, especially when death would be just around the corner. Go left here, Samuel said. We turned into another corridor, the longest we'd yet entered, a corridor completely taken over by the xenovirus. The floor, walls, and ceiling had all been covered by purple fungus, and from above, strange stalactites hung and dripped slimy pink liquid. We passed quite a few doorways, but all of them were as empty as they were dark. We plodded along, the fungus squishing beneath our boots. Almost there, Samuel said. Soon the corridor ended. I could see nothing but darkness beyond, the fungus-covered floor ending at the metal grating of a long bridge stretching across black, empty space. As Makara shone her light all around, my breath caught. We'd made it to the fusion reactor. As Samuel had told us earlier, this bridge led across the chamber toward a bank of elevators on the far end, elevators that would lead us to the nest above, Below, the shapes of intricate machines loomed, dark and defunct. The machinery filled almost all of the floor below us, perhaps forty to fifty feet below the bridge. The elevators are just ahead, Samuel said. Let's move. We started across the bridge, our footfalls echoing hard off the metal. If there was anything in here, there was no doubt that it hurt us. In fact, I got the familiar sense of being watched and felt incredibly exposed on the bridge. It was when we were a third of the way across the bridge when a massive shape sailed through the air. Makara shone her light into the air, illuminating a massive monster that must have been watching us from the top of one of the machines. It plummeted, landing on the bridge and sending a loud metallic echo throughout the chamber. 
The bridge rumbled from the impact, causing me to stumble to a stop. As Makara pointed her flashlight directly at the creature, the beam revealed a giant humanoid, probably three times the height of a person. Sickly pink flesh covered its entire body without a trace of hair, while long claws extended from its massive hands. Its eyes were narrow slits, white and glowing, and muscles bulged under sinewy skin. Gashes covered its body, as if the beast had grown so much that its very skin had ripped, leaking purple blood. As it knelt, its white eyes glowed and stared at us intensely. A low rumble escaped its throat. Carry, Samuel said. Carry charged. I had just enough time to shirk off my pack, and I saw Samuel and Makara doing the same. Makara lifted her gun and fired several times, but only hit the monster's muscular chest, which did nothing to slow it. Samuel also fired a few shots, but only managed to hit Carrie's shoulder. Then came my chance. I aimed for the head and fired, missing twice. By now, Carrie was close, and it was me she went after. She took a swipe at my gun, knocking it from my hand and sending it clattering to the metal bridge. It slid a bit before pausing at the bridge's edge, far out of reach. I backed away, but Carrie turned to concentrate on Makara, who was firing into her. Carrie forced herself close to Makara, trying to swipe the gun out of her hand. But Makara used her other hand to draw her knife, taking several swings that cut deep gashes on Carrie's abdomen. Carrie screamed and, in retaliation, slammed Makara against the handrail, causing Makara to cry out in pain. As Samuel continued shooting at the monster, I dropped and crawled to my gun, fifteen feet or so away and dangerously close to Carrie's right foot. As I neared, however, Carrie somehow caught wind of me. She turned from Makara to deal with me, but that gave Makara her opening. She stabbed Carrie in the leg, and Carrie howled, her thick muscles bulging beneath her thin skin. She swung her arm in a wide arc, pummeling Makara on the shoulder and hitting her so hard that her feet lifted from the floor and pushed her halfway over the railing. I ran toward her, but Samuel arrived first. He grabbed Makara's hands, pulling her back to the bridge. Carrie raised her right arm, readying a swipe to finish them both. Judging from the amount of times I'd already shot her, I knew more bullets wouldn't be the answer. So I charged, going for her legs behind the kneecaps. Both of my hands connected, and Carrie roared as her knees buckled. She toppled forward, crashing right into the bridge. The force was far greater than I'd expected, sending a foreboding creak down the bridge. Then the end snapped free from the wall, and the bridge began collapsing segment by segment. We had but a moment to get to the other side. Carrie was still immobile, so we skirted past her for the elevators only fifty feet or so away. It wasn't long before we neared the opposite landing, but I already felt the bridge falling from under me. And worse, Carrie had gotten up and was giving chase. I could see the landing in front of me, and Carrie was just steps behind. Makara and Samuel had already reached the opposite platform, and it was then that I knew I had to jump. So, I leapt from the bridge, right for Makara's outstretched hand. I realized intrinsically that my weight would bring her down as soon as she grabbed on, but Samuel held her for support. She managed to grasp me by the arms, pulling me the rest of the way up. All three of us tumbled to the floor. Behind, Carrie let out a piercing shriek that echoed through the chamber. I turned to watch her flailing on the bridge, becoming entangled in it. Then the bridge was lost to darkness. A moment later, a thunderous crash emanated, shaking me to the bones. We lay there for a while, catching our breaths. We'd survived Carrie and a giant spider. I just hoped that our bad luck would end there. The worst part, though, was that we lost our packs with the falling of that bridge. All we had now were our weapons and the clothes on our backs. Samuel was the first to stand. He went to the edge, looking down into the darkness. See anything? I asked. He shook his head. Trying to find our stuff, and all that would take too long. We can't stay here another minute. 
We took so much time and care to get those supplies, and it was a shame to see all that wasted. Makar and I stood, dusting ourselves off. There was nothing left but to climb the elevator shaft. Makar pressed the button to summon one, but of course it didn't work. Samuel turned from the precipice and went to the elevator doors. With his powerful arms and shoulders, he heaved on one of the doors, opening both of them in the process. The elevator inside was dark, but on its ceiling was a small, removable panel. Samuel stood on the metal railing attached to the elevator walls, which gave him enough height to open the hatch. He reached his hand down. Light? Makar handed him the flashlight, and Samuel pointed it into the shaft above. We have a long climb ahead of us, he said. Can't even see the top. Should be easy after all we've gone through, I said. Maybe so, Samuel said. But still, be careful. It's a long way down. We each used the railing to boost ourselves through the open hatch to the top of the elevator. Then we began our long climb. Samuel first, followed by Makara, then me. We took frequent breaks, but in total we were probably on the ladder for a full hour. In a way, losing our packs might have been a good thing. It was hard enough to get up this ladder without them. I couldn't imagine lugging fifty or so pounds for thousands of feet. By the time we made it to the top, I was completely exhausted. I waited for Samuel to force the doors open, a tricky proposition given that he had to do it from the ladder. Somehow, though, he managed to get them both open, though it did take a little longer than the first time. I climbed out, my legs feeling like jelly from the amount of work they'd done. From the flashlight, we seemed to be standing in a foyer, the floor of which was lined with dust. The room was circular in shape, and a long, wide corridor sloping upward led out. This is the nest, Samuel said. The motor pool's not far. The place, besides the dust, was empty compared to the rest of the bunker. None of the fighting had made it up here, probably because no one had been able to escape Carrie in the first place. We followed the corridor until it leveled out, opening into a large, empty area. It took me a moment to realize that this was the bunker entrance. Where Makara and I had come in yesterday was more of a back door. This was the true entry, the one the refugees used back in 2030 when the bunker had been filled. Standing here was chilling, in a way. I tried not to imagine what the panic of that day must have been like. We came to a heavy side door, before which Samuel stopped. This is it, Samuel said. Just a few more minutes and we'll be out of here. There was a card reader next to the door, but when Samuel tried the latch, the door opened right up. I suppose the lack of power meant the door was unlocked too. We stepped into the motor pool, and it was so dark that it was all Makara's flashlight could do to illumine the place. It smelled of oil and machinery, and reminded me of our own motor pool in Bunker 108. Then, I saw them. There were three recons, all lined up and facing outward toward large pull-up garage doors. They each had four wheels with thick, serrated, all-terrain tires, and plenty of suspension to hold up the chassis. Each one was of light brown desert camo, and the cabs were thin and aerodynamic, hanging low to the ground. These things were built for speed, and there looked to be enough room for four people in each. One would suit our purposes perfectly. Even more, a turret was mounted on the top of each recon, from which pointed the barrel of a long machine gun. The gun's height above the recon meant it had plenty of space for full 360-degree rotation. Below the machine gun was a large space for cargo, and it was also the place the hydrogen fuel tank would be stored. Awesome, I said. Let's check them out, Samuel said. We inspected all three. We first checked the cargo bay of each one, taking inventory of supplies. Each was filled with an assortment of parts, a couple of spare tires, tools, and even some rations and water. The hydrogen fuel tank stood on the right side of the cargo bay, probably about five feet tall. A glass pane in the tank showed that it was already filled with water, Below the tank, machinery would pressurize and convert that water into hydrogen and oxygen. 
the hydrogen would feed into the yellow fuel lines leading to the engine, while the leftover oxygen and water vapor would be emitted into the air outside as exhaust. Various shelves lined both sides of the cargo bay, and two lockers sat opposite of the fuel tank, probably designed for weapon storage. To the right of the lockers was a metal ladder, leading to a hatch in the ceiling. This was to access the turret above. Very cool, I said. We gathered all we could into the central recon's cargo bay. We made up some of what we lost below, but still had a long way to go in preparing for our trip east. By the time we were done, I saw that there was another hatch at the very front of the bay, leading into the cab. I tried the latch, but found it locked. Maybe I could open it from the other side. I left the recon, went around to the passenger door, and opened it up. Two low seats were in the front of the cab, along with a retractable jump seat in the middle. A long single seat was in the back of the cab with enough space to seat three people. But the middle part of that seat looked designed to fold up, and after seeing the hatch in the cargo bay, I knew exactly why. I opened the cab door and pulled myself inside, placing my hands on either side of the retractable seat, pushing it up and folding it. As I did so, it clicked. The seat swung outward into the cargo bay, where both Makara and Samuel looked at me in surprise. What's up? Makara chuckled, but Samuel was not as amused. We need to hustle. There'll be time for exploration later. He was probably right, but at the same time, this recon gave us a lot of tools to work with. That was, if we could get it out of this garage and down the mountain. I walked into the cargo bay and pushed the hatch into the wall, clicking it shut. I tried the latch again from the cargo bay, finding that it opened right up. It had somehow unlocked on its own when I opened it from the cab. We all hopped out of the cargo bay and into the garage. Needs a key to start, I said. They're over here on the wall, Samuel said. He walked over, past the recon on our left, to take it down. Recon two, he said. This'll probably do it. I held out my hand, but instead of tossing it to me, he handed the keys to Makara. Hey, you don't know how to drive, Makara said. And you do? It's been a while, but yeah. The Lost Angels had a recon, so I know how to pilot it. Maybe you can teach me. Maybe later. Right now, we're trying to escape with our lives. She turned to Samuel. Are we all set? I think so. Let's get this garage door open. As I went to help Samuel, Makara hopped into the driver's seat. A moment later, the recon started with a roar that faded to a low hum that emanated from behind the cab, where the hydrogen fuel tank was building pressure. Samuel and I unlatched the garage door, pulling it up to reveal the outside. Light flooded the garage, far brighter than I'd expected. As my eyes adjusted, the cold mountain air rushed against my face, stinging it with cold. I was startled to see the sky above without a trace of cloud, no longer a dull red, but a bluish violet. And directly above, I saw the sun for the first time in my life. I didn't have time to enjoy it, though. Samuel tapped me on the shoulder and pointed down the disused road curving around the mountain. There seemed to be some shapes moving up the road, so I narrowed my eyes to discern them. It took me a moment to see five men, maybe two hundred yards away. They stopped, clearly seeing us. Inside the recon, Samuel said. Now! We ran into the garage just as the first shots were fired. It was impossible to see how, but Brux and his gang had found us. Chapter 35 When Samuel and I hopped in the recon, Makara turned on us. How the hell did they find us? How are we supposed to know? I asked. Just drive! As a few bullets dinged off the recon's hood, Makara shifted it into drive and floored it. The tires squealed as the recon roared onto the dirt road ahead. They're straight ahead, I said. Makara, I don't think you should... Get low, she said. We're not stopping for anyone. The raiders continued to fire, bullets zinging off the vehicle's metal and creating webs of cracks in the windshield. Here we go, she said. 
I prepared myself to feel some squishy bumps, but there was nothing. Men yelled from the sides of the vehicle, having dodged just in time. Their guns fired a few more times, hitting the vehicle's side, but we sped past them. It looked as if we were in the clear. Next stop, Bunker One, Makara said. Makara, I said. Don't ever try that again. She cracked a smile. It worked, didn't it? Yeah, but you could have been shot. She shrugged. Are you really complaining here? I sighed. Uh, I guess you have a point. As we rounded a bend, the thick red clouds spread below like a blanket, the mountaintops poking through in jagged peaks. As we descended, we entered the dense red dust. Makara turned on the headlights, but even so, we could only see 15 to 20 yards ahead. I don't see how they found us, I said. If Brux is one thing, it's determined, Makara said. Makara slowed down. The entire right side of the road ended in sheer cliff. Driving off would be certain death. The road snaked down the mountainside, and it was after we'd gone down several switchbacks that I noticed two pairs of headlights above. I couldn't believe my eyes, but there was no denying it. We'd left two recons in the motor pool, both of which would be easy pickings for the raiders. Should have hid those keys, I said. Too late now, Samuel said. I'll man the turret. Samuel disappeared into the back while Makara hit the gas until we were positively flying down the thin mountain road. One miscalculation on Makara's part would see us all dead. A spray of bullets showered the road ahead of us. Makara took a tight turn, forcing us both to the left. The entire recon shook with the effort, and we had so much momentum that it felt as if we were going to swerve off the cliff. But Makara floored it, causing us to head straight ahead down the next stretch of road. The other recons were two switchbacks above us and closing fast. The raider's driving was far riskier than ours. Can't we go faster? I asked. Makara's look was venomous. If you want to slip on the ice and snow and fall to our deaths, then yeah, we can go faster. That was when the first recon rounded the bend right behind us. As Samuel fired from above, I watched the other recon's front become riddled with bullet holes in the side mirror. Makara swerved around a tight bend, but the back tires lost traction. As the back end of the recon swerved toward the cliff, Makara floored it at the last instant. This was a closer call than last time. I actually felt the back of the vehicle dip a bit before we gained enough speed to regain our traction. The next recon tried the same thing, only it was going too fast. As it fishtailed, the back tires fell off the slope. There was no hope for it as the entire vehicle slid backward, tumbling over the cliff. As we rounded the next bend, we were just in time to see the raider's first recon topple onto the road ahead. Makara slammed on the brakes as the vehicle rolled in front of us, doing a half flip before continuing its fall down the mountainside. As we passed it from above, it exploded in a violent plume of flame, crashing against a giant rock jutting from the mountain. Let's hope Brux was in there, Makara said. But it wasn't to be. The other recon swerved around the corner, giving me a sight of Brux in the side mirror. I could tell it was him from his blonde cut and angry scowl. While the driver's eyes were wide and fearful, Brux's were murderous. They kept pace with us the rest of the way down the mountain. Brux wasn't going to take any crazy risks, content with maintaining our speed until we could both reach the desert flatland. Makara kept her eye out behind, and Samuel had ceased his fire. Maybe with the thick red dust, he didn't want to waste any bullets. At long last, we exited the thick dust, finding ourselves on the final stretch before hitting the desert floor. The snow and dirt of Cold Mountain gave way to red rock and dust of the wasteland. By the time Brux had left the fog, both turrets were once again firing. Makara continued to floor it down the incline, but not before hitting a massive bump. The bump was followed by a massive pop, and the low hum of the pressure chamber became a high whir, the pressure needle on the fuel gauge falling abruptly. They must have hit something vital, Makara said. We're losing pressure. What does that mean? 
It means we're going nowhere. Behind us, after another round of shooting, I heard Brux's recon squeal. I looked in the mirror to see the vehicle swerving and then flipping on its side. Makara turned sharply, and Brux's recon slid down the hill past us. Our own recon slowed to a halt as the electronics powered down. Makara braked, bringing our recon to a full stop. She hopped out of the vehicle, pointing her handgun at Brux's downed vehicle, using the door as a shield. Brux's recon was on its side, its bottom facing us. I followed her example, getting out of my own side and using the door as a shield. It was time to end Brux. Chapter 36 Nothing happened for a full minute. We just stood there pointing our guns and waiting for anyone to come out, but both Brux and his raider buddy were smart enough to realize that all that was waiting for them was a hail of bullets. As the wind blew dust across the scene, I realized that we might be here for a while. I was beginning to think they might be dead, when quick as a flash, Brux showed himself and fired a few shots. Above us, we heard Samuel cry out as Brux slipped back behind the downed recon, a smirk on his lips. Samuel! Makara called. Both Makara and I entered the recon, shutting the doors behind us. We headed to the cargo bay through the cab, where we found Samuel climbing down the ladder, groaning in pain. Just a few rungs from the deck, he fell and crashed against the floor, holding his left shoulder and grimacing. Blood stained his shirt, and more yet filtered through his fingers. Alex, Makara snapped. Pressure the wound. I placed my hands hard on the wound. Samuel yelled so loud that it took me aback, but I figured it was better to put too much pressure on than not enough. Makara tossed me a shirt, which I placed beneath my hands and leaned into. Already, though, blood was staining through. He wouldn't last long unless we could find some way to stop the blood flow. By this point, Makara had pulled down the first aid kit attached to the wall. She set it on the floor, sorting through its contents with surprising speed. Here it is, she said. Move. I got out of the way and Makara took my place. She opened the tube, then removed the bloodied shirt I'd been using as a makeshift bandage. Next, she took her knife and quickly cut open Samuel's shirt at the shoulder. The blood churned out at an alarming rate, not so much to where he'd be dead in minutes, but enough to ensure he'd be dead in hours. Makara squeezed the clear gel onto the wound. Samuel screamed in pain. It's a congealing agent, Makara said to him. It'll stop the blood flow. Next, Makara took the shirt, pressuring the wound once again. It should buy us some time. You have to fight Brux, Samuel said. Let me hold the shirt. Samuel, Makara said firmly. You're in no state to... He pushed her off with surprising strength, taking the shirt. He gritted his teeth in pain. Makara, thank you, but you have to deal with Brux. Makara sighed. You're right, but how do we do it? We couldn't just step out of the cargo bay. Now that we were all inside, they probably were marking us right now, no matter what way we chose to leave, front, back, or even the turret. I was trying to think of other options when my eyes settled on the hydrogen pressure tank. Has the pressure tank lost all pressure, or is there some left? There might be some left, Makara said. Why? Hydrogen. I got up and tapped the tank. If there's enough hydrogen gas in there, we can take the whole tank and throw it out the back. The hill will take it down to the other recon. With luck, we can shoot it and have it blow up. I don't know. The casing seems to be pretty thick, Makara said. But we can try. How will we get away without a pressure tank, though? We can salvage the tank off the other recon. If it doesn't blow up in the process, Makara said. That's a risk we'll have to take, but I doubt that'll happen. Makara sighed, but after a moment, she nodded. All right, let's do it. We spent the next minute figuring out how to detach the tank. It wasn't too difficult. The tank had clearly been designed to be easily installed and removed. The thing was heavy. It took the both of us to place it on the deck in front of us. Now disconnected from its stand, we worked to detach the fuel lines which caused hydrogen gas to hiss into the air. 
Makara hurriedly found the fuel line's valve, twisting it tight and stemming the hydrogen flow. Makara and I lifted the fuel tank and got it to the back of the recon. I pushed the door open, getting a view of the desert slope descending toward our left. For now, the side of the recon protected us, but we couldn't show any part of our body as we tossed the tank out. Make sure it lands perpendicular to the slope, I said. Obviously, Makara said. I'm not an idiot. We both looked at each other. On three, I asked. One, two, three, go, or one, two, three? I thought a moment. One, two, three, go. Together, we counted down. One, two, three, go. We tossed the tank out, making sure it was horizontal to the slope. We gave it a few seconds to roll down the hill. Now, I said. Makar and I both stepped out of the back. The barrel was just a few seconds away from hitting the downed recon. We could have timed it better, but it didn't appear that Brux or his goon were watching at the moment. Then the hydrogen tank struck the downed vehicle squarely in its side. We both opened fire on the tank, but our first few bullets didn't seem to penetrate its casing. But as we continued to fire, the tank lit up like a torch. A giant mushroom of fire shot upward, followed by a crackling boom. The force of the blast forced the recon to slide further down the hill. As we ran down the slope, I could feel the heat of the flames intensify. The fire had managed to catch surprisingly well, and it wouldn't be long before it was working its way into the recon. It was only a matter of time before it found that recon's hydrogen tank, so we had to work fast. We rounded the vehicle's side, finding both Brux and his crony lying on the ground. The crony lifted a handgun, but I shot him dead before he had the chance to fire. He went limp against the earth. Brux was a few feet off, his skin cracked and charred. His entire body quaked, as if he were in shock. Still, he tried to reach for his gun, lying in the dirt just a few feet off. Makar ran forward, kicking it far out of reach. Brux turned his wide, blue eyes up at Makara. His entire face had been blackened from smoke, and severe, blistering burns covered his forearms. He didn't groan in pain, despite the fact that parts of him had been so burned that they'd been literally cooked. I resisted the urge to vomit. Ma, Makara, Brux said, lifting an arm in surrender. Makara walked in front of his head, pointing her gun down. At this point, killing him would be a mercy, because in his current state, it would be impossible to survive. Don't try anything, Brux, she said. You've had your time to try. I, I won't. Please, have mercy on me, Makara. I'm sorry. Take me back to Bluff. I'll give you bats, anything you want. Makara scowled, seeming to consider Surely she couldn't be. Then she shot him. The bullet went right into Brux's forehead, his entire body stiffening before growing still. His cold blue eyes stared upward, empty of life. The wind blew cold as Makara spat on his face. Come on, she said. We need to rescue that hydrogen tank. We left Brux behind, heading for the upside-down recon. The cargo bay had been left wide open, and the fire still hadn't made it inside. We climbed in, going to the tank. At first, I twisted the fuel valve shut, ensuring that no hydrogen gas would leak. Once that was done, we disconnected the fuel line before removing the tank. Together, we lugged the tank uphill. It was slow work, but eventually we managed to get it into our recon's cargo bay. We set it onto the stand, reconnecting the fuel line but we still had to figure out how our own recon had lost pressure in the first place. Hopefully, the problem had been with the tank itself. If that were the case, the recon would start up just fine. Otherwise, we'd have to figure out the problem. Now that the tank was connected, Makara was focusing on Samuel. His bleeding had slowed, but his face was still pale. If he didn't get medical attention soon, there was no question. The bullet would eventually end his life. She looked at me. Let's get him up front. I wanted to know what we could specifically do to help him, but for now I just helped Makara. We dragged him outside, since the open space would make it easier to move him. 
We placed him in the passenger seat while Makara and I went around to climb in through the driver's side. I took the middle seat while Makara got behind the wheel. You're in charge of watching him, Makara said. Let's hope she starts up. Makara turned the key, and I breathed a sigh of relief to hear the engine roar to life. The pressure tank in the back began to hum. We were good to go, only I didn't know where we were going. Samuel's eyes opened as Makara drove away from Cold Mountain across the desert flatland. He seemed to be focused and aware. There was still time to find him treatment. I tried to think of all the places we could go, but nothing came to mind. There were no nearby bunkers that I knew of, and for that matter, there were only two left in the whole world now. Trying to find one now would be difficult, if not impossible to do. Oasis didn't seem like a great choice either, but I didn't see anywhere else we could go. We sped across the flat wasteland with Cold Mountain looming behind. I had never gone so fast before, and seeing the land pass so quickly was surreal. The sun already was sinking. Evening was just a couple of hours away. At times, Makara had to dodge boulders, but the smaller rocks she just ran over, trusting to the recon's thick tires and heavy suspension. Don't worry, Sam, Makara said. We'll be there by tonight. Beware by tonight, I asked. You're not gonna like it. Not Oasis. Guess again. I thought about it, but nothing came to mind. Surely not L.A., that was too far. But where else could she be thinking? Samuel then spoke, his voice raspy. Don't tell me we're going to raid her bluff, Makara. Makara smiled grimly. It's the homecoming we've all been waiting for. I have a favor to call in. You're not serious, I said. It's the only place I know that has a doctor. Makara paused. Well, not a doctor, really, but close enough. I don't really like it, but it's our only option. And it's on the way to Bunker One. If anyone can help us, it's Char. The cab was quiet for a moment. Finally, Samuel gave a long, tired sigh. Lead on. I thought we were out of the fire, but now we were heading into the furnace. Makara pressed on the accelerator as if to defiantly meet that inevitability. We surged ahead, and the miles passed us by. The sun sank lower in the sky, hiding itself behind Cold Mountain, which in time became a shadowy mass behind us. As Makara drove and evening came and night cloaked the land, my thoughts became similarly dark. Would I be fighting for survival for the rest of my life? We needed to find Bunker One. We needed to find the Black Files. My dad would have wanted me to finish his research on the Xenovirus. Finding the Black Files would be my way of carrying on his legacy. As I stared out the window, I felt as if I could hear his voice speaking across time. A man doesn't do what he wants. He does what he must. Never forget that. The mission Samuel had laid out seemed impossible, especially when Samuel was fighting for his life. I didn't relish the thought of going to raid or bluff. But I had to trust Makara's judgment. If Char could help Samuel survive, then that was all that mattered. More importantly, this was what we had to do. We'd survived more than our share of troubles already, but we had so much further to go. Whatever happened, this was only the beginning. As the dark wasteland passed, Bunker One and Cheyenne Mountain had never seemed further away. This concludes Apocalypse by Kyle West, narrated by Graham Halstead. Copyright 2015 by Kyle West. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Kyle West and was produced in the year 2016 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.